Buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. Very nice to see you all. And uh, now I address you as a former president of Solasi because my mandate is over. But it's my great pleasure to be here to start this uh, protocol session. I think that uh, this is a very important session to train the young uh, interventionist, interventional cardiologist. We'll be able to address several topics with uh, Leandro and the Commission. Uh, we created an extensive program with a high scientific level and I have the security I'm sure that it's going to be very it's going to be very useful for everyone who's participating in this session due to the topics that we're going to present due to the speakers the presenters who are very high level and uh, I think this is a Congress session that it's very necessary and this is, has been uh, one of the most important sessions in the Congress for years because it's very important to train scientifically and to train theoretically our physicians to our uh, interventional cardiologists for their global training. So congratulations, uh, Dr. Leandro, because uh, for your work, for your the work of all your group in Producar, and I'm sure that's going to be a very, very successful session. So congratulations, you all. Okay, I would like to join uh, and to share what uh, Jose said. I can. I want to say that I'm very happy to see the growth of the young interventional cardiologists in the region, not only in the manual or technical aspect, but also in the educational aspect, in the scientific aspect, which is uh, what this session provides us, or it's going to provide uh, to everyone who listens to it. I was a founding member of SOLASI with Dr. Mangioni, and uh, of course I was a founding member of the Interventional Cardiologist Association of our country so I see this young generation that are not only good operators but are also good scientists so I'm very happy seeing uh, Alasabe, uh, the people from Chile and I see a lot of young people who's uh, restarting the fire of interventional cardiology in investigation. So I think that this session is fantastic. I think that it's going to be very useful for everyone. The scientific program is fun amazing. And I see the moderators, I see the speakers. And I see my friend here, Ricardo Costa, who is a, a tremendous person in research and in his work. So. I wish you all the best of luck. At, at 11, I'm going to have to leave earlier because I have a, a session with Ron Wasman. So I'm not going to be. I'm going to be for one of the sessions, but then I'm going to be leaving you. But I didn't want to leave without congratulation, congratulating you for the success of this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Mangione. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rodriguez. We're going to start with the uh, 12th uh, fellow course of uh, Selassie. My name is Leandro Lasave. I am the coordinator mm, from Argentina. And I have the pleasure of coordinating this uh, session of vascular accesses with my friend, Dr. Ricardo Costa, who is uh, president of the uh, Interventional Cardiology Association of Brazil. And he's uh, very well known by all of us. Also with Dr. Nicolas Adarenko, who is an interventional cardiologist from the Cordoba, and he's uh, currently the director of uh, 
And uh, two things. First, that the without so that we don't have any problems with the signal. So the video is recorded, and there's interpretation for English to English uh, from Spanish. So let's start with uh, the first talk. Uh, well, let's start with uh, Dr. Sebastián Peralta. He works in Sanatorio Güemes, and he's going to talk about the radial access and its alternatives, when to use them and how. You can start asking questions uh, through the chat, and we're going to discuss them over the chat. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sebastián Peralta. I am a doctor in uh, hemodynamics in Sanatorio Güemes. I have been assigned to uh, work in uh, arterial accesses uh, through the radial, the cubital, and alternative views. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. First of all, I would like to thank uh, all of you the possibility of participating in this uh, producar session. I would like to thank my uh, my work, my team at work, and without them, I would not be able to do this presentation. Uh, let's go into the topic. The radial approach is is uh, in two spheres. Uh, first of all, what do we need to understand what does a radial approach means, and uh, what what why do we do these interventions uh, differently from the femoral, uh, the classic femoral approach. We need to ask ourselves, where do we come from? The, the, the history and the antecedents of the radial axe approach. Where are we today and where are we going with the new technologies? The first percutaneous axis that uh, was used uh, by Seldinger was the femoral uh, axis. Uh, this is the one that we've been using in the last few years. There are many exchange channels. Uh, we have been exchanging things uh, through social networking and the advancement of knowledge and technology has allowed us for the last 15 years to uh, move forward towards uh, radial access uh, in all of the hemodynamics uh, labs in, uh, in uh, Latin America. This is uh, very reproducible, it's a puncture in the radial artery the patient is in supine position and we go through the ER3 and we get the pulsate, pulsing flow and that's the moment to move the wire forward and channel uh, the, the artery to obtain a proper radial access. The standard technique implies fi uh, 5,000 uh, grams of uh, milligrams sorry, of heparin and the, the, this adva the advantages that we have for radial uh, access are patient comfort, the early ambulation, uh, less hospital cost, and the reduction of complications, vascular and, and hemorrhagic, and, and of bleeding, and uh, the reduction of uh, the mortality. Some of the disadvantages is the spasms, which are pretty frequent in the radial artery, the tortuosity and uh, the smaller caliber, which uh, makes it impossible to use uh, high FR catheters. However, the global rate, uh, usage rate of uh, the, this axis is, has been rising and 80% of the cases are uh, now done this way. Anyway, we don't have to to have any problems if the femoral is before radial, if one is better than the other, but no, uh, both are complementary and they are both uh, good enough to perform different kinds of interventions in different situations. So when we compare the radial versus the femoral axis, we see that there are many trials that uh, show the safety of this, uh, of the this type of access, many of them we already know about them, but we're not going to stop and dwell on that. But when we analyze them, the total mortality, the number of events, the vascular complications and bleeding, 
are uh, favored uh, for radial before, uh, versus femoral and uh, in other uh, factors there are no big differences. Anyway, we need to highlight that the femoral uh, axis mm, current in our current day, not so much in the first stages of the use of the radial axis, is reserved for uh, more uh, with serious uh, cases, patients in shock and issues with more complexity. So this is why in nowadays most of the complications attributed to the radial axis are even greater than the ones that we had for femoral axis. And it's not, but it's not just because of the, the choice of access, but rather because of the patient condition. When we were going to systematically access the radial access, that's uh, sometimes a challenge because it's, a, it's an accessory uh, uh, way. So we might have spasms, we might have other issues, so we cannot predict sometimes what is the anatomy of the radial uh, way that we normally choose. We normally don't perform any kind of tests before uh, doing the puncture, so, uh, it but it, anyway it has not increased the rate of complications in practice, but we need to point out in this aspect that uh, since we have to go through the cubital uh, access it's going to be a little bit uh, difficult so because it's a patient with a small uh, physical contexture uh, so it's uh, it might not be av advisable to perform it but even though we have uh, found out that it's uh, very important and it's a good way we might have a maneuver that is does not add cost and we might sensibilize the the pulse and to see uh, how feasible the radial access may be for that particular patient. We need to have certain uh, certain uh, caveats, of course. That is, uh, we need to consider the diameter of the artery. We need to, uh, so that uh, depends on which uh, caliber of the, of the catheters that we're going to use. Sometimes, the, we require to do a, an Allen test if uh, it's abnormal, or we, or we need to see if the patient needs to uh, be subjected to hemodialysis, uh, because if they already have uh, this uh, kind of treatment, we need to consider another uh, another approach. If they have also another problems like spasms or kinking, we also need to be aware of that, and there are certain relative contra uh, contraindications, which means that, which may be the, the, the experience of the operator, if the operator doesn't have enough, and because that's going to, uh, to impact the, the duration of the procedure, and also uh, in definitely it's going to be an issue. Uh, when we have a failure in the access, the, in the radial access, if it's something uh, functional, if it uh, an anatomical issue, if it's uh, sustained or, or transient, and if they, we have spasms, if the vessel is uh, thinner than we expected, or if we have something like we like we see in the, in the figure, if we might have uh, issues with the support, so we might have to change our uh, access in that case. Uh, here are some uh, tools to optimize the radial access. Uh, we might inject a little bit of subcutaneous nitroglycerin to prevent the spasms associated to catheters. If we are experienced, we can uh, guide ourselves through a CAT scan, which could uh, increase, we could, uh, which could decrease the number of failed uh, punctures, or we could use uh, hydrophilic uh, materials, which could help us. Uh, solve certain curves that we might have on, on the axis. Undoubtedly, this kind of experiences that we are sharing, this kind of intervention, are uh, sustainable and there is a positive impact here because we are able to exchange information, to talk about what's new, 
uh, and innovation and work with simulators and all of these learning programs can be standardized and we can foster their use uh, routinely and reduce complications. Uh, the impact of the radial access for patients with infarction, patients who cannot stay in the same hospital where they have to be intervened or to optimize the, the beds in public or private resources is in this case, right now, uh, it's very important because uh, there's a very marked uh, need for beds. Uh, so once you're familiarized, it favors uh, the early discharges uh, or the uh, outpatient attention, care, sorry. So all of this uh, allows to um, for all of the associations to recommend it both uh, many of the associations that we have like the like in Argentina for example the use of the radial access is recommended uh, for patients uh, stable for stable patients and uh, other than being a, a closed concept this opens the way for certain for a plenty of alternatives we don't think that radial is the only alternative but the, the cubital or the distal radial uh, accesses are also are considered some of the main alternatives when when we cannot use the, the radial as a the primary alternative. So having a good uh, cubital way, uh, it's, it solves the problem without greater difficulties or other uh, wastes of time. The radial uh, way is uh, the radial access is one of the greater, one of the better alternatives. It's even better than the ephemeral, it has a greater diameter, it's straighter. So we need to have some consideration on the puncture side, which has a, more, uh, a, a larger amount of nerve tissue around it. There are many experiences uh, for cubital. It uh, shows that uh, this is the, the main alternative for the radial. Uh, access with a similar uh, event rate. The, this artery uh, usually has a little bit more of hematoma because it's uh, deeper. Uh, the failures in the puncture it usually favors the radial artery and uh, the spasms uh, usually uh, favor the cubital because it's, it has a higher diameter. So cubital is a very good alternative. The distal radial access is is uh, in vogue right now. So, nine out of ten patients uh, that have been tested through this access have been able to finish the procedure uh, with a re reduction in complications. So, this is a feasible uh, feasible access with high high success rate and doesn't uh, increase the, the working time. Uh, then we need to look for the, the anatomic snuff, snuff box uh, to locate the artery and to, uh, it has a very good uh, option for alternative access. Here we see we have a bigger patient comfort because uh, if we use a neutral position on the right, it's, there's a better benefit for the access in the left, to, which is more comfor comfortable for the operator which uh, reduces exposure to uh, the to radiation, uh, lesser risk of ischemia, potential benefit for patients who require fish, AV fistulae, and the disadvantages are a smaller diameter, which could uh, create spasms. There's a larger amount of curves. The pulse could be weaker. There's a larger rate of uh, failed access uh, in comparison with radial access and there's more calculation uh, time and uh, the learning curve is also larger. In the step by step we can see how we can get the pulse below the fingers, we position the hand, we get the, the, the everything ready, we do the puncture as we do for the radial with a uh, five French for example, but we usually uh, recommend uh, using a puncture needle and then we can release the patient hand uh, then as for the radial versus lateral, we can see that, you mentioned that 
This is an alternative uh, access, which is very useful for patients with uh, previous CRM, uh, particularly in the uh, anterior descendant artery. And it's been used for peripheral uh, processes that can be used through this uh, access with small diameters. And uh, for things that we can, for issues that we have at iliac or proximal femoral level. If you, as a final message, if we consider the, the radial first message on the scene, we cannot, we can mention several aspects uh, of it. Uh, in the new generations, we are, we are, they are very familiar. We ha they have a solid trainer. There are many questions. Uh, there's a renewal of materials, new materials. Uh, there are new access uh, access approach approaches, different strategies. There are some, uh, of course, there are weaknesses. There is a, a learning curve that is not so fast, especially from distal, and uh, sometimes they are very difficult to. Uh, to go around the, the anatomical challenges and uh, certain the, the interventions for the control, they're not uh, well recognized. The, the opportunities are the, the, the exchange of knowledge through social media, the, the, informa the information available, that, uh, the images. Uh, there are, uh, there's a very large uh, image library that helps uh, the knowledge and uh, at the same time, uh, the, the people who are starting obtain the experience much faster. For patient management and for material management, there are advantages for the, the usage rate of beds, and, uh, but there's a cert uncertainty uh, on the legal aspects that uh, this is uh, not the, so easy to, to convince the, the center and the family uh, there are certain uh, pathologies that are uh, not favored for this type of access and the costs in dollars uh, is kind of high, but it's high we have seen cost-effective uh, applications. As my final conclusions, the, the role of the health team is uh, very important because they, uh, encourage the, they strengthen the vision of the minimally invasive accesses uh, because they can see where they have been punctured we can control the results, it's better. There are ways to audit the performance, the bleeding rates, the perfusion rates. So even if it could be a little bit more expensive, it usually saves hospital costs uh, because the patient is uh, freer to, to is, can move more quickly. There is a difference in the quality of, of care um, in auditing the different uh, performance uh, measurements. They uh, encourage the, the joining the, the efforts of the teaching and uh, the academic uh, the academic support. It's very it's important for the, the team to be comfortable and to consolidate uh, as uh, as people of reference in the technique. Uh, they they can be familiarized with the technique and they can incorporate it uh, very quickly. And it's not just about uh, getting uh, new resources or new technologies, but we also need to work as a team with the tools that we have. Uh, I would like to thank you all very much. And I'm here for you for any question that you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Sebastian Peralta. It was an excellent presentation. This is a very important topic you talked about today. I believe there are some questions, but I would like to start with a debate. We have five minutes with Dr. Peralta. We have two questions. We have great, made a great progress in the radial access for scenarios and before it was prohibited, as we could say. The speaker is speaking in Portuguese and there is no simultaneous interpretation for Portuguese. 
É, aqui é um curso também para aqueles que estão em formação, sim? E sabemos do grande benefício, talvez o maior benefício da técnica radial no infarto, na intervenção primária. Mas quando... Puede ser que se haya quedado. Se cortó la, se cortó la comunicación con Ricardo. Bueno, se... Communication with Ricardo. Okay, would you like to uh, mention about the question they were doing to you about the use of the access, the radial access? in situations that before uh, were frowned upon, such as bridging after surgery, for example, or if we have to go to the left main, if we have to do two punctures or only one, how do you handle that? Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the participation. It is a great honor for me being here with you today. There are a lot of friends I, I have known for a long time. I believe the, the current practice, at least our practice in a WMS clinic, is go moving towards 100% of cases in a radial access. Currently, the, the one that we choose is the uh, right one. And as I said before, we have to try to take into account certain considerations or precautions when we think that the procedure may be a little bit more challenging than a conventional catheterization or an angioplasty, uh, uh, normal angioplasty in one of the three vessels. Patients with a cir prior surgeries or if you have to do a uh, peripheral uh, study, for example, that is when you have to take into account, okay, well, I need to do a quality study and not using excessively more contrast dye than usual, not using a lot of time. Of course, you need to take the time for the learning curve. It, it is clear for everyone, for all the centers at all the levels, especially beginner ones, but I believe that using the radial approach as a fr first approach is a decision of the service, but for more, more challenging cases, we need to have an alternative at hand. What we can do is in patients with prior uh, CABG, using the contralateral access, with the, with the bridging, it is more accessible and easier to cannulate in this way. And in that case, there is a possibility that we have to have a radial distal where the position of the uh, arm of the patient is more comfortable for the patient and for the operator where we have an easier access and you have to work more comfortable without having to move over the patient because sometimes depending on the body of the patient but it may be a little bit uncomfortable working in such a way in, during the first stages that might be challenging, challenge, uh, cannulating as we should or it may lead to certain complications or using more dye or more radiation that is, and that is not the idea, we need to try to decrease those levels and not choosing all the time the radial access when it is not feasible. Perfect. Nico, yes, congratulations for your presentation. It was excellent. As Ricardo, Dr. Ricardo mentioned, this is a course for a fellow interventionist. I wanted to make some questions from the audience. They asked if you have used some other uh, dilators of the, ves of the vessels to prevent spasms. And I add another one. If you could 
give us or give the audience some tips to decrease the number of spasms of the vessel in the radial axis, both from puncture and the use of materials, the fringe of the catheters that you need, the types of wires, Okay, thank you very much, Nico. I believe that using a local um, dilator of the vessel for a better access before puncture, it is not routine for us. It is when we see a difficulty in the radial artery. And sometimes when we touch and you are experienced, you can realize whether it is thinner or if it has tortuosity or if it is deep. So in that case, it is a good alternative before starting the puncture, taking a couple of minutes together with local lidocaine to use a vasodilator. We use nitroglycerin. I know there are experience with some other different vasodilators, but we use that, lidocaine and nitroglycerin, and that creates a good vasodilation. Some tips when you think about the, due to the characteristics of the patient that the patient may have spasm of the vessel or because it is present at the beginning, the most important thing we need to do is sedation. We have the possibility of doing procedures with an anesthesiologist that is very helpful for us. The patient is more relaxed. And another tip, apart from the vasodilation created by nitroglycerin, we need to have a good blood pressure. We're working on that, trying to have the opportunity not to puncture so many times once you go into the artery. And as regards the materials, of course, non-reusable uh, materials have a, a, a less degree of, vaso, of spasm of the vessel. And the most important thing we need to try is using five French or lower materials. In most of our diagnosis tests, we use a, a single catheter, the, the left coronary, the right coronary, so as not to be uh, used on used to be used on both. We use a hydrophilic wire generally. The puncture is with a conventional wire, but when we detect a stop, a stump, or a difficulty, you change to a hydrophilic wire to go with the specific anatomy and lastly the most important thing if you have to go to bigger French or more complex study or more prolonged study you need to go step by step not directly with a seven French introducer because we will have a spasm there and sometimes they do not go away so you need to change the access and that is not the idea you need you cannot force the access but you need to take care of it to try to end with the process within the same approach thank you very much one question one more question from the audience we'll leave that for the end because we're short of time we'll leave it for the end if we have more time we can ask him later okay ricardo would you like to continue we are honored to introduce Dr. Fernando Bernard Bernardi, an interventional cardiologist working in Sao, in Sao Paulo. He works in Santa Catarina, no Sul. He is uh, a member of our society and will talk about how to achieve a safe femoral access for large devices. Olá a todos. 
Meu nome é Fernando Bernardi. Primeiramente, quero agradecer à comissão organizadora do Congresso da SOLAS e CASSE, junto com o CASSE 2021, é, por esse convite para participar desse, desse congresso. É uma grande honra para mim. Então, fui é, solicitado para falar sobre como realizar uma via segura para grandes acessos. Eu não tenho nenhum conflito de interesse é, referente a essa apresentação. Bom, quando nós falamos de acesso vascular de grande calibre, e o foco dessa aula vai ser em acessos arteriais, né, é, a gente está falando de procedimentos que necessitam é, a inserção de introdutores de, de 14 frente ou maiores, né? Isso na nossa prática clínica, na nossa prática do dia a dia, geralmente a gente está falando aí de TAV, né? é, também é, EVAR, né? correção de, de, de aneurisma, no vascular de aneurisma, de aorta, e também impela, né? dependendo do modelo de impela, a gente pode necessitar a introdução de, 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 de bainhas, de introdutores de até 20, 22 frente. É, quando a gente está é, um acesso de grande calibre para um desses procedimentos, né, todos nós sabemos que existem várias vias possíveis, né, é, mas pelo, pelo tempo limitado que eu tenho para essa apresentação, o foco vai ser é, falar sobre a via transfemoral, que é a via é, de escolha, a primeira escolha nossa, né, na maioria dos casos, mas lembrando que existem né, muitas outras opções, é, mas infelizmente aqui o foco vai ser mais sobre o passo a passo de como a gente é, é, ter uma via transfemoral segura, porque ela é a via, como eu falei, de escolha e a via que está relacionada aí a, a, a melhores desfechos, certo? Bom, e por que, que é importante a gente falar de ter uma via é, arterial segura né, nesses procedimentos que necessitam de introdutores grandes, porque nós sabemos muito bem, isso já foi demonstrado em diversos estudos, que uma complicação vascular, é, ela, ela impacta em desfechos clínicos, ela aumenta a mortalidade, isso é um estudo clássico ainda lá do, 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 do partner trial inicial, que já mostrava que, que uma complicação vascular maior ela quase que dobrava a mortalidade dos pacientes. Né? Complicações vasculares menores, elas, elas têm um impacto menor. Né? Só lembrando que quando a gente fala de complicação vascular maior, a gente está falando de complicação que levou a óbito, obviamente, mas também há complicações aí que necessitaram de, é, de, de, de cirurgia que, que, ou é, transfusão de múltiplas bolsas de sangue, é, ou que levou a um risco aí de amputação do membro, enfim. Então, é, essa aqui é a classificação de complicação vascular maior, ela, ela é, obedece à classificação do, do VARC, né? E elas podem ser inúmeras, né? A gente pode ter inúmeros tipos de complicações vasculares, certo? Podemos ter desde um, uma estenose, né? Ali no, no sítio da punção, no sítio do acesso... Nós podemos ter uma dissecção grande, como é o caso aqui. Nós podemos ter uma oclusão completa do vaso. Podemos ter pequenas perfurações e até mesmo ruptura da, da artéria, da femoral ou da ilíaca, que são situações aí mais dramáticas. A maioria dos registros aí mostram que as complicações elas, vasculares elas ocorrem maior, né? elas ocorrem é, em 3 a 8% nos casos de TAV. Então, é, é uma incidência considerável e é por isso que a gente precisa tomar um, um cuidado muito grande, porque elas acontecem. Felizmente, elas vieram reduzindo com o passar dos anos, né, com melhoria das técnicas e com a redução dos tamanhos dos introdutores, né, mas elas ainda continuam é, bastante frequentes e, e, e continuam impactando é, nos desfechos clínicos. Então, aqui eu criei esse passo a passo de como a gente fazer uma avaliação bem didática é, é, de, uma, de um paciente que a gente potencialmente escolheria aí a via transfemoral é, para um procedimento de, 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 que necessitando um introdutor de, de grande calibre, como uma TAB, por exemplo. Então, o primeiro passo é a gente saber quando não ir na via transfemoral. A gente tem que lembrar que existem as outras vias 
em alguns casos a via transfemoral ela não é segura e a gente tem que saber quando evitá-la. Né? É, então aqui é importante então a gente saber quais são os preditores de complicação maior na via transfemoral. É, nós temos alguns aqui já bem descritos na literatura, mas os dois principais eu diria que seria essa relação do introdutor para o diâmetro da artéria femoral maior do que 1.05 e também é, quando há calcificação severa é, do vaso. Essa, e essa combinação ela, ela é ainda mais crítica porque uma vez que você tem um introdutor que é maior do que a artéria e se a artéria está bem calcificada ela não vai conseguir dilatar bem e é nessa hora que forçando você pode é, levar alguma lesão vascular mais, mais severa. Também outros é, é, preditores importantes, tortuosidade acentuada, doença arterial periférica, uma baixa experiência do, do operador e o sexo feminino foram também já demonstrados como preditores de complicação maior. Lembrando que quando a gente fala do, da, na, no, nessa, nesse índice aqui, a gente está falando do diâmetro externo do introdutor. Então, por exemplo, um ischi da, da, da SAP em 16 frente, né, ele tem um diâmetro externo de 6,5 milímetros. Então, se a gente pegar aqui o menor diâmetro, nesse caso, que era de 8,7 milímetros, né, a gente faz uma relação, essa dá uma relação de 0,75, então, teoricamente, esse, esse é um acesso tranquilo para passar esse introdutor. Olha que, mesmo tendo aqui uma região com uma calcificação severa, de 360 graus, aqui a gente não vai ter grandes problemas, porque a gente vai ter uma boa relação, o introdutor é, vai conseguir passar ali tranquilamente. Lembrando, mais uma vez, né, que os introdutores, é, o diâmetro que vale não é o diâmetro nominal, é o diâmetro externo real do introdutor. Então, é, por exemplo, aqui um ischi de 14 French, ele tem 5,8 milímetros de diâmetro externo. Existe uma regrinha, né, que a gente pode usar o diâmetro nominal, dividir por 3 de um introdutor e somar em média 1,1 a 1,2 milímetros, isso a gente vai chegar ao diâmetro externo real da maioria dos introdutores é, disponíveis no mercado. Além daquelas situações, desses preditores, existem, existem outras situações onde é importante a gente evitar a via transfemoral. Pacientes muito obesos, né, é, o risco aumenta, até porque se tiver uma complicação é mais difícil comprimir, se tiver uma ruptura ou uma perfuração vai ser com, complicado você fazer uma compressão manual, que muitas vezes é necessário. É, 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 lesão ou um aneurisma importante da horta, né? também você, a gente tem que cuidar muito com esses, com esses casos para a hora que a gente for introdu, introduzir né, a bainha. Então, são casos onde a gente tem que considerar evitar e também presença de endopróteses né, no trajeto. Também a gente tem que tomar um cuidado, não é uma contraindicação absoluta, mas em alguns casos é, realmente pode ser é, um agravante. Aqui é um, um caso que foi é, publicado ano passado, que chamou muita atenção, um paciente que tinha colocado uma, um stent na ilíaca, e 14 dias depois ele foi para a TAV, e durante a TAV o que aconteceu foi que, é, assim que foi inserido né, o, o, o dispositivo, ele acabou levando junto esse stent, a gente consegue ver aqui, na liberação da TAB, os autores, né, os operadores não viram isso na hora, só foram ver que esse stent foi levado lá para dentro do ventrículo esquerdo, só depois do segmento desse paciente, mas então é um cuidado que a gente tem que ter é, em pacientes que têm alguma endoprótese, principalmente se for algo recente. A gente pode danificar ou deslocar ela. O segundo passo é o tipo de acesso, percutâneo ou cirúrgico. A gente sabe que a gente tem duas opções, nós podemos fazer uma dissecção cirúrgica para ter um acesso femoral ou um, um procedimento totalmente percutâneo, onde a gente utiliza dispositivos de oclusão vascular. Uh, isso aqui, lá em 2015, nós publicamos do registro brasileiro de TAV uma comparação dos dois acessos e a gente mostrou que eles foram, tiveram resultados aí semelhantes quanto a desfechos clínicos né, em até um ano. Então, é, aparentemente, em casos que são é, 
propícios, né, a, o, o acesso totalmente percutâneo, ele, ele tem um desempenho aí muito parecido com a cirurgia. Né. Depois é, saiu uma meta-análise confirmando os nossos achados, né, que agrupando vários estudos que compararam a via cirúrgica com a via totalmente percutânea, mostrando que realmente as duas elas são é, equiparáveis quanto a risco de complicação. É, nós temos, existem hoje no, no mercado mundial é, é, diversos dispositivos, né? o que é mais utilizado, e aqui no Brasil, não sei se nos outros países da América Latina tem disponível os outros dispositivos, mas aqui a gente por enquanto só tem o ProGlide, né? onde nós fiz, fizemos uma técnica né, de pré-fechamento, utilizando normalmente dois percloses, dois ProGlide, né? nessa posição de duas horas e dez horas, eles são inseridos no começo, né, antes da inserção do, 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 do introdutor da bainha grande, e ao final, a hora que é retirada a bainha, os nós eles são, eles são apertados, né, eles são fechados. Existem algumas variações da técnica, né, como a inserção de, de, deles em paralelo, que também pode ser que alguns autores aqui vêm demonstrando que isso pode reduzir o risco de complicação, como estenose, por ser uma estrutura mais, mais anatômica. Mesmo assim, existem associações onde a utilização da técnica percutânea, ela pode, sim, trazer mais complicações, como também aqui o paciente muito obeso, onde tem uma profundidade da artéria femoral maior de, de 12, é, maior de 4 centímetros, né? esse caso aqui tinha 12 centímetros, então isso aumenta o risco do perclose não pegar, Pacientes com muita calcificação na artéria, muita doença na artéria femoral, principalmente se tiver cálcio, o ponto pode não pegar. E também é, artérias femorais pequenas, né, de tamanho limítrofes, também pode estar associado a maior risco de complicação, como esse caso aqui, onde houve uma estenose é, é, da artéria femoral. É, algumas técnicas de percutâneas de proteção, né, o terceiro passo, se a gente for com a via transfemoral, se a gente for com a técnica percutânea, a gente tem que, existem algumas técnicas, a gente pode é, 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 reduzir o risco de complicações, e a, e a principal de todas é uma punção adequada da artéria femoral. Uma punção adequada da artéria femoral, ela tem cinco passos importantes, funcionar a artéria femoral comum, obviamente, né, ela fica localizada, geralmente, é, é, abaixo da epigástrica superior, né, e, e, e ela termina na bifurcação, Funcionar apenas a parede anterior da artéria, funcionar numa região sobre a cabeça do fêmur, porque isso vai facilitar a compressão caso for necessário, uma punção central na artéria, evitar funcionar na periferia, né? E evitar áreas de cálcio, como nesse caso aqui, a gente tinha um cálciozinho, então a gente funcionou um pouco mais alto para evitar é, é, essa região de cálcio, onde pode comprometer é, a, a, o, fechamento da, né, o fechamento com o perclose. Então, aqui, esse caso aqui, ilustrando muito bem, a gente fugindo do cálcio, uma punção bem central sobre a cabeça do fêmur. E um passo que é muito importante hoje em dia é a utilização do ultrassom, porque o ultrassom ele vai nos ajudar aí a fazer uma punção bem central, é, evitando cálcio, uma punção só anterior. Então, hoje é fundamental que todo hemodinamicista tenha uma familiaridade com, com a utilização de, de punção guiada por ultrassom. Também podemos adicionar aqui uma camada mais de segurança, é, utilizando kits de micropunção. Isso também pode é, diminuir é, é, complicações. Uma outra técnica de proteção é a utilização de uma guia contralateral. Né? Geralmente a gente passa é, pela, 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 pela femoral contralateral, a gente usa uma técnica de crossover e já deixa uma guia posicionada lá no início do procedimento e caso a gente tenha alguma lesão é, no sítio da punção, da, da inserção ali do, do, do introdutor, a gente já vai ter uma guia passada lá, isso vai facilitar é, um tratamento mais imediato, como nesse caso onde houve uma pequena perfuração, a gente já estava com a guia protegendo e foi in, introduzido aqui um, um, um balão que foi o suficiente para corrigir, para fazer a hemostasia, a hemostasia no local. Além da, da guia contralateral, a gente pode também sempre é, é, auxiliar a hemostasia com, um, com a insuflação de um balão, onde isso vai ajudar também, é, muitas vezes, a diminuir o risco de ter alguma, 
algum sangramento local. Um cuidado que a gente tem que ter, que às vezes a gente passa aquela guia contralateral é, e após a passagem dessa guia contralateral, que a gente faz o pré-fechamento, a introdução dos dois percloses e pode ocorrer do perclose pegar a guia. Isso aí, e no final do procedimento, quando você for remover ela, é, você já apertou né, os, os nós do perclose, ela pode ficar agarrada ali na artéria, isso tem que tomar um cuidado, muitas vezes você consegue soltar ela mas se ela ficar bem presa e você puxar, você pode lesionar a artéria. Isso aconteceu uh, num caso que eu estava participando no Canadá, onde até houve aqui uma laceração importante da parede anterior da artéria femoral, né, que um pedaço da artéria que foi arrancado, é, porque a guia ficou realmente muito presa ali, e isso acabou tendo que é, converter é, de, de emergência para uma, uma cirurgia de reparador. Por último, finalizando, meu tempo já está acabando, é, a gente tem que estar tá preparado para fazer o tratamento imediato, né, pelo cutâneo das complicações. É, esse caso aqui, por exemplo, né, tinha uma, ficou uma pequena estenose residual após o fechamento é, dos dois percloses, é, apenas com uma insuflação é, com um balão, é, já foi suficiente para corrigir. Né, muitas vezes isso aqui só necessita uma insuflação prolongada, com baixa baixa pressão, você já consegue resolver o problema, é, mas é, a gente pode ter complicações aí bem, bem mais catastróficas, como por exemplo, aqui uma ruptura da artéria, que nesse caso foi corrigido com uh, um estente recoberto, um viaban, então a gente tem que ter um arsenal periférico na sala é, disponível para para essas eventuais complicações e também conhecer as técnicas né, de tratamento percutâneo de complicações vasculares, porque eventualmente isso aí pode ser é, salvador. Por último, é, quero só dar, falar, mencionar né, que uma via que tem me chamado muita atenção é a via transcarotídea, né, que é uma via que tem se demonstrado em alguns estudos publicados, aí, uma via bastante promissora, com resultados aí muito bons, geralmente o acesso ele é, ele é cirúrgico, né? mas é uma via que facilita, que tem auxiliado em alguns casos, é, nos casos principalmente nos casos né, que a via transfemoral ela é inadequada. Então, é, é, aqui é um exemplo né, de um caso que eu participei também lá no Canadá, de uma via onde eles têm uma experiência muito grande com a via transcarotídea, né, que expondo a, o cirurgião expondo a artéria carótida, e, e, e com resultados aí bastante interessantes, inclusive publicados pelo, pelo pessoal lá de Quebec, onde eu estive lá por um tempo, mostrando aí uma equivalência com os resultados é, da via transfemoral. Então, é, com isso eu encerro minha apresentação, eu agradeço mais uma vez a oportunidade, e, e, e um bom congresso a todos. Muito obrigado. Ok, excelente apresentação, Fernando. Eu vou perguntar, Nicolas, teríamos alguma pergunta? Oh, bom dia. Parabéns, Fernando. Excelente apresentação. Eu vou passar uma pergunta. Passo uma, uma pergunta aqui da, da audiência. É, se você tem... Se você... Primeiro, quais são as dicas ó, que tem que avaliar na, na angiotomo para escolher o, o acesso femoral? Bom, Nicolás, é, bom, a angiotomo ela é, ela é fundamental né, para a gente poder planejar todo o procedimento, inclusive a via de acesso. Então, olhando para a via transfemoral, né, a gente vai ter que avaliar o diâmetro, certo? Né, de todo o trajeto, né, seja a femoral direita e esquerda, vamos, é preciso avaliar presença de doença, calcificação, tortuosidades, né, é, até mesmo todo o trajeto na horta, ver se não tem doença de aorta, como eu mostrei alguns casos ali. Então, a angiotomo, ela é, sem dúvida, muito importante, né, também ver a altura da bifurcação, se tiver cálcio, aonde que esse cálcio está, então, é, 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 sem dúvida que a angiotoma ela, ela, ela tem um papel crucial nessa segurança da gente conseguir escolher a melhor via. E, 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 e esses acho que são os itens aí mais importantes, né? Diâmetro, tortuosidade, cálcio, 
e, e, é, é, e outros, todo o trajeto como um todo, né, a gente consegue ver bem pela angiotoma. Então, ela é importantíssima. Assim. Obrigado. A segunda pergunta é, se você tiver dificuldade, dificuldade no, no acesso, se você, por exemplo, se você for no, é, pela via cirúrgica, na via femoral direita, e você tiver uma dificuldade, qual a segunda, o segundo acesso que você escolheria, utilizaria? É, como eu te falei, é, eu tenho gostado bastante da via transcarotídea. Né? A via transfemoral, sem sombra de dúvidas, é a primeira via de escolha, mas, uh, mas é, é, eu não acho que a gente precisa forçar, né? a gente tem que ser bem criterioso, se, se a via femoral ela não for adequada, se ela for muito limítrofe, eu não acho que a gente precisa forçar, e, e, e porque o risco de complicação aí cresce muito, e a gente sabe que a complicação ela está relacionada com piores desfechos. Então, a segunda via, na minha opinião, de, de opção é a via cirúrgica carotídea. Né? Então, eu peguei essa experiência no Canadá, lá em Quebec, como eu falei, eles têm uma experiência muito grande, eles têm uma familiaridade boa com a via carotídea, Lá eles, 20 a 25% dos casos é feito pela via carotídea, eles, realmente eles não forçam a via femoral. Né? Se eles já anteveem que a via femoral ela vai ser complexa e, com, e muito arriscada, eles preferem não forçar e já ir para uma via alternativa, que no caso lá, de primeiro, primeira opção deles, é a carotídea e que tem sido a minha também. É, Leandro, é, gostaria de fazer alguma pergunta, comentário? É, é simplesmente parabenizar o, o Fernando, foi muito boa a, a sua palestra. Eu acho que a via carotida é uma opção, mas é, acho que não, não, não tem muita gente com experiência, para, com expertise para, para fazer uma via carotida. Mas é, eu não sei para o resto do, do, dos palestrantes, qual que é a sua segunda via no, no, no caso do, da, da femoral não poder, não poder fazer? Oi, Maurício, está aí Maurício, o Ricardo, você, o Chigal. Quer responder, Fernando? É, eu acho que ele perguntou, ele queria saber a opinião dos outros colegas, né? qual que é a segunda via dos outros colegas. No meu caso, é a carotídea, né? a segunda via, né? a via, seria a primeira via alternativa, né? seria a via transcarotídea. Maurício, quer responder? Uma, uma pergunta, Fernando. E aí, os cirurgiões são vasculares ou cardíacos lá no seu centro? Aqui, cirurgião, dois centros que eu trabalho. Um é um vascular e o outro é cardíaco. Né? Eu acho que ambos aí têm uma tranquilidade muito grande para poder fazer a via, o acesso é, é, é carotídeo. É um acesso bem simples assim, né, para o cirurgião. É, dificilmente a, a carótida comum ela é doente então muitas vezes ela é o paciente é todo arteriopata e a carótida comum eles, os cirurgiões lá no Canadá até brincam que é a lima né ela é a lima da tarde que ela está sempre sadia eles é, se impressionam que o paciente todo arteriopata eles, mas a carótida comum ela raramente ela ela é afetada então, e a carótida, e geralmente por questões anatômicas, a carótida esquerda, né? mas se, se, se o paciente tiver alguma lesão carotídea, né, unilateral, obviamente você vai optar para ir naquele lado que tem a doença, né, uma, uma carótida, uma bifurcação com alguma lesão carotídea, você vai optar para ir no lado que já é doente, né, obviamente deixar livre a, 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 a via, a artéria sadia, né. Perfeito. É, Maurício, é, só o Leandro tinha perguntado, é, você quer fazer um rápido comentário a sua via preferencial alternativa? Antes de seguirmos para a próxima palestra. Como nós estamos já em cima do tempo, vou ser bem breve. Não tem experiência com a via carotídea e a segunda via seria a subclave. Okay. Perfeito. É, Sebastião, teria um comentário? Eh, opino lo mismo. En nuestro medio, la segunda opción es la subclave. ¿Y doctor Igal? Igual en nuestro medio es subclave, luego fue transaórtico directo y, y de transcavar la cartilla, yo creo, 
iríamos más por carotilla que por transcala. Sí. Ok, acho que podemos seguir, Leandro. Va, va, vamos a continuar con la próxima, con el, la, la, la próxima charla. Eh, vamos a el doctor Mauricio Cavalieri. El doctor Mauricio Cavalieri es el actual director del departamento Solace y Periferal y nos va a hablar de eh, dispositivos de cierre percutáneo, cuándo y cómo usarlos. Adelante, Mauricio. Hola a todos. Uh, yo soy Mauricio Cavalieri, director do nosso departamento Solace Perífero, e estou aqui para falar para vocês sobre dispositivos percutâneos de oclusão vascular. Quando e como usá-los? Primeiramente, nós precisamos entender o que nós queremos quando vamos usar um dispositivo de oclusão vascular, é um closure device, normalmente na artéria femoral. Nós queremos uma hemostase, interromper o sangramento de forma mais rápida e confortável para o paciente e para o médico, evidentemente, também. Nós queremos evitar uma abordagem aberta, um cut-down e manter nossos procedimentos como minimamente invasivos, que é a nossa, é, a lei mãe da nossa especialidade, né? tentarmos ser mais simples e mais invasivos, portanto, mais reprodutível o nosso resultado. Esse tipo de dispositivo, ele apareceu mais, tem despertado mais interesse, apesar de serem bastante antigos, né, porque agora nós fazemos intervenções estruturais, valvulares, como TAV, é, intervenções aórticas, aneurismas aórtas, e que exigem ainda dispositivos de largo calibre, embora eles estejam em queda. Mas nós não conseguimos dispositivos de 12, 14, 16, até 20 frente é segurar a hemostasia com a mão, precisamos normalmente de um acesso aberto. E esses dispositivos, então, eles é, nos ajudam bastante nessa questão. E também nas síndromes agudas coronárias, mesmo com dispositivos, é, a, um MAQ 6F até 8F, por exemplo, intervenções em carótidas, a, o paciente anticoagulado, com uso de antiplaquetários, é, esses dispositivos, quando nós fazemos a via femoral, eles podem ser benéficos. Isso é o que nós queremos. E o que, que nós conseguimos, de forma geral? Conforto e hemostasia, 95% dos casos, pelo menos, ah, nós conseguimos. Então, é mais confortável, tanto para o paciente quanto para o médico, porque evita uma compressão prolongada, manual. Em TAV nós conseguimos mais um pouco, porque aí nós entramos no rol de procedimentos realmente minimamente invasivos, quando a gente consegue evitar um cutdown, quando a gente consegue evitar a intubação do paciente para fazer uh, o procedimento, quando a gente consegue evitar o marca-passo. Uh, então, tudo isso, nesse somatório, o dispositivo de, de oclusão vascular ele é benéfico em reduzir complicações. Mas o que nós não conseguimos? Nós não conseguimos de maneira geral, nós falhamos eh, em procedimentos gerais, em reduzir estatisticamente as complicações, como sangramento, hematoma e lesões vasculares. Os maiores estudos, e inclusive o a, a, a último consenso da Sky, que é o documento mais novo que eu achei em relação a isso, de abril deste ano, coloca muito claramente que os closure devices, eles são não inferiores à compressão manual. Ou seja, eles não são superiores em relação a prevenir complicações. Eles trazem conforto. Né? E pode ser, há um questionamento, de que esses dispositivos possam, inclusive, levar a mais infecções. Nós temos dispositivos de estrutura, os muitos, tipos de dispositivo, mas basicamente eles são de dois tipos, de sutura e de plugs. A de sutura, vou falar do ProGlide e ProStar. ProStar não temos usado, ProGlide é o primo, é o irmão menor, irmão caçula do ProStar, que é o de uso é, mais universal. E o dispositivo com plugs também temos inúmeros, Angiocil, Minx, Star Close, é, o Manta, que é um dispositivo novo, mais calibroso, mas eu vou falar é, também só do Angiocil, 
porque esse é um dispositivo é, universalmente aceito. Eu vou mostrar uns, alguns vídeos para os senhores de como nós fazemos, na verdade, é, primeiramente com o anjo ocil. O anjo ocil é um dispositivo de plug, como eu disse, que tem três componentes. Esse componente que apareceu foi é, para localizar o vaso, a, a profundidade, e esse aqui é o corpo principal uh, do dispositivo. Todos eles têm em comum uma âncora, um pezinho, onde você vai apoiar na parte de dentro do vaso, certo? E aqui é que vem realmente o plug de colágeno por dentro desse tubo. Eles são simples, uma vez que a gente começa a usar é, os closure devices, nós vemos que eles são simples. É claro que precisa de um pouquinho de experiência e de repetição, mas é, não tem muitos segredos. Tá? Fazemos esse primeiro clique, que é para nós sabermos a profundidade em que nós vamos colocar uh, o anjo ocil. Então, sobre a guia, localizamos a artéria, esse pequeno furinho aqui, nós temos o fluxo saindo, um fluxo que deve ser brisk, um fluxo bom, não é só uma gotinha. Né? Então, sabemos a profundidade, às vezes essas letrinhas nos ajudam a saber a profundidade. Né? Recuamos um pouquinho para confirmar que é ali mesmo, ó, aí estamos fora do vaso. Vamos voltar com ele. Aí estamos dentro do vaso de novo. Então, nós podemos... É, partir para a próxima etapa do anjo ocil. Essa é a posição que nós queremos. O furinho dentro, dentro do vaso. Né? Nós vamos liberar aquele pezinho, a âncora ali. Então, tiramos o guia e essa parte que ajudou a localizar a profundidade da artéria. E vamos conectar a segunda parte que é onde nós temos realmente é, o plug. Encaixamos. Com isso, nós vamos estar já liberando a âncora, o pezinho, aqui. E quando nós vamos puxar, né, esse pezinho vai nos assegurar que nós estamos na posição certa. A âncora está na posição certa, aqui onde nós vamos colocar o plugo de colágeno. Tendo já alguma resistência é, da âncora, nós vamos puxar aquela parte novamente para fora. Fazendo um outro clique. Então, o plug vai ser compactado. E aqui algumas pequenas variações é, de um dispositivo para outro. Uns não tem esse botãozinho, um dispositivo antigo. Basta nós empurrarmos aquilo ali para compactar o plug. Então, depois, cortamos o fiozinho aqui embaixo do nível da pele. E esse é o anjo ocil. Já o close, o ProGlide, é um mecanismo de estrutura. E esse é um pequeno vídeo também demonstrativo, onde, ao fim, passamos o guia, retiramos o introdutor, isso para pequenos furos, até 6, 8 frente. É um dispositivo menorzinho. Retiramos o guia, introduzimos o, o ProGlide, até detectarmos também, mais uma vez, naquele furinho, a saída de sangue por aqui.
Então, esse tem quatro passos. Esse passo 1, um, nós liberamos a, a âncora, da mesma forma que o outro. Puxamos um pouquinho, temos a resistência, agora vamos disparar né, as agulhas. Com um, dois e o um, três, puxamos os fios. Puxamos os fios para fora e já o cortamos nessa posição. Vamos liberar agora um pouquinho da tensão e voltar de volta o pezinho para a gente poder puxar para fora o ProGlide e deixar os fios ali. Os fios, se vocês observarem, é um fio totalmente azul e o outro com uma marquinha azul e branca. Nós vamos fazer agora a tensão no, no azul, que é para o nó ser puxado para dentro. Temos um dispositivo que ajuda isso, muito simples, é só um pezinho, né, para compactar, para colocar o nó de forma firme ali. Puxamos agora a outra linha para terminar de forçar o nó, azul e branco. E aí vamos empurrar os dois juntos. E finalmente cortar a linha também. Ali abaixo da linha da pele. Ok? Quando nós temos um furo maior, um dispositivo maior, o que nos interessa é que nós podemos fazer furos maiores, até 21 frente, 8,5 a 21 frente, com dois dispositivos. A única coisa que nós precisamos é saber que nós vamos preparar antes com um pré-close, nós vamos deixar os fios no lugar e ao invés de retirar o guia ao final, perdão, é o tempo, ao invés de retirar o guia no final, nós vamos Fazer o deploy às 10 horas de um dispositivo. Vamos voltar o guia. Depois de deixar os fios no lugar. Isso. Retiramos esse. Colocamos... O segundo ProGlide, agora virado para as duas horas. Como os senhores vão ver. ProGlide agora para duas horas. Repetimos as etapas todas. Ao final... É, é que vamos ter os dois fios para cada lado e vamos apertar os nós. Não temos tempo para o vídeo todo. Então vamos em frente. Nós temos de desafio é, um treinamento, que não é assim uma coisa do outro mundo, poucos casos, uma repetição, isso fica automático. A gente passa a entender bem os dispositivos. Uh, temos que ver que o cuidado começa antes, começa na punção. Então, a punção tem que ser em local adequado, não pode ser alta nem baixa. Isso são contraindicações para você usar esses dispositivos de fechamento. Vasos com calcificações, onde você não consegue perfurar com agulha, ou você tem um risco de, pela, pela falta de, de elasticidade do vaso, você introduzir, por exemplo, um plug para dentro, perigoso. A obesidade, com a questão de ângulo e profundidade. E o tecido cicatricial fibrosado em local do acesso vascular são coisas que a gente tem que ficar atento para não termos complicações usando esses dispositivos. Como eu disse, eles nos ajudam nos, na, nas intervenções de large board, de introdutores uh, grossos, isso é inquestionável, mas é 
para dispositivos menores, 6, 7, 8 UF, eles ajudam mais no conforto, propriamente, do que reduzem complicações. Vejo vocês, então, no fim da sessão. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, Maurício. Excelente a palestra. É, foi muito clara, muito clara, na verdade. É, Nico, Nicolás, é, temos alguma pergunta do público? Sim. É, parabéns. Sebastián muito... tem alguma pergunta também, ah. depois. É... Queres fazer a Sebastián? Bom, bueno, muito bom, bueno, a verdade, a apresentação muito clara. Yo quería saber en su opinión si tenía alguna elección en particular, dependiendo del procedimiento que uno programe, si hay algún dispositivo que sea mejor eh, para alguno, sobre todo teniendo en cuenta los primeros pasos o cuando uno inicia la experiencia. Y por otro lado, si toma en cuenta la posibilidad de procedimientos futuros a la hora de elegir alguno, eh, como para no dejar eh, el acceso anulado o con alguna dificultad en el futuro. Sim, obrigado pela pergunta. É, como eu disse, nós temos na prática aqui esses dois dispositivos. É, e pelo que eu vi, conversando com colegas de fora, outros países também, são os dispositivos que são é, assim líderes nos outros países. É o Anjocil e o, o Perclubs. Né? É, a recomendação é você esperar três meses né, para fazer um novo acesso naquele local especialmente com o dispositivo com plug, tá? Eu já tive caso que vários meses depois eu funcionei, acabei funcionando no mesmo local, mesmo assim veio um pouco de, de, de tecido, parecia um resto do plug, do colágeno, saiu pela agulha, para minha surpresa. E aquilo já tinha passado o tempo é, que era recomendado para eu funcionar ali. Então, eu vejo que os colegas também preferem esperar esse tempo e ter usado o dispositivo de sutura, porque aí não tem esse problema do plug absorvível ali. Tá? Mas você pode reacessar após alguns meses em, 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 nos dois casos. Maurício, vou fazer uma pergunta. É, quais são as, as dicas, ou o que, que você tem que ver é, na angiotomo para fazer uma colocação certa do, do dispositivo? Tem alguma contraindicação? É, é mais ou menos o que o Fernando já colocou. Né? É, onde você vai ter complicação com os dispositivos de fechamento? Vasos pequenos, ah, mulheres, né, principalmente, obesos. Se a calcificação está no lugar onde você vai fazer o acesso, né? e aí você tem que planejar, por exemplo. Em alguns casos, você tem uma bifurcação alta, Ali não é bom de você usar um dispositivo, você deve fugir dali, da femoral com a bifurcação alta. Às vezes você vai acabar fazendo uma punção muito alta acima do ligamento e uma falha do dispositivo pode dar um hematoma de reto peritônio. E a punção baixa, ou a punção que seria o habitual, mas vai pegar a bifurcação, é onde eu já vi os maiores índices de complicação dos dispositivos de fechamento. Então, sempre antes de fazer o fechamento, você faz um teste com, ah, você já viu se você tiver angiotomo, mas em todos os procedimentos, você faz um teste e vê se a sua função está na femoral comum de forma adequada, longe da bifurcação. Porque na bifurcação, o que acontece? Aqueles pezinhos podem pegar no ramo. Então, a tudo da sua referência, da profundidade do vaso, é, da âncora ficar adequada na parede do vaso para você seguir as etapas seguintes, tudo isso se perde. Então, é onde você tem o maior índice de complicações. Última pergunta. Você acha que com um dispositivo é suficiente ou qual a média de, de quantidade de dispositivos que você utiliza na sua prática? Por caso, né? Sim. Para, para casos, eu uso assim muito para carótidas, é, porque isso é autorizado aqui para mim, para oito frente. Então, nesse caso, eu uso um dispositivo só. Se você vai usar coisas de, de maior calibre, como a Horta e TAV, normalmente são dois perclus, como a gente falou, com essa técnica de perclus. 
Perfect, I believe we're on time. We're going to continue with the next presentation and then if we have some minutes we can have a debate in group. The next talk will be given by Dr. Gilal Peña, the president of our well, brother society of interventional cardiology here in Mexico and we'll talk about recognizing and treating vascular complications. Thank you very much, Shigal, for being here with us. Hello, everyone from Mexico. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Ignacio Chavez, current president of SOSIME. I thank you for the opportunity to participate in this module one of vascular access in the ProAjugar module. The title of the talk is treating and recognizing vascular complications. I divided it in two parts. One is radial and the other is femoral. We need to understand that this is for fellows. In training, the participation had the objective of giving uh, useful information. It will not describe all the complications, but it will be a practical uh, talk. This is what we want the least on a radial axis, and from the image where we can see a documented hematoma with a CT going to this compartmental syndrome, ending up in surgery is a catastrophic complication you do not want that happens in a very rare number of cases. This photograph is the courtesy of Dr. Barbeau. Probably that's why uh, he felt the need to document the pulse oximetry to decide whether to use or not the radial axis. But I want you to take into account is these images that are catastrophic. And as regards to the radial complications, can be divided into intraprocedural, postprocedural. In both cases, we have bleeding and non bleeding ones. I want you to see is that at the end, what we're going to be dealing with is a complication, a significant complication of the radial axis, which is a bleeding with or without hematoma that may lead us to a compartmental syndrome. Of course, we have all the rest of the complications, the occlusion of the radial artery, the pseudoaneurysm, the fistula, but these two that you can see here in red or pink are the ones that caught our attention, but because they can take us to something that we see there, such as the compartmental syndrome. You have the evolution of the radial artery, that's this happens. This is the second paper you have here. We were on call and a colleague called me to show me a picture. It does not correspond to this picture that you're seeing here, but it was almost similar, almost the same. On how to treat, he said, I do not see any additional problem. The cubital is okay. So. What he did was correct at the end this image that is very uh, complex, does not require treatment beyond the current treatment and you have to control the possibility of having an, uh, an hematoma. The abortion will lead us to the loss of circulation and a spasm and if we understand the site of the abortion it is very likely that we can continue with the perfusion of the artery and not have and not to have more severe complications. We need to take into account the classification method that you all know is divided into two, five degrees of the hematoma depending on the region it extends to there is no doubt that the most important ones are the three four and five where we have the compartmental syndrome what we do not want is such as a, a limit such as this that may end up in the surgery we have three elements that are very important a compressor bandage a finger manometer and introducers that we need to take always have handy long introducers 16 or 25 centimeters so that we can seal the perforation site this is a very good example a four, a four days case fellows of first and second year a woman of 83 years old 
small psychological stress, very skinny. You can see in the image the mistakes we have here. We have the perforation in the contrast here when we go to the room to see the procedure. I see that they are using a counterlateral uh, approach on the left one and there was a loop and a small artery. So we end up with femoral artery. But we needed to document what we saw here. The list of mistakes, the first of all, is a perforation and then the change to the counterlateral approach, meaning that he, you had to uh, remove the introducer and we could have continued in the same approach and change into a larger introducer and control the, control the bleeding site. And when you place the sphingomanometer, I, I do the check and it is uh, on the arm away from the perforation site. It, can, can, it may uh, stop the circulation. We cannot compress the area. If we change to the femoral axis, we may have an approach, a scientific approaches in a way, or divide the femoral head in these different regions so as to be able to distinguish where to do the puncture and have a good puncture. And these are the anatomical marks, radiological marks of the groin area of fat and the femoral head and with time it has been very useful marking the femoral head but the time uh, continues and you are exposed to different ways of working and then you find that marking the femoral head tends to sometimes does not uh, locate precisely the site because of the tilting of the syringe is not controlled, the needle is not controlled, so you need to control the femoral puncture because it needs to be in the common uh, femoral one, that is, in the middle of the femoral head, you will have it not a very high, not low pun puncture. If you are faced with a situation of not being able to do a puncture guided by, uh, by uh, the imaging, the risk of bleeding is very high, and if we puncture very low, the risk risk of having an aneurysm or fistula in an emergency situation is a very complex situation. In most of the cases, the message to residents is see which type of complication you may have for which you are the, uh, the best prepared. If you are hesitant, I'd rather go with a low puncture than having a perfect puncture that ends up with a lot of complications then. The ultrasound approach is very useful, but we are not used to working with that. There are uh, a lot of people who are starting to uh, use this. I'm not used to doing this, but some, some people do. And when you see a professional that is using the ultrasound, it's very useful, it's effective and fast. However, I must say, I do not have uh, all the experience. And fluoroscopy is what we have and what we believe in, so maybe that will be uh, something to take into account. Placing the femoral head is very easy and helps us to understand where to infiltrate the lidocaine and once we are located the femoral head then you can create in an, an angle of 80 to 90 degrees with fluoroscopy directed uh, upwards for the needle to go upwards we can have a very safe puncture and a clean one if the if we're talking about the complications the truth is that i did not want to do a revision where you can find in different places of the complications of such as dissection, perforation, rupture of different French diameters. In case of acute ischemia, you will uh, be using stents, for example. You need to prevent those situations. This is a parenthesis, uh, an aside comment for micropuncture, femoral micropuncture. Is there a real uh, advantage? For the cath lab, mm, I find it very difficult to uh, go for this option. 
I do not find a real advantage, but I leave this open. Maybe we can talk about this later. Why? Because in different situations we can have a radial axis. For example, in this case, we started with the radial axis at complex uh, distal branch. We used the radial approach that we already had. Then we place a, a guide down and we have localized the femoral head where we have the artery and over there we do the puncture and we can see how to place move the, the wire and the puncture is perfect. In a different case, a very similar one, as the, the other was an unstable patient, this one is stable. I'm sorry, this one is unstable, the other was unstable, was stable. We can see a shock, a patient in shock, we use the pulse and we use the radial approach and a punctural, a femoral puncture. In this case, we use a radial approach to make sure we have a proper management of femoral access with high French. The best is to prevent, in the case of this example, cervix damages and the procedure belongs to a ATAVI. We have a puncture that is radial, we do the same technique. We place the guide to the femoral head, we do the puncture, we do the crossover technique. And here you can see the technique, you continue with the process, the TAVI, and then in this particular case, we saw a major bleeding, and we could control that by having an, a balloon that was uh, inflated. And then we had a perfect closure after keeping the balloon inflated, and that can help us for multiple complications. However, this image, and this is the sarcasm of life, we always have to take this into account. We need to have the, the left femoral of the patient, the puncture, maybe a bit low, but near the bifurcation, we uh, place a per close, seven French, and after one month, we have this patient with atrial fibri uh, fibrillation and pain of the upper thigh, and we document a hematoma. The high French uh, puncture did not have any problem. We have a rotary access with no event in a patient with oral anticoagulant and who had a great hematoma. I hope I had given something practical. I placed myself in the fellow uh, shoes and I hope this has been really useful. I appreciate the opportunity of sharing this with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Uh, very detailed. Nicolás, we have some questions from the audience. Okay, yes, I share what uh, Leandro said. I don't think that he left many anything to, to left to ask, but here we have a question from the audience. I don't know if uh, you or anyone can answer it. How do you uh, place the femoral access in premature? Do you, does anybody have uh, experience in congenital? No, no, I'll pass. I'll skip this one. I'm scared when I see that, when I get to see that, yes. What is it that you... What does the, the resident or the fellow, the cardiology resident uh, who is in charge of this procedure, what does he or she has, have to take into account on a, about a patient to suspect that there may be a complication after the, the access uh, or for ephemeral or radial access. Taking advantage that we are in a resident auditorium, I would say that the radial, the complication is the, the reduced uh, space. There's going to be an early presence of pain and the patient or the nurse uh, are going to let us know that something is not all right. And in femoral, now that uh, I know that radial is uh, taking a leading role, but in femoral we are seeing many complications because uh, we're not used to, to them. So the venous functions are 
uh, most traditional. They don't cause pain, they, you cannot see them, they're hours, just hours later, you can start seeing the hematomas. Uh, so we need to pay attention to the pain as a patient, and in the cases for femoral, and for not so large French uh, numbers, or venous pensions, we need to pay attention, it's not a matter of radio, we need to be, pay a lot of attention here. About the same topic, I think that we have a great challenge in front of us. Because our residents and uh, the new generations are very good at radio. You know, femoral is uh, used uh, l less and less. So we have made an effort to have to perform uh, a number of routine femoral accesses for them to learn because we run the risk that we have super experts in radio but that, that we also have uh, professionals that uh, have a hard time with femoral. So I wanted to ask you in Mexico what time, uh, type of program has the society performed to work on that. Maybe Leandro can also speak a little bit about his uh, experience with Producar. The experience is more uh, center dependent than society dependent. The, the only practical way to do this is uh, not forcing on going to radio at all costs. If you want to be an expert, you can do it but uh, you lose the opportunity of going to femoral if you need to. So when radio is not uh, working s simply, then switch to femoral, then the resident learns how to do femoral and gets a little bit more experience. In special cases, you can take the radial to the, to the limit. You can go to contralateral, radial, contralateral radials. We have four options there. Uh, but the first thing is uh, not to force the resident, not take them to the limit and switch them to femoral as the quickly as we can. Yes, I agree. What would be the sequence? Sorry. Jorge Fernando, hola. É, temos eu, um minuto, temos para um encerrar. Não, é, é, é rápido. Eu acho que para a femoral é, tem que criar a rotina de usar ultrassom. Né, mesmo para a função simples, né, para fazer um cateterismo, isso é, realmente muito da experiência da femoral é, se veio com landmarks anatômicos, com né, sentindo a, a, o pulso, mas o ultrassom, é a, a, a curva de, de, de aprendizado ela é muito rápida e extremamente segura. Então, se for é, uma... uma e a sugestão é que os residentes têm que já treinar de, desde a largada a punção com o ultrassom, né? para identificar, consegue ver a altura já da, da bifurcação, se é doente, se não é, é muito fácil ver a agulha entrando. Então, essa é a minha opinião. Né? Ok, perfect. I think that uh, the rest of us think the same thing of uh, in training centers to continue training at least a small percentage of femoral. So we're a little bit uh, after we passed our time, we're going to go into the next uh, module. But I, first I would like to thank our speakers, uh, of course, and Nicolas as well. Uh, we finished our first session and very shortly we will start with the second module, which, in which has very important presentations. Thank you very much to, uh, to all of you. Okay, good afternoon, or good, uh, good day to everyone. We're celebrating the, the win of the volleyball national team that took us to the semifinals in the Olympics. Thank you for your applause uh, for the volleyball team. Uh, let's start with uh, module number two. Complex coronary intervention. We're going to introduce some clinical cases, some educational clinical cases. And since we started with Proeducar, the idea of the program was to be practical. 
and to uh, teach based on cases. And I think that this uh, this table uh, adjusts to that. Uh, Dr. Gabriel Maluenda is one of the uh, most active uh, champions of Producar and he's going to be uh, presenting the first of our talks. Okay, thank you very much to all. Thank you, Dr. Londero. We're going to start now with uh, this interesting session. First, I would like to present Dr. Franklin Anna from Colombia. He's going to talk to us about the usefulness of, uh, the helpfulness of invasive imaging. Good morning, everyone. My name is Franklin Hanna, the human interventionist. To me, it's a pleasure to be able to participate in the in Solasi. <laughs> I'm going to introduce a clinical case with uh, for calcified lesions with the cutting balloons and lithotricia. <coughs> Okay, so this is my conflicts of interest, and now I'm moving to the clinical case. This is a male patient, 60 years of age, with a antecedent of uh, hypertension, this epidemic, the, uh, diabetes type 2, uh, unstable angina, and in the cardiac uh, cath catheterization, we found that we had a, a left coronary, a dominant left coronary, uh, stenos, uh, with severe stenos uh, of the the ADA, uh, with a uh, medial calcification, uh, and then we had uh, an ACD, a proximal occluded ACD, and a VBI of 55%. Here's uh, the cardiac catheterization. We can see the calcification degree that uh, compromises the proximal and the medial side of the anterior descending artery. And uh, geographically, if we see very little the, of the coronary calcification. If we see it with the motion, it is severe. And if we observe it before providing contrast with the motion of the heart, and we can see it in, on two faces, on two sides, we consider it to be severe. So this is a patient we can see without the motion of the heart, we can see the calcification, which is uh, steady. And we, see, we can see that it appears on, on at least two sides. So we consider that it's a severe stenosis for this patient. So, this is the image of the patient. And geographically, uh, this is an infography that has been uh, published by Dr. Sorini. And it gives an idea of what we should do in uh, to this kind of patient. If it's a mild classification, it can be pre dilated. Uh, with a OCP or uh, and if there's a suboptimal exp exp expansion, we, or we can uh, go to a stent implantation. If the sub if the expansion is suboptimal, we go to the lithotripsy, and if the calcification is moderate or severe, we can uh, go through IVAS and we can assess if there is a, a calcium arch over 180 or 270 degrees. Moderate is uh, up to 270. We consider it severe uh, over 270. Also, we can also check the length or the thickness. If the thick, thick, thickness, if we see it by OCT, if it's over 0.5, we consider that it's not severe. And if it's up to 0.5, it's not severe. If it's over 0.5, it's severe. Sorry. So this uh, provides some uh, scoring. And we can see if we can treat with high pressure or very high pressure balloons. And depending on the result, if there is a suboptimal result, we can go to a lithotripsy. And if uh, there's no answer here, we can uh, probably go into uh, other options. But if the score is greater, we can we have to go straight to lithotripsy. 
that's your well, then we can go into then if it doesn't work to a rotational therapy so what should we do in this case we should uh, first perform an IVUS or we should need to check if we are going to perform IVUS versus OCT these are the images that we can uh, obtain with OCT we can see the depth and we can measure that uh, depth of the calcification and here we have IVUS, the, the acoustic uh, imaging that we can get from the calcium we can see the nodules here with OCT and here we see the, the acoustic shadow so we can do an angioplasty with a high pressure balloon we can we may think of a scoring balloon we don't have a coronary lithotripsy in Colombia it's very expensive so it's very difficult to introduce a lithotripsy in Colombia and the other one would be rotablator so this is what we thought about this patient. We decided to take the patient to angioplasty. They've had pain during uh, its uh, hospitalization, so we had to take them to uh, the cath lab and start thinking about uh, a rotational uh, procedure. So we can see that we've had a catheterization with a JL 3.5. Uh, and this is a catheter that provides good support and our hospital didn't have a, an extra support catheter CLS or EBU so for this reason we decided to go in with using this uh, JL 6.57 French and we decided to go through a guide so we decided to use this supported by a macro catheter we went through a recourse guide. The guide went through it, caused a lesion, but we tried to balloon first because a catheter could not even pa pass through a balloon of 1.25. So we changed to a balloon of 2 by 2 15. And what's the problem that we had here? How did we go on? The patient evolved with uh, thoracic pain, with chest pain, uh, plus alteration in the EKG in the monitor. We used a micro catheter, we could not go through. We used uh, an extension of catheter, a guidezilla, for supporting to try to pass the balloon. We then we performed the grenadoplasty with a 1.2 times two, uh, by 20 balloon. And then we tried to move on uh, after pressure we saw that the balloon ruptured so we tried to move on with a second guide uh, we did not have any success with it so what should we do in that case the, this is a question we could send them to cardiovascular surgery and the problem would be if we do this is that while we're prepping the patient and uh, planning the surgery surgeons usually have to they are not they do not remain in the hospital so while the surgery is programmed we will have uh, to wait for a certain time that's not going to be favorable for a patient with an infarction or infarction the other one is a medical management and that the infarction to involve then the other one would be to transfer to a center with a laser we live outside the capital, so that would mean sending the patient to the capital. Or the other thing would be to call Dr. Bill Lombardi from the US to collaborate with this case. And the other one would be to call a plumber, because uh, what, we, what do we say here? Uh, this is the algorithm. This is the actual algorithm. We have something that is uh, what we call the non-crossable balloon. So, it's a, we should inflate a balloon, try to pass a balloon or two, then using microcatheters. And if the microcatheter, the profile does not pass through, then we should try a, a catheter with a balloon in the, the tip, and we could not get success. We tried uh, with uh, other techniques. And the other one is to perform a Carlino technique, running contrast, 
than doing uh, wire cutting technique with when we cannot pass through and then we inflate two balloons, uh, one balloon close to the occlusion or the stenosis and while we traction the other, meanwhile we traction the other wire to create fissures to break this plate here. So we could inflate another balloon and this is a uh, to, to try to get through. But since we cannot get through, we use the guide yeah, catheter extension. But we tried it and it provided support. Then we went to the we could try moving to the uh, microcatheters. So, so as not to use the atherectomy guide. Another techni technique that we could have used uh, would have, could have been a subintimal crush, a retrograde, or uh, we could uh, use a subintimal for a distal, distal anchor. If all of these failed, if we, if we have failures in all of these uh, procedures, we could try using a a subintimal uh, stingray and what we did was we inserted a microcatheter and using that guide we were able to uh, we can see here the, the dissection that we did afterwards a pre-dilation a crush in of the calcium region we did carlino too we did contrast uh, to prevent dissection to try to make this guy move forward through the subintimal. And then uh, we changed it for a microcatheter and we were able to get the catheter to move a little bit more. Once we changed the catheter, we changed it for a 0 0.09 guide the, for the rotational atherectomy and then we moved to 1.25 and 1.5 uh, balloons. We were able to perform the rotational atherectomy. Here we have, we are polishing here the, and afterwards we passed uh, high pressure balloons for a one to one ratio to, to the the, the, the step, um, then we implant the, the, the stent for the compliance, one to one for the compliance. So after two days we had a satisfactory result, we could discharge the patient free of pain. And the conclusions are, so that, are that the coronary calcification is a common pathology in patients that uh, get a heart uh, catheterization. We need to know. Uh, we need to know all the different techniques and to have the soft devices for uh, managing calcified coronary disease. Okay, thank you very much. Gabriel, would you like to say something? Yes, that was a very good solve of the case and congratulations. It was a very complex case, not being able to pass any device. I believe that we should highlight the importance of imaging guiding this type of interventions that is always facing calcified lesions. I believe it is essential to have an imaging of intravascular med thought otherwise we are blind to make decisions and for a good result. Dr. Londero? Yes, I believe this is a case that we could summarize saying it was a, ca a case in which even with the most delicate balloon that we have, that is 125, we could not go through the lesion. This is a clear indication and you always have to try to use a rotablator, for example, that will be one will be uh, the, this will be one of the greatest options. Maybe a technique that allows us to change, to replace the wire being saved, the 014 with a rotablator one and inserting a microcatheter 
to the deepest part of the lesion and there moving the 014 wire and moving the 001 of rotoplator, I believe. 009, I'm sorry. I believe in those cases, Gabriel must have learned this with Gus Pichard. He uses directly 1.5 or 1 or 1.75 elements of the uh, rotablator technique you have to be very patient he was he said that it was a, a friendly technique but because you needed to take the time and not to heat up the system but I believe the rotablator is the indication in this type of procedures any other balloon such as the IBL ABL or cutting balloon or scoring balloons are high profile uh, balloons and they could not go through. If a small one does not go through, we could not work with the others. I believe that for deep calcifications, Rotablator has regular results and maybe an indication of this new technology that is IBL. ABL. I'm advising a company that is related with a device, but I believe it is very important to say this. Well, I believe that the case was a very good example, very educational one, and Franklin, would you like to say something from your experience? First of all, I would like to thank you. Thank Gabriel, Hugo, and the and so Lassi, the problem that we had is that we could use a guide and we could not have a microcatheter, we could not place it and during the procedure the patient started with complications so we stopped the procedure there and reprogrammed it. We entered also without a high support catheter and that was a mistake from our side. We did not have a lot of support because we are not using a good catheter to advance what we needed or advancing the micro catheter. So for me that was a mistake, the biggest problem and we did not have at that time the uh, ultrasound and I believe I as well as Gabriel that it is very important for the procedure to have this type of technology we did not think we did not think that the lesion would be that severe and we thought we would not have great complications we had left atherectomy as a standby decision so after seeing that calcification I believe we could not have used the introduced the IVUS, but it would have been great to do the IVUS after the puncture to see the length of the stent, to see the diameters, the proper diameters, and to see whether we could solve that or not. I believe that is very important. Two short observations. When a balloon does not go through, the IVUS uh, cannot pass as well. So if we are talking about IVUS and the importance for calcifications to assess the lesion before the dilation, IVUS is of a relative value and the same goes for the OCD. And second of all, there's a lot of evidence that we can use rotoplator over dissections or under plague already dilated. We believe we couldn't, but now we know we can. We're going to continue because we are short on time. We're 15 minutes and five of discussions. Now we're going to see the presentation of Dr. Mario Arasha. Okay, we're going to see how to do a uh, bifurcation. We need to understand that they depend on knowing when to we need to consider the importance of the lateral branch to characterize this structure and to know the options that we have. The angio version is essential 
is very important in the beginning to have a good projection, to be able to have the good distal segment, the lateral branch, the angle of the bifurcation, and the distribution of plague. We need to see that in the bifurcations we have the different diameters that are proportionate to the diameter of the proximal reference with the formula of elect that I'm exposing here and it is very important to choose the devices to for this for this lesion. The angiographical classification once analyzed this point is the Medina classification that is very well known and you have the number one on the presence of the lesion and zero the absence of lesion we know the, the segments of the bifurcation and one that has a compromise of both parts in the osteum will be a 1.1.1 uh, verification. This standardization is very important for treatment. But we all know the limitations of angiography and we need to analyze sometimes the bifurcations not only with angiography but also with ultrasound or with OCT that will allow us to measure the distribution of plague. They can say, for example, mention some signs such as negative remodelation of the osteum side branch. Sometimes they cannot predict the occlusion of the branch on the treatment. The OCD allows us to see the confirmation of the plate, the calcium, and the reference diameters with very, with a lot of precision. This is very important for the treatment. How to define the importance of a lateral branch? In here, uh, a concept was developed depending on the myocardial mass irrigated by a specific vessel, that is fractional myocardial mass, and the bifurcation has been studied with scanner to see which bifurcations irrigates more than 10% of the myocard uh, myocardial section. That will be of a significant ischemia. You can see that one out of five perfuse over 10%. So most of the time doing very complex uh, treatment in a bifurcation is worthless because that would not benefit the patient. Apart of considering this anatomical uh, issue, we need to see whether we have ischemia or not. And that can be done with our gold standard, which is the functional coronary evaluation. This is a very ex a good example with the severe stenosis, anatomically, but not functionally significant, based on FFR to the both branches. Which are the technical considerations for the management of a, of a bifurcation? Keeping the treatment as, simp as simple and safe as possible, so as not to have complications. Most of them were going to be are going to be done in a radial sex fringe access. I have to use catheters with good support. Always two guides and never taking out the guide before we do the crossing. An optimal preparation of the lesion, limiting the number of stents is possible, and the use of intercoronary images. The most complex the lesion, the most benefit we'll have with the imaging. Classified uh, treatments have been classified with the MATS score. There are two groups placing the stent in the main vessel first, and then we have different techniques, or placing the stent towards the lateral branch. And we use double stand, for example, of uh, the culotte or DK crush. Apart from that, we have optimization of the stand with kissing balloon, depending on the case, a classification that is very useful. Which are the strategies to select the procedure? We have two groups, the provisional stand or the double standing. Provisional stenting should be our choice in simple situations with low stenosis in the lateral branches. In very complex bifurcations, you can use both techniques, the provisional stent or the double stent. And in here, the, the, there are some specific criteria based on the definition study. Let's say the following a criteria 
If we are using, for example, non-truncus, non-branch situation, having a stenosis of 90% of over, with an excitation of over 10 millimeters in the side branch, is a different, um, is a deep pulse within the major one. If we have complex angle or multiple lesions, we can categorize that as complex, and the double stent technique may be useful. But the philosophy of the provisional stent, we need to take into account in most of the bifurcations. This is not synonym of one stent, because after I place a stent in the, in the main branch and then I place the other one, this scaffolding, I can continue with the double stent technique. The pre dilation of the side branch is a question system. It is not recommended as routine, but is the most flexible one. When there is a very severe stenosis with calcium or thrombus and even a high probability of requiring treatment, you read the direct and of uh, difficult access. The provisional stent is technique is very elegant, and when it is done, it is great. It is based on placing the stent in the main branch and then optimizing the proximal part with POG technique and then you stop there and see whether the, whether the patient needs another treatment or not to the side branch. You may have to reuse the wire during the, the kissing or dilation of the side branch and repeat the pot, the POG. The stent will deep the diameter of the stent will depend on the distal reference. The fu fundamental axis of this is the POT. This is a game changer of the provisional stent, and you have to do it the right way because you have the, the result of placing the stent on the top. You have to place it so it is in contact with the carina, and then you optimize the opening of the branches and you do not go away from the stent. If you place it very distal position, you will have a stretch of the distal vessel and the crushing of the carina. If you do it very proximally, you cannot open the struts in the openings and it will be very, uh, very difficult to continue with the procedure. This is the most important and we need to do this with time. To do a pod, you need to know the balloon. Not all balloons have the same configurations as regards the radiopaque area on the shoulder. I know that the shoulder starts from the radiopaque part. You have to know your balloon to, to do the POT. And you know, need to know the stent because not all of them have the same dilation uh, capacity. And if I need to dilate my proximal stent to 5.5, there are some stents that will not reach that dimension very easily. So you have to know your stent. You also have to know how many links you have on the stent because sometimes the link interferes with the dilation. Which are the indications for crossing the guys and the technique with kissing balloon or only dilating the branch? When I have a bad flow, when I have a TEI MI of 3, or if I have severe stenosis, or FFR, significant one, or if we have a relevant CX, for example, or if you have stents covering the SB osseum, this is also an indication to go for this. It is essential to recross the guide in the optimal area. This is, has been very thoroughly studied with PD reconstruction. When you do it when the proximal way, you deform the stent and you will not have a good scaffold. It is important, as we said before, whether you can recognize if there is a link of the side branch, because if we have a, a, a link on the red point, doing a dilation of the side branch is not always efficient, so very not very effective. So we'll have to go with the distal one. The kissing balloon, if I decide I will do that in the side branch, I have to do it well and taking the time to do so. You need a non-compliant balloon, I recommend inflating the side uh, branch three times with that you get a good opening of the side branch, you can see the diagram here, and then do a simultaneous kissing and deinflating at the same time and taking the time. A uh, long kissing of uh, 20, 15 to uh, 20 seconds and you will have better results of your stent.
The collateral effect of kissing is having this deformation of a bottleneck. This may alter the flow in the coronary area, so we need to try to avoid that deformation. One way to do so is doing a kissing a bit asymmetric, that is not symmetrical, with a small balloon towards the stent. Another way is to correct that, repeating the POT after kissing. So one step of the provisional step, and you have to be very careful because you cannot do the same POT you did at the same point. This is not correct in the image. It has to be a very bit more distal because otherwise we reduce the ostium of the side branch. A possibility, a different possibility is doing the sequence kissing, I'm sorry, POT, side, and then repeating the POT with the same precaution. This has provided good results and lower percentage of malaposition of the struts in the proximal axis. The problem that I see here with this technique is that the deformation that is produced while opening the side branch is not always corrected with the uh, re-POT. So you have to dilate again the stent with the stent balloon of the, uh, of the side of the distal ear distance. After the keys or the POT, if this is good performed, well performed, it is very easy or will have a minimum protrusion or you can also go with a mini crash. When are we going to do TAP? This is a technique that is very safe, a very good one to do this. After doing the provisional stent, I place the stent towards the side branch and I place a balloon in the main branch. I do a minimal protrusion, I release the stent and then I dilate with the same balloon of the stent at high pressure the ostium of the stent I have just placed and then I do a kissing balloon and I read POT. And this has to be a, very, a way so as not to interfere with the previous one. Two stents as an initial strategy is a very good option in complex uh, cases but I will not use a lot of them so I suggest knowing a technique and make it, um, using it depending on the anatomy of the patient. The Kulak technique is a uh, technique that needs to be learned. We need to do the resolution of the distal part to have the result such as this. Then we have DK crash. It is a very complex technique. I have to do a crash, then crossing the proximal strut of the stent, doing the first kissing, placing the other stent, taking out the wire, doing the second POT, crossing again wherever I can, doing a second kissing with non-compliant uh, stent and do another uh, procedure. These are not very easy to do and they have some pitfalls. For example, DK crash. If you do not do a good crash, of the stent. When you recross the wire, you can go within the stent. And then when you do the kissing, you deform the stent. The other thing that can happen with TK crash is that you can go very distally, and if you do that, when you open the strut, you create an area of non coverage of the carina, and that is a problem. So today, if we can treat this with double kiss, double crash, initial one and then with the POT balloon the drug releasing balloon there are not a lot of data they use will be safe if it is used with medical stents in the main branching may have maybe a good opportunity to avoid bleeding we're going to end with a clinical case of a bifurcation of the truncus and Medida 110 and you can see here that in the ostium of the um, of the artery of the LAD, this was done with a provisional stent. We pre-dilate, we select a neverolimus stent. We do the pot POT. We recross the wires, and the first one seems to be okay. But when we did the 3D, we are in a bad way. We are in proximal area, so we had to recross the wires again. We're, we go from distal to proximal. We cross the wire at a distal, more distal area. You can see it here, and we will repeat the 3D. We are in the correct place. This allows us to have a great kissing balloon. Uh, another POT and having very good results such as this one with the respective OCT that believe me uh, the stent was very good implanted.
after two years of uh, follow-up without complications. You have to understand the anatomy and physiology of bifurcation. You need to consider the clinical relevance. Most of the times, this stent provision, 10 to 15 percent of provisional stents may end up with a second stent in a simple way. If they require two stents, please, you have to learn one technique and learn it very good and use the proper material and using uh, the imaging to help you. I, remind, I recommend you to read this and following our Latin American group, Latin BIF, in the social media. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raja. There's very little to say after such a complete talk, uh, so exhaustive, so clear. Uh, would you like to, to say anything, Gabriel? I'd like to, to join in on congratulating uh, the doctor for such a great talk. <coughs> there are very important things. Uh, the most difficult is trying to 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 know which which should we take away as the most important thing? Maybe is it that the bot is the POT is what changed and try to make an emphasis on that? Yes, uh, thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Doctor Londero. This is a complex complex issue to solve it in 15 minutes because I remember the first uh, bifurcation we had stands we had. Techniques were very simple, and with everything that we have moved forward in the field, it's very hard to sum up, summarize. Uh, the three main points are one, choosing for first which of the bifurcations we should try, we should uh, treat. And I see patients that end up having complex uh, techniques in a diagonal two. And diagonal two is probably not going to be relevant for, for the treatment. So they end up being with a complex technique, uh, with a large duration, the possibility of thrombosis, etc. And uh, the, the technique is uh, done wrong because we are not as uh, expert as the people from Dr. Chen's team who do a DK crush excellently. I've seen a lot of restenosis of the vessels. So the, importance is, the important thing is to select well which is the technique we're going to use. Second is to go in with a clear strategy. This is always going to be a provisional stent, unless the patient has a very complex bifurcation and that with the provisional technique is, does not ensure us anything. And that the provisional technique, I would say that all of the cases are just as relevant. Free dilation of the main branch, the correct selection of the stent, so as not to compress the carina to the side. And also the POT as a step is also important because most of the times it's done improperly because we don't take the time enough, enough time to, to do it right. And finally, the need of a next step that uh, is going to affect the results. So, and with a provisional technique, you could uh, treat 99% of bifurcations. So, with a double stenting technique, uh, you should, I recommend dominating one technique well because the steps are very difficult we need to follow plenty of protocols always image guided and you should uh, dominate it uh, very well so in that case we make sure that the patient is successful because in my practice i start with double stenting in less than two percent of the bifurcations so i would do maybe eight a year or so and i'm saying in this number that i'm saying is pretty high so in most cases i do provisional and the results are very good when you follow the necessary steps. That would be the, the summary that I would say. Uh, because uh, we need to go a little bit more in slow motion, maybe. Very good summary, thank you. I would like to ask you about your opinion about uh, something. But first, we would like to emphasize the importance of the of balloon. I learned that painfully until I did the post dilation of the provisional stent uh, systematically. I think that I made plenty of mistakes. Uh, I 
I passed from the stand between the stand and the vessel wall, and that's the sign of a complication or of problems. So I would love to use. I think that the POT balloon is uh, one of the is probably one of the techniques of choice. And also, I have learned to use the clear stand or stand boost, uh, however you want to call it frequently and almost always in bifurcations as a good way to know how the stent is where did it expand at the before bifurcation level and I think that this is uh, valuable I don't know, what do you think Mario about using stents to guide the angioplasty of bifurcations Thank you, Dr. Londero. Yes, it's a very nice tool. It's a very good tool. I would say that the main use is to see the final result of the... This with a stand boost or a clear stand or depending on the, the, the equipment that you're using after we finish the correct steps, particularly with the POT, you see the stand scaffolding towards the lateral branch. So. It could help you if you need a second technique, a second stent in, in the lateral branch. So you need to be very precise with the first stent. So either it is with the tap technique, with the T technique. I think it's very good and it's probably going to help. But uh, what it doesn't help, help is for uh, guide crossing. And this is something that we haven't discussed enough. When you see the comparisons uh, between DK crash and uh, provisional stent in the trunk, Sometimes a provisional could be wrong because they are recrossing using an incorrect stent. And the angiography, even if you have a good projection that you come from distal to proximal and you're going to cross right next to the greener, then <coughs> in this distal strut, maybe 30 to 40 percent of the cases is not going to be not going to work exactly as you want to. <coughs> so. I think that uh, for that we don't have a different solution that isn't this wonderful thing that is a reconstruction that is uh, probably not available in most labs, but that's probably going to be a gold standard in the future, using the guide on site. But for that we cannot use stand boost yet. Thank you, Mario. I don't know if uh, Gabriel, you want to add something. If not, let's move on. Let's move on. Okay. We have the next for the talk of Dr. Fernando Cossack. To simplify a uh, complex situation, it's almost impossible, but we cannot hear Fernando. It's a matter of a technical issue. Okay, my name is Fernando Cossack. My topic is the treatment of the left coronary main. Uh, how to simplify a complex situation in a small historic perspective. We know that the revascularization surgery has been the standard treatment for patients with uh, left main disease based in clinical studies that compared it with medical treatment. There are clinical randomized uh, clinical studies that uh, support the strategy of revascularization through ATC. So both in the American and the Europe, yeah, through PCI, sorry. And both on the American and European entities of reference. So here we see uh, in the, the left main, we find 5% uh, of all angiographies, we find a disease in the left main. So we have a the right, the distal third and the bifurcation, and typically the the exit side of the circumflex is more open than other bifurcations. Has a medium caliber of five millimeters and a length of ten to thirteen millimeters. There is an intermediate branch in thirty percent of the cases. There's a, an independent origin from the A or circumflex in 0.5 percent of the cases, and an interaortic and pulmonary. Uh, way of 0.03% of the cases. The current guides establish that, uh, that the indication of the, of the endovascular treatment or angioplasty 
based on the syntax score. If the complexity of the, the anatomy, of the coronary anatomy, is low, then if we are, uh, before, uh, before us we have a low syntax, the coronary angiography is indicated. So this proves the level of evidence of uh, revascularization of the European Society of Cardiology. So, if the, the syntax is intermediate, then the angioplasty is a valid alternative. And when we have a high in syntax, we need to identify the patient clearly. And here we need to consider the following factors, the general factors, clinical factors, and anatomical factors. So the main uh, relevance uh, of this item is the presence of the heart team. How do we value the, the left main? We evaluate, uh, we evaluate it with angiography, with uh, imaging and uh, physiologically through a pressure guide. So the angiography is the classical mesh, the classical means. The ECS tells us that the revascularization is uh, indicated when we have the, the main with a stenosis over 50% with a documented ischemia. We know that there are many limitations when the, lesion, the lesions are in the ostium. Well, there is uh, plenty of variability inter uh, between observers. The presence of spasms make the interpretation difficult. IVUS, uh, we're going to talk to that before the case presentation, is a fundamental tool for the diagnosis of uh, of TC of PC uh, sorry of left, left main diseases. Uh, geography is, uh, has a 2AB indication level for uh, for main lesions. So if we have a, a lumen over six, it's going to be allow us to uh, defer the revascularization. And there are different uh, parameters uh, based on imaging to implanting the stents. We know that a higher value, a value over 0.8 FFFR is uh, good enough to defer the intervention. About the criteria for implanting stents, we can uh, list the criteria suggested by De La Torre Hernández from the Litro study group, and they, uh, they suggest that we will perform the angioplasty with a stent from the ostium in the left main or in the media, medium cent, uh, third of the, the main. We need to check for the luminal area over 90% of the distal reference area. For the other, the funnel shaped uh, mains, we, that goes uh, down to 80%. And we need to look for the symmetry and uh, in other cases we need to look for uh, the plague load under 40% and the absence of uh, hematomas. We could use different techniques, the double stenting or the crossover technique. And uh, we see that the criteria we're looking for is the expansion of the stent in the descending and the anterior descending artery. So you need to find that the stent uh, for standing is that it needs to be over 90% of the distal reference area. Same thing for the circumflex. Um, they suggest uh, considering the use of FFR if necessary. We're going to go through that uh, in a second. Got the double stenting, we have the same criteria, uh, both uh, for the DA and the circumflex. It's uh, over 90% of the distal reference area and the uh, optimum criteria of uh, a position and symmetry. Then we have the, the, what, the, the studies that we already know this, the rule of five that uh, suggests a minimum luminal area of five, six for the anterior descending artery, seven for the confluence and eight for the main. And this is uh, for Asian patients and for Caucasian patients with a larger build. We use uh, six for the circumflex, seven for the descent, anterior descending, eight for the confluence. And in the left main, we need 
to uh, work. What's the use, uh, the difference of using uh, the IBUS in trunk, uh, in main and geoplasty? It's, uh, we need to consider this uh, Britannic registry study, which we used at the use of IBUS, increased in 30.2% from 30.2% to 50.2% in 2014. The use of, uh, of echo echography uh, was associated to uh, the use of IBUS, sorry, was uh, associated to reduction of uh, cardiovascular events in 46% so 30 days and 34% uh, after a year. This effect is attributed to the use of, of longer and larger stents, the absence of residual dissections and the coverage of plague in the reference segments with an impact, impact in subacute and late uh, stenosis. Here's a meta-analysis meta published in 2017 with 6,480 patients with, from 10 studies where angioplasty guided by IVAS was associated with 40% reduction of all causes of death. A brief uh, reference to pressure guides, uh, we see here in multiple works. Uh, I consider that this one is uh, very important because of its originality and that because of the, the data that it provides for decision making. This is a work, a small work, with 23 patients, the, with angioplasty of the left main with crossover technique. We then they performed IBUS and FFR at baseline before stenting and uh, after stenting, after crossover, that means after the stenting, 42% of cases showed uh, an angiography uh, at stenosal diameter over 15%. But this is what I consider relevant of this study. Only 7% showed an FFR under 0 0.8. The minimum luminal area of uh, was less than 3.7 and uh, the plague burden was over 56%. 56% pre, uh, before was a uh, predictor of an altered FFR after uh, stenting the circumflex. And finally, before moving to the cases, in the consensus of AAPSI in uh, 2019, they recommend uh, in integrating the techniques. Uh, if we look at it from uh, with a large degree of abstraction. If we have a minimum luminal area of uh, over 4.5 millimeters, we need to revascularize. If we have a minimum luminal area of uh, six, we need to use a conservative treatment. And if we are in an intermediate area, we need to, between the both uh, approaches, we need to consider uh, a physiological uh, evaluation and then the point that we need to look at is 0 0.8 and uh, the technique selection we need to differentiate where the lesion is uh, located the lesion is in the ostium and the body or if it is in the bifurcation if it is in the ostium and body uh, then the options are the, the direct implanting the direct stenting the sabo technique or the sipal or floating wire techniques if we are in a non-complex bifurcation, so we would use the provisional stenting, and for a complex bifurcations, we could go to a provisional stenting, double stenting, the T, TAP, culotte, crush, mini crush, etc. So the ostium body lesions can be treated, as we mentioned before, with a direct stenting implant, and this is the most used technique. But it has a serious uh, issue that is the possible longitudinal uh, deformation lengthwise. So, this is why they have designed techniques that can mitigate this adverse effect, which are the CIPAL technique and the SABO techniques, which consist of using a guide, a sign cord that uh, goes around the coronary sein. So, 
Uh, one of the other techniques is uh, using the struts and then the end of the stand and so that these techniques have a small uh, registers. The Sabot technique, uh, we have serious, we have had serious uh, issues with the Sabot technique due to the stand location. So yeah, these are techniques that we need to consider when implanted in the cardiac sinus and to be able to, to use them correctly. This is uh, something that we can check when uh, checking for a, a verification at the, at the level of the left main. Here we have the definition study. We define what is a complex bifurcation. And uh, we consider it as uh, one that has a stenosis over 70% with a length over uh, 10 millimeters or equal to that number. So the study uh, suggests that if we are at a true bifurcation, if that is a complex true bifurcation, we have evidence for benefits of systematic uh, two stenting strategy with contemporary stents. If there is a no, there is no complex uh, bifurcation. The evidence is not as uh, as evident, and we should need to evaluate each particular case. We are going to share this uh, case, this first case where we use the provisional stenting technique. We clearly visualize a severe lesion of the left main with an absence of stenosis in the ostium of the circumflex artery due to uh, the stability of the patient. And we performed afterwards an analysis with the intercoronary uh, peripheral and the anterior, so where we can observe here clearly the large amount of plague, the plague burden around the main and as a data, as a piece of data, we consider that for the longitudinal reconstruction we looked for and we found that the sign that is absent is that the one that's called the eyebrow sign which could be a predictor of uh, the plague displacement. In this case, we need to we treat a media, medium third uh, lesion. So, based on the damages that we obtained, we decided uh, implanting a stent 4.5 by 15 at 12 atmospheres with uh, expansion with a 5.0 balloon at 16 atmospheres. And we uh, performed this is the uh, NGO after the stent implant, and this is the evaluation with intracoronary ultrasound. So we can see this at the level of the main, a very good, and we can see very good position and symmetry. Same thing with the anterior descending uh, proximal artery and the carina. Even though it, uh, we did not perform a selective run of the circumflex, we can visualize the, there's a possible displacement of plague towards the ostium. In the second case, we have a, what we interpreted as a complex bifurcation. This is the baseline and geography. And uh, we had doubts here on the the, um, the, the importance of this disease in the proximal circumflex, so we performed divers on both vessels, and this is the run that we made uh, toward the anterior descending artery. Here we can see the, the endoluminal area, that's typical for the ostium of the artery, and uh, at the main level, with a, an important uh, plague burden uh, on the, in there. So here we see the calcification with the acoustic shadow and uh, this is the run that we made through the circumflex artery 
So what we found was uh, an important amount of uh, plague, an important plague burden over 40% in the proximal circumflex, and we were able to confirm the diameters of the main to define the diameters of the stents. In this case, in this case, we defined to use a double casing, double crushing technique. This is a technique uh, technique that everybody knows here. Uh, the predilation with a kissing balloon, positioning of the circumflex of a 4.0 by 14 stand, and we released the stand in the circumflex, and then we had a first crash with a radial uh, balloon of 3.0 by 20, the recrossing and the first kissing, then with the positioning, we did the positioning of a stand in the, the, the anterior descending artery. And then we did the second crash, and then the recrossing, and the second kissing with a 3.5 by 15 balloon, uh, 20 atmospheres, and 4.0 uh, by 15 with a final pot, POT. And this is the final result with IVAS in the posterior, in the anterior descending artery with a distal transition, with a great position and symmetry. And this is the crush area, this is the with the scent. We have the optimal implanting criteria at the left at the main level. And we can see the same thing on the run from the circumflex with no dissection imaging in the distal transition and optimal criteria optimal implantation criteria in the uh, left distal left main. This is the angiographic control at the end of the procedure, and we can conclude that the uh, evaluation of uh, left main uh, lesions is complex and it requires uh, appropriate angiographic projection and the use of IVAS or FFR. And right now, the syntax score, the possibility of refast uh, for doing a full revascularization, uh, the comorb comorbidities of the patient guide the uh, decision making about the, on the regarding the therapeutic option and the osteoman body lesions are less demanding than the bifurcation lesions, which uh, require a more complex approach. And the angioplasty needs to be optimized in the left main using intracoronary imaging as well as uh, stenting and technique that have the highest evidence and the better pharmacological coverage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kozak. I do not know whether we have Riomar Costa here. I cannot see Riomar in the panelists. Can you please tell me if Riomar is connected or not to the meeting? No, he's not present. What do you think, Gabriel? Do we do an informal talk or we listen to the Rivamar presentation although he's not here? We can have a minute of discussion and then I would present the talk and maybe we have uh, some minutes to end up with. Because we do not have a lot of time, we have 10 minutes, 15 tops. And we have 15, 16 minutes then. Okay, let's see the talk and then we'll leave some minutes for a debate. Do you think that's correct? Yes, that is the best option because the, the talk of Kozak and Mario's talk was were very complete and sometimes you talk just to mention a few things but they were very complete. So we are going to listen to the presentation of Dr. Rivamar Costa. Hello everyone, I am Riva Marcosta, interventional cardiologist from Sao Paulo, Brazil. First of all, I would like to thank Solasi and the organization for the invitation to participate in the pro Educar course with the fellows. It is a very great honor for me speaking about imaging. When to use them to guide the angioplasty procedures. These are my conflicts of interest. 
As you know, there is a great variety of imaging techniques, invasive and non-invasive ones that we have for cardiology nowadays. In this presentation, we're going to focus on two, IVAS and OCT. Ultrasound we have in Brazil, I know I don't know about the other Latin American countries, but in Latin America there are two systems, Boston one, ILAB or S5, a Philip one with color. Both have a pullback that is automatic, that works at 0 0.5 millimeters per second to one. It connects to a cat an ultrasound a catheter that may be rotational or mechanical. This is an OCT system. It is very similar to the IBIS, with, but the pulva is faster because the light allows us to have faster pullbacks that may be of 50 millimeters per second. It also has a catheter connected and in here it does not, it uh, emits a, a light, uh, sorry, a sound wave and not a light wave. We have the rotation of catheters producing a sound wave against the plate. It reflects back to form the image and each type of plague of tissue has a different characteristic. As with the, the images with sound or with light are different. Can we use intravascular imaging before the intervention, during and after the intervention? Before, mainly when you need to see the dimensions of the lesion or to compress the lesion to see if it is significant or not. Sometimes we need a physiological method. For the left main, we need to use ultrasound as well, and we can also use OCT, but if I see the physiology, that is better to place the balloons. It is very interesting having a, a pre-image. During the intervention, it is important to know whether the device was uh, used effectively, if it is uh, in a good position, if there is no geographic miss, or if there are no dissections, relevant ones, not the small ones. And after the intervention, it is very useful to have the imaging. Once we have a failure of the devices, the uh, drug devices, if there is thrombosis or stenosis, it is very important to understand the mechanism and to plan for the strategy we're going to use. If it is for a, if we're going to use a drug balloon, if there is a fracture or not, different methods will, will be used depending on the mechanisms and the characteristics. There are a lot of registries and studies that favor the results of angioplasty. The evidence are greater with ultrasound because there are more studies of ultrasound. It, is, it has over three decades, so OCT is relatively younger. We have less evidence, but the evidence is comparable to the ultrasound we have. You know that every time we use an ultrasound, there are not a lot of differences in mortality, infarction, but there are less there is less risk stenosis of the target lesions when you use the imaging methods. There are two great studies, randomized trials that use ultrasound and geography to compare the prognosis. First of all, I use XPL only for long lesions with over 30 millimeters. 
1,400 patients participate and they had 50% less of the event as compared to the and those that are only used on geography. But it was due to the reduction of resonances. There was no impact in mortality, in infarction, or in thrombosis. Another randomized trial was this one, Ultimate, that also compared bifurcations, chronic lesions, calcified lesions, and again, such as XPL, a 50% reduction of the incidence of cardiac events, mainly due to the restenosis that was cut in half. This is, not, this is not randomized, but imaging was used in the left main. We also have to mention this study that compared patients treated with stent, guided or not with ultrasound in the left main. And more recently, in 2019, Dr. Kang and the team Pre um, presented the main compare trial. 77% of patients underwent IVOS guided stent implantation, and there was a comparison in general and an adjusted comparison case controls for a, a statistical adjustments. In terms of mortality, the, com the comparison why with this uh, adjusted, there was a great tendency of reduction of mortality in the left main with ultrasound. Less percent of mortality. Here we have an analysis of a randomized of surgeries versus dent Excel. You know access trial. There was a group which was an IVUS sub-study, 690 patients IVUS guided and only 245 guided with angiography. And out of the IVUS guided, 504 participated in the sub-study. And what was the observation? The final area of the stent with IVUS was a predictor of benefits in patients treated with this, we see the predictors of cardiac events in the left main, in the excellent IVUS. Is a, we can see that it's a reduction of the events. Well, we have an area of 9.8 square millimeters. Out of the patients, we have after three years, they have 11.5% of major cardiac, of MACE. Patients who do not follow the criteria that are lower than that, they have 18% more. There is another sub-analysis on ultrasound. You can see here on blue. The two arms, maize, TLR, resonosis, population, blue that, with, uh, that did not use ultrasound. The evolution was worse than the population with ultrasound before, after, or uh, before and after. If you do the ultrasound at a certain point, it is better than not doing ultrasound at all to reduce maize and to reduce the, uh, the stenosis. Of course, I recommend always doing this procedure, ultrasound before and after, but if that is not possible before because it is a very critical stenosis and the patient is not stable, there is no problem, you, you can treat them and then you do the ultrasound to try to avoid complications. If you do at least the ultrasound one time, it is better than not doing anyone on the left main. And when we talk about the meta-analysis of uh, 10 studies, we have 
the different studies in the I was in left main favors reducing the mortality rate but as I always say it is necessary to take this information into account over uh, five, 50% of population needs to study the strategy using a, a larger balloon, using a different stand in the lateral branch, in the CX, a change in strategy. Only doing imaging, a problem that we have is a lack of criteria for imaging to see if the stent is good implanted or not. The XPL study has criteria that are very scarce, they are very poor. We have some criteria and a comparison with IVUS and OCT. It is a criteria that is a bit better. The then we have different criteria. The eyesight criteria published this year in circulation cardiovascular intervention. We used the elastic membrane guided with ultrasound and a TCO. And when we do not could not measure that because there was a lot of plague or the plague was very calcified, we used a different uh, maximum diameter of the lumen. And these are the criteria that we use to guide our procedures depending on eyes, uh, using the criteria of eyesight. This is for you to understand better an example. We do the ultrasound before and after. So you have the reference, the distal reference, five in proximal reference, a vessel that has the proximal reference, distal one, and a burden of lake that is almost normal, an area of 11.3 with a different diameter. We use the, the mean, 3.73. In proximal, we have more plague. It is 50%, we believe 50% a good value to treat, to replace a stent. We have here the proximal reference, oh, we have 50%, we do not use the EME, we use the larger lumen. 3.5, we use a device of 3.5, but we know that we can dilate a balloon uh, to a greater diameter. Then we place a stent, 3.5, and, and then we dilate with a balloon 4. We have here the result, and here we have an expansion of almost 6% of the, ref, the distal reference. And it is also possible to guide the ultrasound and also using OCT, a lesion of the left main, the eccentric lesion, a patient with prior surgery, and then we have cla functional class 3, I believe. We also evaluated this with OCT. We can do it. We can evaluate the left main OCT, but we, some people do not do it, but we have over 50% of left main studies with OCT. It is very possible. You can see here there is a stent that was previously uh, implanted with a, a bit of hyperplasia but with good results, then it crosses, it is, uh, the left main is a bit distal, and you can see 
La circunfleja. De CX. It is simple. Stent is implanted in the left main. And in the mid position, there is a lesion that is very significant with fibrosis and some calcification. In the proximal ostium, that is normal. But we have a left main, a lumen of 4.1 and of external elastic lamina of 0.3. If it is, it is uh, we can do the dilation at 30 atmospheres, for example. The, the other was the direct result. This was compared with OCT. A centibar proximal to the aorta. You see the left main and a good expansion in the whole extension. This is my last slide, and I must say that according to the evidence that we have, imaging guidance might be a change in the long term of the complex PCI. If we have lesions with a lot of calcium, we need to reduce the risk stenosis. The impact in mortality is mostly observed in the left main and in other scenarios it has a different impact on stenosis. But to see the, uh, the benefits of imaging and OCT, we need to see the image very clearly and then to do the interventions. And people need training. Whenever we can, we have to do before and after the intervention. And from time to time, it is uh, we need to review the different cases. The more we see the imaging, the better we will understand the complications. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. I see that uh, there have been four excellent talks. Very good. Very complete. Uh, I'm not going to add anything else. Uh, the time has run out. I would like uh, if you Gabriel could uh, do a little bit of a closing with a summary. Yes, I would like to congratulate as well uh, all of, to all of the presenters. Throughout this session, we performed uh, complex interventions such as the the, the main bifurcation or general bifurcations that uh, present Mario and Fernando presented, and a very challenging case that we where we faced uh, calcif uh, complex calcification. Uh, so in these cases, cases, the imaging has been fundamental to uh, choose the, the proper strategy and perform the intervention and ensure a good outcome uh, by helping ourselves with the, the, the imaging. I would like to say that that sums up more or less the, what we have uh, had today in the sessions. And if uh, Dr. Londero wants to add anything else. No, nothing else. Thank you all. I hope that this has been useful and I would like to send you all a hug and we'll see one another someday, hopefully. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Ricardo Lloveras. I will be talking to you together with uh, 
Dr. Ricardo Perenera, Perdernera, with the, the Pro-Educar session, module three, for we're here with Ricardo Lluveras, who is an interventional cardiologist, and we are happy to be here with you. Thank you all. In this session, we're going to deal with topics in our daily practice, in our hemodynamics labs, and I also, to start this session, I'm going to welcome uh, Dr. Carlos Colet, uh, Director of the Hemodynamics uh, Director in Belgium. He's going to be talking to us about the coronary interventions in intermediate lesion and the million dollar question, if we should intervene or if we should treat. Take it away, Carlos. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to participate in this event with this uh, title of coronary intervention in intermediate lesions. We have the million dollar question, intervention or treatment. My name is Carlos Colet. I am an interventional cardiologist, co-director of the OLV ALST in Belgium. These are my conflicts of interest. <coughs> and to be able to talk about inter intermediate lesions, we need to refer to our specialty, the beginnings of our specialty. This is the first uh, paper of Andreas Grunzig, uh, showing uh, the percutaneous dilation of uh, an artery. And this is a publication from July 1979. And uh, what appeals, what goes to my attention in this publication is that uh, we have this figure that shows the use of the coronary physiology in the birth of our specialty to evaluate the results of percutaneous dilation, in this case for the pericardic arteries. And if we see the graph on the left of the sheet of the sheet, we see how before the intervention the pressure gradient uh, is really high, which goes down after the angiopolisty which is uh, considered in this case one of the criteria for success. And if we see on the right the a curve of pullback of uh, coronary pressure. So in, uh, before stenosis and the gradient of pressure due to stenosis shown here by this uh, pressure line that uh, decreases when the, the, the sensor distal from stenosis is placed. <coughs> uh, almost uh, the same time, class school uh, studies the, the behavior of the coronary flow reser, which is the, the, the division, the ratio of hyperemic flow and resting flow, and uh, does the correlation between the stenotic diameter in the coronary arteries. Uh, the, study, the case study was in animals, like it starts proving that when the artery the coronary artery in this case of the animals, but this was also uh, this was also true in humans, is reduced to 50%, uh, is where we start having a reduction of the maximum flow. And this is the reason why uh, today most of the treatment guides in Europe and in America use 50% uh, stenotic diameter uh, as a criteria to start treatment. But uh, in our group, uh, for seven or eight years, uh, we have started in researching this, looking at our own angiograms from our own patients, and compared with measurements of uh, coronary physiology <coughs> using the, the FFR or fractional flow reserve. So this is uh, the figure that we have in the right side of the, of the slide. We cannot identify a clear pattern of uh, correlation between the x-axis, which is the FFR, and the y-axis, which is the, the stenotic diameter. So, a patient with a 50% stenotic diameter has the same chance of having a regular, a normal or an abnormal uh, coronary flow. So this uh, starts defining a few terms, uh, like intermediate lesions, which are the subject of this talk. Nations over 80% are uh, not considered normal, 
additions under 30% are almost never ischemic and they should not be treated. But there is a large group of uh, lesions between 30 and 70% which uh, where we need to use uh, tools like measurements of coronary physiology to understand the benefit that uh, these patients could have. And here I would like to show you, you're probably familiar with this, uh, with this concept of fraction of flow resort. It's the difference between the, the pressure of the pressure obtained in the distal coronary artery and uh, the, divided by the aortal pressure and this uh, this is done during hyperemia this is uh, what we do what we get in the hemodynamics uh, lab and this is uh, here we have the curves for the FFR we see the, the aortic curve with the red uh, curve and the green one is the pressure of the, arc, uh, the aortic Russia? Uh, sorry, the coronary, uh, the distal coronary artery. And this is uh, the division between those these two things. Is the the result is the FFR. A flow of 0 0.61. We can see that we have a 39% less uh, coronary flow. And it's very important to keep this clear. Uh, is clear is that FFR does not mean ischemia. FFR is an index of the flow of the coronary epicardic flow and uh, this is uh, applied to the myocardium. <laughs> Ischemia is, uh, is different. Here we have something that we, are, uh, we have established here for this artery and we have that uh, we have a 30, we have the, this flow reduced to 33% of the norm, of normal value and in this case we have a 65% flow of what we should have in normal conditions. And it's true that the fractional flow result was validated uh, with the different uh, diagnostic uh, tests that we have tried. And this is uh, to understand the process that we have in coronary physiology. Um, this is the reason why we uh, decided to use a, a cutoff value for treatment or for deferral of 0 0.75 and or 0 0.8. This is based in this paper mainly that uh, the patient with uh, non-invasive negative negative uh, but, um, studies are all above 0.7, and the ones that are positive for is for ischemia are below 0.75. So this uh, study was also uh, proved in the deferred trial in patients who have FFR over 0.75, and they are not treated with uh, PCI. They have an excellent uh, <coughs> clinical evolution with patients who were ischemic uh, over 0.75 who received PCI. So we have, uh, there it is safe to defer the percutaneous treatment in, with patients with FFR below 0.75. Then uh, we have the, the trial FAME 1, the uh, decisions based on FFR are superior to uh, uh, PC, to PCI uh, to geography guided PCI with stable events, and the FAME two study shows that uh, if we have an FFR under 0.8, that uh, improves if they are treated. Uh, it's better than it's very if they are treated with PCI than if they are only treated with medical therapy. <coughs> for patients that have been uh, managed with uh, medical therapy, we've seen that if the FFR is over uh, 0.8, that means uh, they have uh, no events uh, after this moment. But if they are below 0.8, they start seeing more events. This was published uh, seven or eight years ago, and it showed that uh, the greater indication of uh, blood uh, conduction in the coronary artery, that means at the lower FFR values, we have a larger probability of having an adverse event in patients, not in non-treated patients. But then we have this study published last year that we cannot uh, fail to mention, which is the ischemia study, the ischemia trial, that shows that there's no difference in in using a conservative point of view, using medication or using the cath lab for for later treatment. And uh, you can see the images there. And ischemia needs to be assessed 
through using various factors. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not generalizable to all patients. Basically, eight to nine percent of patients that are referred to the cath lab are against the criteria of uh, this chemoly. So this is a this is something that is uh, the composite is uh, the composite endpoint is uh, not common for hemodynamics uh, for hemodynamics studies. There was a change in definition and Kurder root and then uh, uh, on average uh, we've seen that the par uh, participants in the ischemia trial they included one patient every four months in the study. This is why one of the this is one of the reasons why the study took so long. These are not daily patients. These are patients handpicked for uh, the trial. So this is why it took ten years to complete this trial. We have evaluated ischemia from another point of view. What we are showing here is uh, a slide that shows patient risk for uh, a myocardial infarction and this is so based on the data by ischemia. We believe that there's a risk of everything that is above this line, it favors a conservative treatment. There's an initial risk, uh, this is uh, based on the, the, the large number of periprocedural events because there is a larger risk in percutaneous uh, intervention. But let's see what happens afterwards. After this acute phase, the six months of the study, we see a reduction in the myocardial infarctions, the spontaneous myocardial infarctions, and the large ones, the ones that, the ones that we want to prevent. So, from the point of view of, the, of these data, this is the first time that we have uh, this kind of data showing how the angioplasty with uh, latest generation stents uh, reduces the prevalence of a myocardial infarction. So if you combine the data of FAME2 and ischemia that uh, were published last week, we can see that the reduction is uh, around 36% of myocardial infarctions when the patients are treated invasively compared to medical treatment. And one of the reasons why uh, we believe that the ischemia study is uh, neg negative is because of the hypothesis which is uh, below standards. And because uh, we believe that the, it says that reversible ischemia is associated with the adverse events that should be the, ob the objective of the treatment. This hypothesis needs to be reviewed. And this is because uh, we may have been barking at the wrong tree. We believe that uh, the ischemia is the, the villain in these uh, events because we've seen that all of these events have ischemia, but we have uh, ignored that the events mean that we have, uh, we have a vulnerable plague, that it might be vulnerable because of different factors, but we are wasting all of our efforts in non-invasive treatments, in diagnosing ischemia, and I think that the problem is not in ischemia, it's in the plague. So it's possible that we're looking at ischemia as, as the smoke that comes out of the exhaust pipe of a car. Because uh, ischemia makes us think that uh, the, the smoke is so bad, but the problem is the engine. Uh, so the problem is not in the muscle, the problem is in the, uh, in the pericardial artery. So this is the problem that we have in the pericardial artery. The gradients, the transpressure gradients are high. And this is uh, when we start seeing uh, plague uh, stress, plague exhaustion. So this is related to wall shear stress. Uh, so when we start having physical forces, hemodynamic forces, we see the resistance of the material, the plague breaks, and this causes myocardial infarction. So we're going to go in further into uh, coronary, uh, diffuse coronary disease, and we can see how these subtypes can help us uh, manage the different types of uh, problems. When I'm talking about diffuse coronary disease, I'm talking about the... It makes us think about the differentiation between focal and diffuse uh, coronary disease. So, we've seen that we're seeing that we need an expansion now of the use of FFR for uh, 
uh, the evaluation of moderate lesions from that and now it's bec it's being used for uh, to discern if the if we have a focal or a diffuse uh, coronary disease and to uh, realize which is the way to go with the treatment this is the latest thing that we had in uh, coronary phy physiology the latest that we have this is a case of the right coronary with an apparently focal stenosis and if we do a pull uh, pullback we can see the, the screen of Coroventis which is the newest technique the, distributed by Abbott and what we see here the yellow line is only the FFR and the, the value is 0 0.71 and we're going to pull the guide and we see that when we uh, cross this uh, anatomical stenosis we, we get a, a pressure start that is indicated by these red bars and when we put the stent at 3.5 by 26 millimeter and I can show you the same pullback curve uh, with the right uh, distal right coronary and the proximal right coronary and we can see how the issue is completely solved but let me show you the other end of this disease this is what we call the diffuse, diffuse disease and I wanted to focus on the descending uh, interior descending artery and you can see that uh, the resolution that is 60% uh, probably intermediate between the medium, seg medium, medium segment and the coronary artery but when we do a pullback maneuver here let's see what we find there is not a single segment where the pressure where the loss of pressure is uh, localized on the contrary we have a diffuse uh, pressure loss throughout the artery and it may be identified by using one of the newest coronary indexes that uh, identify the, the coronary the focal or diffuse coronary like PPG so in this case we decided to input to put to implant a stent uh, it gave us a perfect result but when we put the, the pressure guide in again and we do a pullback again we see that we have not improved in this case the hemodynamic conduction and the FFR we see that it's 0.69 again so we have understood that there's an interaction between the type of disease the focal or diffuse and the uh, stenting for the results in functional revascularization so in, in the focal case uh, we see that the stent solves the problem, but in the fuse it has barely any effect in the conduction of blood. So this is the way that the screen looks like, and uh, we've uh, showed this uh, by a group in the College of Cardiology, and uh, we have uh, shown the, the, the virtues of PPG. PPG is, uh, should be 0 0.30 if it's close to serious diffuse, if it is uh, close to 1, it's focal. So let me show you what happens when we do uh, plasties in uh, focal and diffuse lesions. Diffuse is on the PPG low numbers, is diffuse and focal is higher numbers. The more focal is the injury, the lesion, sorry, is the, the better is the result. The more diffuse, basically there's uh, no functional gain. So there's no improvement in perfusion and uh, the conduction of that artery. So as a conclusion, we have that the myocardial revascularization guided by phys coronary physiology has uh, proven to have clinical benefits. In FAME2 and FAME2, FAME2 and FAME1, we've seen this, and you've seen a reduction of the death and myocardial infarction compared with uh, revascularization guided by angiography and, uh, or with the medical treatment in FAME1 and FAME2. And the evaluation of pressure gradients, uh, translational uh, pressure gradients, are part, uh, essential part of the coronary <coughs> physiology measurement, and they must be done on all patients that are going to be subjected to uh, coronary angioplasty. They need to be evaluated with using a pullback, independently of the angiographic uh, obstruction. And that the decision of the revascularization of intermediate lesions needs to be uh, supported by coronary physiology using the pullback maneuver. And in this case, uh, we are helping the patients 
patient to uh, get rid of a pericardic uh, ischemia. So, but we still need to consider each patient as an individual and we need to consider the risks uh, for each, uh, for the anatomy. So, and that will be all. Thank you for the intervention. Thank you very much, Carlos, for your presentation. It was very interesting. I will leave the questions for the end. Maybe we can mo go on with the conversations. The, let's remember that you can make questions from the audience and then we uh, give them to the speakers. Now we'll go to Dr. Pedro Veraldo de Andrade, who will talk about coronary intervention in patients with stable angina. When and why? Inicialmente, eu gostaria de agradecer a, a comissão organizador do Proeducar por esse convite em estar participando dessa importante sessão. Coube a mim abordar o tema intervenção coronária percutânea em pacientes com doença coronária crônica estável, quando, para quem, tenho conflitos de interesse relacionado a esta apresentação. Eu gostaria de começar é, contando por um lado importante que nossa prática clínica atual ela é regida, boa parte, por é, informações advindas de estudos antigos, alguns deles com mais de 30 anos, comparativos entre a cirurgia cardíaca e o tratamento clínico. E esses estudos, de uma forma uniforme, eles nos mostravam que quanto mais grave o paciente, maior era o benefício é, obtido a partir de estratégias de revascularização. Então, notadamente, os pacientes com doença multiarterial e disfunção ventricular esquerda, pacientes de tronco de coronária esquerda ou multiarteriais com angina de grau severo, eles, é, particularmente, eles é, tinham um benefício em termos de redução de mortalidade quando era instituída uma estratégia de revascularização, sendo a época a estratégia cirúrgica. É, com o avançar da intervenção coronária e também com o avançar da terapêutica clínica ótima, né, do tratamento médico otimizado, era natural que surgissem estudos comparativos entre a intervenção coronária percutânea e esse tratamento clínico ótimo. Então, nós temos eu diria três estudos importantes nesse contexto, que avaliavam diferente desses estudos cirúrgicos, onde a complexidade dos pacientes era grande, é, agora avaliando uma população de pacientes angiograficamente selecionados, ou seja, esses estudos, você tinha um conhecimento prévio da, da anatomia do paciente, os pacientes tinham a manifestação estável da doença coronária e fração, fração de gestão ventricular esquerda preservada. Talvez um dos estudos mais emblemáticos do CORD, ele avaliou aproximadamente 2.260 pacientes é, tratados com intervenção coronária percutânea ou uma terapêutica clínica otimizada. Esse estudo foram publicados já, os, os desfechos já de um acompanhamento é, tardio, de até 15 anos, e ele não mostrou uma diferença em termos de desfechos clínicos adversos graves, como morte, infarto, instituindo-se ou não a terapêutica de revascularização percutânea. Ou seja, a terapêutica clínica otimizada, ela se mostrava uma boa estratégia inicial no tratamento de pacientes. O estudo CORAD, ele tem algumas informações, é, houve um benefício é, significativo inicial da intervenção coronária percutânea na redução do grau de angina e também no grau de isquemia. A intervenção era mais eficaz que o tratamento clínico e reduzir a carga isquêmica. E um subestudo posterior chamado CORAD nuclear, mostrou que quanto maior a capacidade de redução de isquemia, melhores eram os desfechos do paciente, gerando aí uma hipótese, então, de um perfil de paciente que eventualmente poderia se beneficiar da estratégia percutânea. Um estudo de tamanho semelhante, o estudo BAE 2D, aqui avaliando esse pacientes com doença coronária crônica, mas portadores de diabetes mellitus. Esse estudo, então, os pacientes foram randomizados para a estratégia de revascularização, seja percutânea ou cirúrgica, versus um tratamento clínico. E também, conforme o estudo CORAD, no estudo BARI 2D, os desfechos gerais do estudo não houve diferença entre a estratégia de tratamento clínico inicial, os desfechos foram similares entre os grupos. Agora, analisando especificamente o extrato de pacientes que realizaram intervenção e o extrato de pacientes que realizaram é, cirurgia de revascularização miocárdica, a gente observa que ao passo que não houve benefício da revascularização nos pacientes tratados percutaneamente, 
esse benefício foi observado nos pacientes tratados cirurgicamente, ou seja, pacientes com anatomia mais complexa, eventualmente se beneficiaram da revascularização miocárdica cirúrgica, sobretudo através de uma redução do número de infartos espontâneos. E um outro estudo importante, embora menor, um estudo com 888 pacientes, o estudo FEM2, esses pacientes com doença crônica, é, também com angiografia já prévia à inclusão do paciente, eles eram randomizados para estratégia clínica otimizada ou para intervenção coronária percutânea, mediante um achado de uma reserva de fluxo fracionada isquêmica, ou seja, abaixo de 0,8. Os pacientes que tinham reserva de fluxo normal, acima de 0,8, eles eram observados através de um registro. E esse estudo, diferentemente dos demais, ele mostrou um benefício da revascularização percutânea em pacientes com reserva de fluxo fracionada alterada, em termos de redução de eventos adversos, notadamente pela redução de necessidade de revascularização de urgência. Então, foi um estudo que mostrou que os pacientes submetidos à intervenção coronária percutânea apresentavam menor necessidade de revascularização de urgência. Num acompanhamento mais tardio desse estudo, com cinco anos, também foi observado uma redução na taxa de infartos espontâneos, favorecendo o grupo submetido à revascularização percutânea. Então, baseado nesses achados, nós temos hoje as recomendações atuais das revisões é, contemporâneas das diretrizes. Citaria a última diretriz europeia de 2019 do diagnóstico e manejo da doença coronária crônica. Então, a gente observa aqui aquelas informações iniciais provenientes dos estudos em pacientes submetidos à cirurgia de um perfil de risco maior, como portadores de lesão de tronco, é, doenças é, envolvendo o vasos multiarteriais com disfunção ventricular esquerda, artéria derradeira, né, uma, um único vaso patente com lesão grave e essa informação do portador de uma área isquêmica importante, acima de 10%, baseada num registro que mostrava que pacientes com área isquêmica acima de 10% do ventrículo esquerdo submetidos à revascularização, eles tinham um benefício em termos de redução de eventos adversos graves, ou uma reserva de fluxo fracionada ah, alterada. Então, isso é o que a diretriz nos mostra em termos de intervenção percutânea, de revascularização, em termos prognósticos para os pacientes portadores de doença coronária crônica, e em termos de sintomatologia, baseado nos achados dos estudos que, que acabamos de comentar, todo paciente portador de uma doença coronária grave, importante, e que esteja apresentando angina limitante, um equivalente anginoso, ou com qualidade de vida ruim, ele pode ser submetido à intervenção coronária percutânea porque ela vai oferecer uma resposta mais adequada quando o tratamento clínico otimizado não é suficiente. Mas nesse contexto surge agora um estudo mais importante, mais é, significativo em termos de, de condução, da maneira como ele foi concebido, porque ele tenta minimizar as principais falhas dos estudos que o antecederam. É o estudo isquímia, então, foi um estudo que avaliou pacientes com doença estável, mas, obrigatoriamente, esses pacientes eram triados a partir da presença de uma isquemia moderada a severa. Boa parte desses pacientes, no caso, 73% especificamente, realizaram uma angiotomografia coronária, que era cega para o investigador. Qual era a finalidade dessa angiotomografia? Descartar pacientes portadores de lesão de tronco de coronária esquerda ou aqueles que não eram portadores de doença aterosclerótica coronária os pacientes que não precisavam realizar a tomografia eram aqueles portadores de algum grau de disfunção renal ou que já tinham uma anatomia coronariana prévia conhecida. Então, a partir da presença de isquemia moderada grave, realização da tomografia, esses pacientes eram randomizados para uma estratégia invasiva que consistia no tratamento clínico otimizado somado à realização do, do cateterismo e, eventualmente, de uma revascularização ótima. E aqui, ótima, eu digo com 100% de uso de estentes farmacológicos, um uso liberal de, de avaliação funcional invasiva da lesão, no caso de dúvida em relação aos achados da isquemia e a topografia das lesões. Então, um grupo que realmente representa um estado da arte atual no manejo da doença coronária crônica na sua, de forma invasiva. Enquanto que o outro braço permanecia em tratamento conservador, sendo o cateterismo e revascularização reservados a esses pacientes em caso de persistência de angina, angina limitante, falha de terapêutica. O 
ele inicialmente ele foi concebido para incluir 8 mil pacientes, mas por dificuldades de randomização ou uma taxa de eventos menor do que o, do que o esperado no, na, na sua concepção, esse, esse número foi reduzido para 5.179 pacientes. Tá? Esses pacientes, então, distribuídos de forma equânima num grupo invasivo ou num grupo conservador. Vale a pena mencionar aqui os principais critérios de exclusão, ou seja, não são aplicáveis a, os dados do estudo, os resultados do estudo de esquema, não são aplicáveis a pacientes com insuficiência cardíaca, classe funcional 3 e 4, angina limitante, disfunção ventricular esquerda, com fração de gestão abaixo de 35, um episódio recente de uma síndrome coronária aguda, nos últimos dois meses, ou um histórico recente, no último ano, de algum tipo de revascularização seja percutâneo ou cirúrgico. Pacientes com disfunção renal foram incluídos em um outro estudo, é, o Ischemia é, é, Chronic Heart Failure. Ah, o, os pacientes foram acompanhados por um período de médio de 3,2 anos. Tá? Quase a totalidade dos pacientes, eles cumpriram esse tempo de, de observação. E qual foi o eixo primário do estudo Ischemia? A avaliação de morte cardiovascular, infarto, hospitalização por angina instável, hospitalização por insuficiência cardíaca ou hospitalização em pacientes é, recuperados de, de morte súbita. Tá? O, inicialmente, o desfecho previsto era a ocorrência de morte e infarto, mas isso foi ampliado em função dessa baixa taxa de randomização. Não observamos diferença na, entre os grupos. Tá? Uma, um dado que chama atenção no esquema no início, houve uma maior proporção de infartos periprocedimento no grupo submetido à angioplastia. Em contrapartida, no seu segmento, infartos espontâneos foram mais frequentes no grupo mantido em tratamento clínico otimizado. E quando a gente avalia o impacto prognóstico dos tipos de infarto no estudo de isquímia, a gente observa que enquanto o infarto periprocedimento não teve associado a uma maior taxa de eventos, os infartos espontâneos, estes sim, determinaram o um maior risco do paciente apresentar morte cardiovascular ou, ou, ou na sua evolução. Uma meta-análise recente, englobando todos os estudos, está de acordo com esses achados né, do impacto do infarto espontâneo na ocorrência de mortalidade cardiovascular nos pacientes. Então, a gente observa que, que a mortalidade cardiovascular, infartos espontâneos, numa meta-análise, incluindo 25 estudos randomizados, quase 20 mil pacientes, em follow-up médio de 5,7 anos, mostra um benefício da revascularização em comparação ao tratamento clínico. Embora essa meta-análise possa ter alguma crítica em relação ao fato de incluir estudos mais antigos, onde o tratamento clínico definitivamente não era um tratamento otimizado. Então, o impacto do estudo isquímia nas, na, nas diretrizes atuais pode recair sobre essa recomendação do tratamento de é, lesões com área isquêmica acima de 10%, FFR alterado em termos prognósticos. E eu finalizaria com, o seguinte, com a proposta do seguinte fluxograma. Então, hoje, baseado no conhecimento vigente, onde aplicar a revascularização em pacientes com doença estável? Se o paciente tem angina é, infrequente, aceitável, a, a, a qualidade de vida do paciente ela é aceitável para ele, você deve excluir a presença de doença de tronco de coronária esquerda, excluir pacientes com disfunção ventricular, que estejam com insuficiência cardíaca, classe 3 ou 4, episódios recentes de síndrome coronária aguda ou revascularização recente, identificação de doença não obstrutiva. Excluídos esses aspectos, se o paciente, ele, em, com uso de terapêutica medicamentosa, ele tem uma qualidade de vida aceitável, ok, possamos continuar com o manejo clínico desse paciente. Agora, nos pacientes que estão com angina limitante, é, qualidade de vida ruim, ou na presença de doença de tronco, coronariopatia multiarterial, disfunção ventricular, a estratégia invasiva com angiografia coronária e revascularização, deve ser a estratégia recomendada. O impacto do infarto espontâneo na evolução desses pacientes, ela vai ser uma informação importante que nós vamos ter a partir do acompanhamento de 10 anos previsto do estudo isquímico. Essa era a informação que eu gostaria de passar. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, Pedro. Your presentation was very didactic and very clear. Now we're going to continue with the next conversation. I would like to say to the audience that you can ask the questions and make comments to the panelists, and then we're going to share them 
at the end of the session. In this next talk, Dr. Alejandro Goldsmith of Argentina will be talking about interventions in diabetic patients with multi-vessel disease and the evidence for a better intervention. First of all, I would like to thank for the invitation. Now, to see this topic, we should ask ourselves, which are the most uh, sad and challenging clinical situations in patients with diabetic and uh, multiple vessels disease? What to do, when to do it, why? In my opinion as a cardiologist, this question has only one answer. So far, we're, we will be talking about bypass surgery. But this answer, we know that has over 20 years, and we want to know that if in 2021, they will have the same answer, that which new tools do we have to see, to in a way, uh, answer in a better, in a better way. When we analyze the historical data, let's remember that in 2007, the body is uh, published with a follow-up of 10 years. There was no significant benefit or greater benefit in infarction or uh, deaths. But only one balloon was used in angioplasties. Then we go to the arts with a follow-up of five years, where we know that there was no significant dif significant difference in death while placing stent or doing surgery due to multivessel disease. And the incidence of strokes or myocardial infarction, we know that was not very significantly different from the two groups. With a different number and there was a need to repeat the revascularization, but we know which stent was used in the study? Yes, metallic stents. Nowadays, some of you would use a bare metal stent in diabetic patients and with multivessel disease, you know you wouldn't. So let's go to syntax. Some years ago in Lancet, the follow-up af uh, after 10 years was published and we see, we seen We've seen that there was no differences in the deaths due to death of all costs between those using angioplasty and paclitaxel stent. And we used first generation stents compared to surgery, but surgery provided a survival benefit that was significant in patients with uh, disease in three vessels. So as a summary, we got to the Freedom uh, uh, Trial of 2012 and the surgery was over angioplasty in the sense that it reduced significantly the number of deaths and um, in myocardial infarction with a low uh, degree of strokes at 3.8 years. But in the extended analysis, after seven and a half years, mortality did not show a real benefit for surgery. Here we can say that something changed and stents were used and nowadays we do not use that kind of stent. So history is dooming or uh, most us to continue to do research but having a very interesting bag. In 2020 this interesting meta-analysis was published with over 4,500 patients that went to the angioplasty group and 9,700 to surgery and the maize values at the long term favor in death and infarction and reintervention for surgeries and there was no significant difference with angioplasty but we should analyze certain topics that are not written or maybe they are written in a very small print first of all revascularization that is incomplete of patients with angioplasty that were diabetic patients makes the incidence of reintervention to be uh, bigger. It shouldn't be seen as a complication because I'm sure none of you would do an angioplasty to a lesion that does not show ischemia and you can choose the method you want. A different point, a B1. The occluded bridges are not reintervened as difference to the restenosis. And 
point C, this registry started in 2008. And at that time, we did not have the third generation stents. Point D, as reference with the selection of whether a patient was a better candidate for surgery or angioplasty. And we do not know how they decided on which patient should go to which group. So the authors conclude that the surgery should be considered in diabetic patients with multi-vessel uh, disease, but whenever they are good candidates for surgery. And this poses a question of defining what is a good candidate for surgery. On the other hand, if we analyze the emblematic studies such as courage or ischemia trial, the medical treatment that is optimal is also an excellent choice. And they say that they did not found evidence of one, uh, an initial uh, invasive strategy as compared to a conservative initial strategy reduced the number of ischemic strokes or deaths, all cause death in a median of 3.2 years. But you know that ischemia deserves a further analysis and exceeds the purpose of this presentation and due to time constraints as well. The, the picture is not very clear for us interventional cardiologists, but we need to understand that science, the concomitant treatment and the new devices are changing history. When we uh, move forward in time, it is clear that the new technology, both for stents and for the current drugs, mark a very clear concept. And this also creates a favorable evolution where new generation stents have clinical and, and geographical results that are better than the predecessors. They also create lower TDF or an infarction of a thrombosis stent. So we can conclude that the strategies of before should not be correlated or compared to the ones that we have now. In the Diabetes and Vascular Disease Research of 2021, this study was published. It is very interesting. And we can see the angioplasty is not only implanting a stent. It should be the result of the sequence programmed of different parameters and strategies. We understand that the, we, the, one of the complications of angioplasia is uh, restenosis and the lack of uh, patient compliance complying with the treatment. This was demystified in the previous slide. We know that second generation stents and even more the third generation ones have improved significantly these two parameters. Recently, Taglieri and El and colleagues published a meta-analysis evaluating the better stents in the market but with different intrinsic characteristics. It took 99,000 patients in 70 um, trials and TLF at one year they all had an adequate behavior as regards the TLF, a low stent thrombosis, and in studies it was not evaluated the average time of hospital stay, nor the uh, laborable, uh, the going back to work, for example. There, this was, were not the objectives of the trial, but we needed to understand and try to compare the different stents of the last generation, the third generation, with surgery. Incorporation of three gen uh, third generation stents have shown to have better results in cardioembolic and cardiovascular events as respect uh, as compared to um, surgery in diabetic patients. We know that Euroscore and Syntax also guide the decision making process. Euroscore 1 and 2 predict mortality after the cardiac surgery, but these scores are not validated properly in the diabetic population. The syntax score estimates the severity and complexity of coronary disease. We know that the larger, the bigger the syntax, we have more benefits in the uh, surgery over the angioplasty. But let's remember that syntax is validated on taxus. Uh, um, an older generation stent and it is not proper to have this method to predict in patients with diabetes so it is not a tool 
a proper tool or ideal tool to guide a strategy in diabetic patients with multivessel disease. Syntax 2 of 2020 allows to predict death at 20 years and maze at 5 years. And it may help identify people who benefit from, uh, from surgery or angioplasty supporting the uh, health professionals, the patients and the families to, to have better strategies for the best option for revascularization. So in this uh, slide we uh, summarize the experience in this group of patients. This is very difficult and we're going more towards the surgical option in some studies, but not all the parameters not only all the parameters have been studied, we need to take into account other considerations and we learned a lot. When we evaluate three of the first, for, uh, best tens of the market, the mortality rate is around 1.2 and 2.3% and TBF is not over 4.9% with values of, uh, that were higher as we saw before in the freedom state from 10 to 25%. If we compare patients with the real world study published this year with diabetic patients and multivessel disease that undergo an angioplasty or a surgery versus as well, which would be the better treatment, the best treatment, we can see that in the follow-up after 10 years, mortality was significantly lower in the angioplasty group. The maze risk with the interventionist method was better than with the medical treatment only or the optimal medical treatment to say it in a different way but surgery had less risk than uh, angioplasty and surgery have uh, lower stroke rates and we when we sub analyzed the surgery and angioplasty according to syntax we could not find differences as regards mortality the why is being analyzed because it is multifact multifactorial but the arsenal of the interventional cardiology we can find new stents with new designs that are more adapted for example of open struts the biocompatible polymeters the struts that are uh, uh, thin or ultra thin and we optimize the time and the quality of endothelization and this is crucial because diabetic people we know that this phase of endothelialization is altered. So another aspect is revascularization, complete one in the surgery versus that guided by the obstruction seen in the angioplasty. So surgery has lower infarction rates, but uh, more strokes. We analyzed uh, patients that were stable, uh, but the unstable ones, what happens with them? Can we have some conclusions? Let's remember that the European guides of STEMI recommend the revascularization of the artery not related to the infarction with significant lesion with multiple vessel disease before discharge, and this will be class 2A. On the meta analysis, bigger. The biggest analysis so far are revascularization strategy with angioplasty plus the treatment of the non-culprit lesion was associated with a reduction in the cardiovascular mortality as compared with an angioplasty with treatment of, of the culprit lesion only in patients with STEMI and multiple vessel disease. In this study, we saw a reduction of 38% in mortal, um, cardiovascular mortality. This reduction in cardiovascular mortality is consistent with a strong reduction of a new infarction with the revascularis complete revascularization. So, complete revascularization versus the uh, lesion of the vessel reduces the mortality and infarction in patients with multiple vessel disease. Something similar happens with surgeries as we have seen so far. Let's remember that in this case, talk, when talking with a patient, they have a STEMI, for example. Another interesting point is determining what would be a, reva a complete revascularization and what is the method that we should use to decide whether we have to re 
vascularize all the lesions or all the vessels of the patient. It is clear that this situation in patients with SEMI, the complete circulation in one of two times is the correct one. And analyzing this study, the flower MI, the study of the FFR, it does, did not provide a, a benefit in terms of risk of death, infarction or revascularization, urgent revascularization at one year. 5.5% of patients guided with uh, FFR died or had an infarction or a reintervention. But when we compare them with the 4.2 of those in which angiography was in a way the strategy to decide on the revascularization, we can observe that, that there was no uh, a, a big difference between these two values. The study is not over yet and we will have to wait until next year to have the results, the final results with the follow-up in the long term. In, as a conclusion, we can say that the history is being written as we speak. Surgery continues to have a main uh, a main solution for diabetic patients and revas uh, early revascularization is equaling the results of death and maze. Teamwork, we need to have a real hard team. This is key to, s to properly select every patient taking into account not only if the patient is diabetic and the type of lesion they have, but also the other aspects involving the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for your presentation. We're going to have the opportunity to talk uh, with uh, all the presenters. Now we'll move to the next presenter, Dr. Christian Dauvergne from Chile. He's uh, from the clinic in Santiago in the University of Chile. And he's going to introduce to us acute coronary syndrome with ST segment elevation, multivessel disease. Uh, the Complete revascularization is appropriate. <coughs> Good morning. The acute coronary syndrome, syndrome with uh, ST supra, with STEMI and multi artery disease is a complete revascularization. Yeah, appropriate. I have no conflicts of interest for this talk. This the, this, the descent of uh, cardiovascular death has uh, decreased significantly in relation with the technology and uh, the appearance of new treatments. The acute myocardial infarction is one of the prevalent uh, causes of death at the worldwide level. And uh, having a patient with a STEMI, the acute coronary syndrome, this uh, represents 50% of the cases with a multi-vessel disease. And having a patient with, a, with an infarction, with a multi-vessel disease, it's a pro worse prognosis because they have a diffuse arteriosclerosis, unstable or vulnerable plaque, a larger ischemic load, and an alteration of the contractility of the non-affected areas. Here we have eight studies which include phenolysis and primary angioplasty. You can see that the curve is over two times the for patients that don't have uh, IRA disease, who don't have non-IRA disease. Or, so we need to see which should be the strategy to manage this kind of patients, just to treat the, the uh, target vessel or and going just to the, the culprit and going to treatment of uh, the PCA of symptoms or, or if we should go to a complete full revascularization. So we need to know first if the full revascularization is uh, beneficial. And we see several uh, trials. PRAMI, PRAMI is a small, a small trial, trial, 130 patients per arm on the one side we have the uh, full revascularization and the other one the, the revascularization of the culprit vessel. So we have a 9% of uh, death, a non-fatal uh, infarction, then we have a non-fatal myocardial infarction and refractory angina. Those are the numbers as we see in the screen. 
as compared to 23% in the ones that we... 53% where we had uh, only the corporate uh, vessel. But this was a small study, small trial, and the differences are basically in the sum of all of the components in the primary component. <coughs> so, and all of this is uh, based on the need for repeat revascularization. Uh, CVL uh, trial is, was the same. At the beginning, it was a small study where we can see that it was beneficial, uh, both uh, after a month and long term. And it uh, was considered in the sum of all of the components. So, Narami study that we have, Narami 3 Primalti, is a trial where we have a base, it tries to analyze the same things the culprit base versus the vessel versus the default revascularization and here we have a relatively less for the patients with complete revascularization but also based on the the conjunction of all the factors, the mortality for all causes, or the non fatal reinfarction had no significant differences. In this same study, the same trial, the dynamic 3 primalti, the effect of, uh, we can see the effect that there were no differences between groups in the final emphasize in the myocardial salvage in the left ventricular function and in the remodeling of the left ventricle. That means the, it wasn't categorical by showing results, uh, when showing results. But uh, so far we have analyzed very exclusively the revascularization compared with, with uh, an angiographic evaluation. Compare acute is uh, randomized to to one ratio, uh, revascularization, full revascularization guided by FFR. And this is a small study with full revascularization, 285 patients, uh, 590 for only the culprit vessel. And still, we have a difference there in MACE in favor of uh, full revascularization. Then we have the complete trial, which is a much larger trial, which have the same thought. We compare the full revascularization versus the, the culprit vessel. This study, this important study, uh, we can see that uh, the primary goal and the second uh, secondary second co-primary objective, we were able to see that there was a diminution, the decrease in cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction, or a need for revascularization also due to ischemia, uh, and. Uh, this shows the effectiveness of the treatment of the entirety of the vessels in patients with, uh, with STEMI. What we just saw, well, this was a coronary related. And what we've seen uh, is that in the benefits were sustained after five years. It was a uh, uh, also a significant benefit in terms of deaths and infarction. So the, re the complete revascularization is beneficial because it, it uh, reduces the car heart cardiovascular death, the new infarctions or the need for new revascularization. So we have all the information of the MACE and we have cases of death uh, 
in a, but we need a large randomized uh, study. But we need we see that uh, this uh, this happens. This is repeatable anyway. So we see that the, the European guidelines say that uh, the these lesions should be considered for patients who had a... So we need to consider the full revascularization. So which are the answers that are pending here? Uh, we analyzed complex lesions. We, like, uh, chronic, uh, chronic total occlusions uh, in the left main. So how do we evaluate the stenosis of the non-culprit vessels? And when is the right moment to complete revascularization? You know that the presence of uh, chronic lesions in patients with uh, ESCT, uh, with STEMI, uh, basically we have patients that uh, were subjected to, to one of the few trials here with 130, 140 patients per arm. And, uh, with uh, doing uh, the full revascularization versus not doing it. And we didn't see uh, any, many differences based, uh, based on the ejection fraction and the diastolic volume of the, in the left ventricular end. So we did not see any improvement there. In, but we see that it, when the anterior descending artery was, uh, then we show that in this case we saw that there was a benefit. We could get if uh, we think it maybe we could get a higher benefit there with uh, full revascularization. And we don't have uh, many things written about. Uh, on, in terms of infarction. Now, how to evaluate the non culprit stenosis? Compare acute trial, assess the need of revascularizing the non culprit vessel, get it by FFR, in 0.8% of patients with stenosis in the complete trial, they, when they had a 50 to 69% of stenosis uh, geographically evaluated. Then the decision of revascularizing required an FFR over 0.8%. So, is the functional evaluation a useful tool for decision making? Well, all of this is this is based in what we have in the information that we have in for the stable patients. And the idea is to improve results if we follow the the functional evaluation. So. Two months ago, we published the FLOWER IM trial that showed that the revascularization guided by uh, physiology, in this case the FFR, did not uh, provide any benefits. So, geographically, FFR was uh, exactly the same. But what? why does this happen? Well, so in the reduced MBI sub-study, where they uh, assessed the flow, the coronary flow, during the acute phase and 30 days after. And what did they see? So if you check here, in the letter in the E graph, and um, we can see that it was uh, greater in the acute phase and it changed very significantly if we uh, evaluated it at 30 day days. You remember the components of the functional evaluation, the aorta, and uh, what happened in relation to the answer uh, the hyperemic pressure. If you check the aortic uh, pressure, the presternatic pressure, it did not change as much as uh, with the follow-up. But the distal pressure, we had an increase of flow 
uh, in comparison to the 30 days after the, the event. So we can conclude that there is a change in the circulation that does not favor the functional, the inappropriate functional evaluation in the acute moment of the infarction. This is due to the fact that we have several mediators that we can, for vasoconstriction. There's a blockage also in the adenosine factors and an increase in the, the diastolic pressure that uh, causes microvascular compression, which uh, is as an answer to hyperemia. So you can conclude that the functional evaluation in the moment uh, using FFR is different with IFR, but that's not uh, the point of this presentation. We should consider it as uh, appropriate to assess these types of stenosis. What happens with the intravascular imaging? There aren't many studies about this in, regard, in relation with infarctions. This is uh, the prospect study for diabetic patients with STEMI. And we've seen that the presence of, of cut was a bad prognosis for the diabetic patients. So the possibility of having a maze at three years uh, was... And in diabetes, uh, this this was not a good mix. So this this is uh, interesting, yes, but this is only for prognosis value. We don't make decisions using this. Probably we we need to uh, use different uh, tools to assess non-culprit lesions. So angiography is the way to define the need to revascular revascularize the non-culprit vessel, especially in stenosis over seventy percent. And there is, but there is not a clear definition for a least, less severe stenosis. When is the appropriate moment for full revascularization? That's an answer that uh, we don't have it yet. We know that in the complete trial we had a full revascularization until 45 days after randomization. So, we don't ha do not have a clear answer about the exact moment, and probably, or the hospitalization. We saw in, at the beginning about the mortality and the morbidity, and we are starting from a mortality of 30 per over 30%, and we now have less than 5%. So, basically, it has... Uh, a great improvement in our specialty. So to sum up, the full revascularization in infarction with the STEMI with decreases cardiovascular mortality, the new infarctions or revascularizations. There are no, there's no evidence with complex lesions like CTO or the left uh, main. And the assessment of the severity of the stenosis uh, nowadays is still angiographical for acute patients. So I would like to thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Christian. It was a very good example. Your explanation was very clear. During these presentations, we had amazing tools and different scenarios for our patients. Now we are going to the last presentation of the session in charge of Dr. Gerardo Zapata from the Uni, from uh, Hospital of Rosario, president of the uh, Cardiology Society of Argentina. It is a great honor having you here today. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this project Gar Solasi for Fellows in the in this edition. I'm going to talk about ideal anti blood level therapy after coronary interventions. When and for how long? This is a very interesting thing because it is constantly being updated. There has been a lot of groups in the world working to know where to prove which is the ideal strategy. 
to do that, we also have to assess on the one side the ischemic risk of our patients. We can do it through some clinical variables or mathematical um, um, elements such as cords to determine the number of maze or thrombosis of the sense in our patients. In, and on the other hand, we have to control that with the bleeding risk. But we also have to take into account the aspects such as pathological uh, history, the clinical presentation, the coronary anatomy, and the type of intervention or stent that we will use. To have this balance with the uh, risk of ischemia and of bleeding is the idea, there we have the idea of uh, zone for our patients. I'm going to try to answer these two questions, which is the ideal strategy and for how long, with these seven uh, statements. First of all, aspirin for all the patients except contraindications. In acute coronary syndromes, plasugrel and ricaclor uh, are better than chlor clopidogrel gel in diminution of maize, but allow more bleeding. In patients with SCC, preferable clopidogrel. In acute patients, it's ra uh, we rather not administer pre-treatment. It is possible to do a de-escalation of the dose. Then six, the duration of the treatment of the DAPT strategy will depend on the ischemic risk and bleeding risk of each patient after discharge. And after that, new alternatives such as monotherapy without aspirin are possible. We can end the top the talk here, but I will try to in the next ten minutes to check these statements with the evidence that we are having. First of all, aspirin for all the patients except contraindications, always with low doses. We know for a long time, over a decade, that if we use in acute coronary syndrome the antiplatelet therapy that, that are most potent, such as tricagleror or plasurgrel, we will have a better clinical benefit in terms of reducing the endpoint ischemic, such as uh, stroke uh, with new strategies, and they. Uh, must be uh, uh, given for one year. We will have an additional cost in the case of Blasugrel, an excess of bleeding of 30%, and with Tricagelor in the coronary intervention, bleeding was not statistically significant. So, Clopidogrel in this group of patients is always an intervention we need to leave in the second place but we can say that if we apply the current strategy that was assessed in the OASIS 7 trial double load of clopidogrel followed by 150 milligrams during the first week to continue with the standard strategy this showed safe levels, not increasing the bleeding risk, being deficient, decreasing the ischemia, mainly in the thrombosis of the stent, which is reduced in a 30%. As regards the cor chronic uh, coronary syndromes, clopidogrel is preferable in this scenario. This has been proven for a lot of years in the CREDO trial. They evaluated clopidogrel plus aspirin over aspirin alone, and this showed a lot of safety. And this was for six months and extended, depending on the risk of the patient, to 12 months. We will leave a special place for situations, specific situations, for P2Y12 in patients with uh, multi-vessel disease or uh, need for retreatment of the left main, patients with me diabetes mellitus, or when the implant of the stent does not have the, the perfect outcomes. If the patient has a low risk of bleeding, as regards the acute coronary syndrome, it, we rather not 
uh, give pretreatment. This is very interesting. This was evaluated a couple of years ago in the ACOS trial, where we evaluated pretreatment with prasuglet, so load before the coronariography, or waiting to do the load once we. Uh, we had determined the need to intervene or not. Patients with pretreatment had more bleeding, they had a double risk of bleeding, and as you can see, if we do not do the pretreatment, we do not lose safety. So the ischemic events were the same during pretreatment or without pretreatment. In this uh, same area, ISAR REACT 5 trial was published and the study has a lot of criticism due to the design mainly. They compare two strategies. For me, it is not a uh, good indicator here. Tricagelor was administered with load and maintenance before the coronariography. In here we had a pretreatment, and we compare that with the ACOST strategy. Prasugrel was load plus maintenance after the coronary cine coronariography. So we had the preload that is not favorable because it increases the bleeding risk and the number of ischemic events. This is an interesting study published a couple of years ago. If we do the preload in the hemodynamic in the cath lab, we may we may not have the time to solve the situation. And if we have to do the crash of the pills of prasugrel, we will have 50 per chance probability of um, an, of anti platelet and when we plan for the coronary coronariography, and this is what happened in a lot of centers, we advise the pretreatment, and then here we have the we need to have a balance with the bleeding risk. In the uh, in the risk ischemic risk is low, we can do the treatment pretreatment with clopidogrel. And in case of um, low bleeding risk but high ischemic risk, we can use uh, tricagular. De-escalation uh, de of the doses, is, is it possible? This is an interesting topic. The de-escalation was evaluated in these studies and it is a practice that commonly happens. We All of us do that and we do that to increase the compliance of the treatment by the patient to reduce costs as well, to reduce bleeding. And my recommendation is not to do it in a routine way and not to do it before 30 days. This is because we know that the bleeding risk is stable while we indicate the um, anti-thrombi uh, treatment, but the risk of thrombus of the stent is very high and this decreases exponentially after the first month or three months. So the candidates for this de-escalation are patients with high bleeding risk and intermediate ischemic risk. This study was published recently in the last ACC that showed patients with infarction to 1,600 approximately patients in the first month Tricagleron was used and the escalation to clopidogrel. This was compared to continuing the therapy up to one year with, uh, with the medicine. And there was a clear benefit in reducing the, um, the assessment criteria. The end point, I'm sorry. The duration of the strategy will depend on an analysis of the, his, of the hemorrhagic and his ischemic risk of the patients during the first months and six months and after one year to determine whether we should prolong the treatment or not. Maybe 
in a subgroup of patients in particular. We have here meta-analysis published to answer this question. This is one of the most important ones because we have 17 trials with 47,000 patients and it shows that if we shorten the strategy as regards the standard duration, which is one year, we will have lower bleeding in our patients. On the contrary, if we decide. In this case, to prolong the strategy uh, more over a year, we are going to have a difference in infarctions and this strategy of shortening uh, less than a year, it will decrease the number of uh, bleeding to answer. We have new al alternatives such as monotherapy and this has been proven in these four studies, 30,000 patients. These are the most important ones and you can see that if we use an antiplatelet, a strong one such as tricagliolor, we can suspend aspirin after a month and three months and we will, have, we will be very certain that we will have good results. This is very solid and maize are the same and we will have a, ten, a trend to reduce the bleeding risk to end as a final message. To assess the risk, it is not necessary to have a fight with uh, clinic cardiologists who are afraid of bleeding or the interventional physicians to prevent thrombosis. The most important part is working together as a team with different departments to determine the risks and the most convenient strategy for our patients. Thank you very much. I uh, say goodbye from Rosario Santa Fe, Argentina. Thank you very much, Gerardo. A great presentation. We have a few minutes to read some questions that we had toward the panel, our comments. We have Dr. Hugo Londero, who is going to be telling us a little bit about one of the questions that uh, came up. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, there were several congratulations messages from for the panelists. So here we have a question for Dr. Christian, which is uh, especially for this pro educar sessions. What would be a good advice for a hemodynamist who is starting to use uh, FFR in the room, and for intermediate coronary injuries, which are mandatory or which in which would you not avoid using FFR and what what's the use that you would give to FFR in uh, post the angioplasty okay uh, that's uh, I think that the question is uh, stems from a bit of a confusion the chat was uh, concent concentrated on the patient on a stable patient right we have no doubts that these tools, these tools are very useful in stable patients. If I, because of what we've seen in intermediate lesions, uh, it's a little allows us to, to assess uh, intermediate lesions because we know which ones to treat or which ones not to. So we know that in the, mid -term, in the medium term and long term, they become big, uh, larger. So that's one of the causes. And uh, when asked in relation with the procedure, then probably if we treat them, it's going to be, we're going to have uh, a response that where we may have done it completely well. But the problem is in diffused lesions. Uh, probably uh, some of the other doctors can go deeper into this, but in these kinds of lesions it's not going to have the result that we have in spite of the how successful uh, the procedure was. So, for all the coronary patients, are, we have a series of changes that are mediated by markers facing uh, lesions, facing the acute uh, picture. We have uh, 
hemodynamic changes in the ventricle. Uh, we had the, the reduce the reduction of the coronary flow and vasoconstriction, not just next to the 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 culprit artery, but also on the others. So it's hard to know what's the real benefit of a functional uh, evaluation in this context. So it's possible that now it's likely that, uh, that there may not be a hemodynamic uh, balance, uh, equilibrium in the patient. So we need to wait at least one or two weeks to assess the lesion. So if not, we need to search all of the, the culprit lesions or if they are uh, the, to blame for the infarction or not. So based the, the tool that we have right now is the FR. So in case that uh, in that case, yeah, that functional evaluation uh, carries great importance. Thank you, thank you for the answer. I have a question for Dr. Alejandro Goldsmith. In your clinical, in your norm, regular clinical practice, do you use any kind of score, any kind of indicator of uh, habitual scores when choosing uh, when choosing whether to do revascularization. Could you clarify a little bit about that? The question is pretty interesting and it's uh, complex. Uh, the current scores are based on not so current uh, technologies. I think that many of us use Syntax or Syntax2 and Syntax is based in a stent that is basically out of the market by now with com results that are completely different from current stents. There is a particular score, there's no particular scores that one should use, but you should uh, consider several, uh, like they said in the previous uh, previous talks. We need to consider the concept of the heart team and explain to the patient which may be the benefits, which may be the complications, and which may be the needs for that patient. And based on that, deciding the, the conduct to follow. So to answer the question, uh, Ricardo, if I have a single score? No, the answer is no. Uh, we assess them uh, case by case every time that we need to do it. Yes, Uro. I have a question for Dr. Zapata. What antiplatelet do you use for patients with uh, history of bleeding? Thank you for the question, it's very interesting. Uh, clearly, all patients need to uh, receive a risk assessment for, for each of the patients. The ischemic risk on one hand and the bleeding risk on the other hand. And uh, based on the DH groups, the bleeding risk is uh, common, especially in patients with uh, acute coronary syndrome. So the strategy that we use for patients, uh, we try not to use them. The P2, B12, uh, it's, also, it's always important to uh, consider the, the balance, the balancing the risk. If there's a strong bleeding risk, then clearly the, we need to use the least powerful drugs, the less powerful drugs, and uh, if I'm trying to balance the risk uh, during the patient follow-up. Thank you very much, Gerardo. And uh, we're closing uh, right on schedule uh, on in the nick of time. So we want to thank the entire audience that have joined us over this session. We have uh, run through all of the tools that we, uh, we have in the hemodynamics room, in the CAT lab, to, um, to, uh, to treat uh, intermediate lesions. Then the treatment that uh, that's going to continue and then we leave you to the next session of structural cardiopathy with the first uh, protocol in this uh, protocol course by Salasi. Thank you everyone. Okay, good afternoon. 
uh, let's uh, start with this new module in the 11th fellow course uh, by Solasi Proeducar. And this is a module of structural heart disease. We have the pleasure of having five experts, uh, high ranking experts, who are also friends, who are going to be teaching us the step by step of each of their specialties. So let's uh, move on to Dr. Daniel Berrocal. To, for him to present, uh, to introduce the first speaker. Okay, thank you, Leandro. Welcome to this uh, interesting session. To me, it's a pleasure. I have a pleasure. I want to congratulate uh, Matthias Stechman, who is going to talk to us about. He has a uh, great experience. Uh, he's an opinion leader in TABI and structural heart disease. So he's going to talk to us about the CT scans, uh, what should we know from that, and what are the fundamental measurements that we need to pay attention. Take it over, Matthias. Thank you very much. My name is Matthias Techman. I am an interventional cardiologist from, the, from Sanatorio Güemes, at Sanatorio Finoquieto. And we're going to talk about, uh, about aortic valve implants and what should we know about CAT scans. These are my conflicts of interest. And uh, from the conceptual point of view, the right choice of the prosthesis size in TAVI, as well as the, the access site, is uh, vitally important. This has allowed us to lower the TAVI mortality, uh, which allowed us to uh, move forward to uh, these uh, lesser risk populations. This is thanks to the technology, but as well as uh, improvement in the measurements in CAT scans. So uh, the goal of this uh, talk is to define what is the aortic valve annulus and the different uh, measurement modes uh, to measure the clinical impact of an appropriate annulus measurement and then see how do we guide TAVI by using the CAT scan, how do we evaluate the perspective and the, and the surgery. And, uh, the, annual, the aortic valvular, uh, the aortic valvular annulus is a virtual annulus uh, formed by the most basal points of the three valves. And this is a, a theoretical idea. If we see it in an, an anatomical uh, preparation, we will not find it because this is a virtual annulus in which we find the base, most basal point of three valves. Dr. Piazza is a pioneer in this uh, topic. He has published uh, many years ago where he evaluated the, the annulus uh, topography and uh, he found out that both the smaller, the ma minor ring and the major ring annulus, sorry, uh, were uh, the diameters were different. The smaller diameter and the larger diameter. The larger one was 30% uh, larger than the smaller diameter, so the ring is non-circular. Therefore, it's a complex structure that requires a measurement method that interprets its elliptical shape. The measurement of a single diameter could lead to mistakes, so that's why we measure it uh, in several ways. This is the way that we used to do it before. In 2009, that's over 12 years ago, we performed the measurement with uh, with an ultrasound, and we saw the diameter. This is the, the one that we are uh, when we are doing the section on the, the, the esophagus. So, and the measurements were always short. You can see the, the parallelism of the uh, ultrasound and the trends. So we see that not only one uh, goes uh, does a section on the shorter diameter, but sometimes it's not done properly. So this is a uh, partner study. Uh, we know we can see that the, the parallel uh, issues that we had eight percent, twelve percent. Uh, moderate uh, to severe, and uh, the measure. What the problem here was that the measurement was not appropriate, and this impacted the mortality because uh, we had this this issue that was more prevalent in these types of patients. So we measured the thickness with a tomography that. Uh, 
with the CAT scan that uh, goes uh, through the most basal part of the three va the three valves, the three sorry the three auricles, and this is uh, generated by both the, the oblique uh, projections uh, as well as the sagittal projection where we can see the circumferential shape of the annulus. So once we make a correct diagram of this. Uh, image, we can get the, the large diameter, the minimum diameter, the maximum diameter, we can get a, an average, we can uh, calculate the perimeter, which is the measurement of the circumference, we can derive the diameter from that perimeter, and we can calculate, the, we can obtain the area and calculate the diameter from the area, uh, two times the square root of the area uh, divided by pi. And all of this uh, provides us the, inf the information of the type of valve that we should use. Uh, the measurement of the annulus is dynamic, so the, the, uh, the annulus is larger in uh, diastolic, so we need to measure it in uh, systolic where, the, where we will have a larger pressure on the diameter. So we see here 72 and 74 of the 77 and 72 of the perimeter that changes the type of valve. This is an example of an incorrect measurement. We are in the outflow tract on the left side. We don't have the basal uh, points of the three valves. And we can see it a little bit upper. Uh, we uh, have the on the right sinus. So it's not an exact measurement. And this is another point, another important point when we see uh, the variability. We should never uh, measure the valve annulus in uh, the oblique. It's the same thing as measuring the, the large diameter or the small diameter. So another different uh, type of measurement is the measurement of the coronary sinuses. Um, this uh, takes us to the, we can see the larger measurement of the, si of the sinuses. And we can see the intercommissure of, uh, from the left and the right toward the, co the left coronary sinus. From the right, the commissure is in the right and the right and the left and the valsalva sinus. So this will provide us uh, with an average of the width. And this will allow us to prevent uh, some problems. Another important issue is the measurement of the height. It's based on the, from the, the, the valve annulus and perpendicularly with the height of the, to the right coronary and the left coronary. The right one goes down and the left one goes up. Another important point is that when we see the, the valve uh, for expand, balloon expandable, uh, this we need to consider uh, before doing the procedure. Based on this, we are going to select a prosthesis, which is the most appropriate based on the dimensions that we measure. The selection of the implantation angle is important also because there are some implanters that uh, use the, the three cast view, so we can, we can calculate it with a certain automatic software, and we uh, select the three non-coronary points, and then we do a rendering of that uh, aortic vascular ring, and we position the three points uh, perpendicularly, Knowing that the center one is the right one, and this is the left one, and the one is the, and the right is the top one. So we can see the, this way in three-cast view. So three-cast view, sorry. And here we have a, a technique that we have in vogue right now is the cast overlap. We can see it using the CAT scan with this uh, software called Prosize. So we can see once we uh, diagram the aortic uh, annulus, we can see the projection in which we will see the right and the left uh, superimposed. Here we can rotate and overimpose in the right and the left and we will have here the position where we will have to implant cast overlap. 
there are other different uh, ways with different software, but it's more or less the same. But, but what is important is the, so the CAT scan to, evaluate, to assess the, the safety, and we have the we need to be very obsessive in the selection in patient screening and in the way that we're going to assess the vascular risk. So to perform a vascular analysis, we need to uh, perform a general analysis of the accesses, a rendering analysis, longitudinal analysis. So the, what they do first is uh, to assess uh, the transfemoral or subclavian access. I do a general panning of the tomography. I see how it goes generally and I see if there's uh, calcium in the ascending uh, aorta, uh, if there's not. And I see how the descending aorta looks like, how do the iliac and the femoral look like. That's extremely important. We can see, uh, we see the, the excesses, how they look like generally. And then we follow up with a volume rendering analysis. We can see the, the curves, uh, if uh, there's something below the femoral head, and to see if this is going to be appropriate or if this is going to be prone to any kind of complication. Foreclosure. And then I perform a longitudinal analysis of the vessel. I reconstruct, reconstruct it totally and I perform a, a measurement point by point of the length of each of the segments where I think that I may have complications. If I see that there's a small diameter, I do a subclavian longitudinal analysis. There are some uh, different uh, automatic programs, like Trimensia, but first you should be able to measure it on your own, with, in your home, with your computer. Uh, so we need to be, when we analyze the puncture, for the puncture and the closure, we need to be very obsessive to see where the places we're going to do all the parts of the procedure in order to be able to perform a puncture without complications. I had 10 minutes to show you a super long issue, so I think that this is going to be the end, so as I don't bore you, and I think that these are the first general uh, broad topics that you can do to have an idea about this. So thank you very much for your attention. It was great, Matthias. Thank you very much. The truth is that it was a great review on how to use the tomography. Now we're going to move to the next conversation, uh, to the next presentation. Then we will talk about the aortic section. The next topic, as you all know, they are pre-recorded to avoid any inconvenience <coughs> or interruption. And this, I will present uh, Guillaume Atisani, a friend, more than a friend to me, from the from working at university, and they have a lot of experience in aortic valve implants. And the talk we're going to listen to now was recorded by one of the fellows by Dr. Luis Augusto Pamagala. Then we're going to be able to have a discussion with the rest of the panelists, with the Dr. Guillermo that is here with us. Boa tarde a todos. Meu nome é Luiz Augusto Dalan, em nome do Dr. Guilherme Artizani e de toda a equipe aqui do University Hospital de Cleveland. É, queria agradecer pela oportunidade de estar podendo participar. E o tema que nos foi, nos foi proposto hoje é o step by step das válvulas autoexpansíveis e balão expansíveis. É um tema extremamente amplo, que nós geralmente damos essa aula ao vivo, leva mais de hora para fazer o caso. Então, com 15 minutos, vamos tentar fazer o melhor para ser de forma mais didática e mais compreensiva. Nós vamos pegar uma válvula pra, como modelo, depois vamos falar as diferenças para, com a outra. Então, vamos falar que o procedimento inicial, ele não começa no, na sala de hemodinâmica, ele começa antes. Então, idealmente, você tem que fazer um planejamento pré-procedimento. Sempre, todos os casos, nós fazemos as reuniões com a, com a valve meeting, e que nós checamos tudo, né? Nós checamos o tamanho da válvula, o, o quadro clínico do paciente, qual a válvula ideal, e com essa seleção nós conseguimos individualizar o tratamento para cada paciente. 
É, no dia do, do procedimento, nós refazemos tudo. Então, o paciente chegando no, no hospital, nós checamos todas as medidas que foram feitas para ver se nós confirmamos e, se for necessário mudar, a gente modifica e sempre tendo em, em vista o melhor tratamento para o paciente. Então, o paciente sempre coleta é, exames de laboratório, eletro, faz um eco no mesmo dia e no dia seguinte, após o procedimento, né? e nós revemos a tomografia, e nós usamos a tomografia como base de tudo que, que nós vamos apresentar. Então, nós vemos o, 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 a via de acesso, qual que é ideal, se é femoral, se é algum acesso alternativo, se é radial, né? Confirma o tamanho da válvula, necessidade ou não de pré-dilatação, né? Quais são as expectativas do procedimento, não, como reagir aos achados durante e depois do procedimento, né? É, se, por exemplo, se o paciente apresentar é, é, refluxo para valvar, se era esperado ou não, se vamos reagir ou não, se vamos pós-dilatar a válvula ou não, é, distúrbios de condução, se são esperados ou não, se o paciente vai manter com marca passo provisório ou não, então tudo isso tem que ser discutido e pensado antes do procedimento. Nós sempre determinamos o ângulo de, de, de o ângulo para liberar a válvula, né? então atualmente nós estamos usando o Cusp Overlap Technique, como é recomendado, mas é, sempre é, é necessário ter uma, uma visão de coplanar também, para que nós possamos ter ideia do alinhamento das, da, da, das cúspides, e sempre depois disso, nós estamos autorizados a fazer o timeout, e o paciente vai para a sala de hemodinâmica. Então, aqui é um, só um didático do um pouco do que a gente vai falar, né? Então, vamos começar aqui pelo acesso. Né? Então, o acesso é sempre feito de acordo com o tamanho da válvula, então, de acordo com a válvula que nós vamos escolher, nós vamos escolher o, o tamanho do introdutor. E, então, as, as válvulas maiores requerem introdutores maiores e você tem que também ver se, no caso das válvulas é, autoexpansíveis, se você vai fazer inline ou não. Inline significa fazer com o, o introdutor do próprio dispositivo, ou se você vai colocar o dispositivo dentro de um outro introdutor. Né? Depois disso, nós, no nosso serviço, a gente sempre pega dois acessos arteriais, né? um para válvula e outro para controle hemodinâmico e injeção de contraste. Geralmente, a gente vai pela artéria femoral direita e esquerda, né? mas pode usar a artéria radial como acesso alternativo, né? Sempre nós colocamos o, um pigtail no acesso secundário e nós gravamos uma imagem de referência para determinar qual que é o melhor ângulo né, para a gente liberar a válvula. Né? E a gente sempre também, depois de pegar o acesso, a gente já coloca dois dispositivos de perclose, né, é, caso seja necessário usar o perclose, que a gente usa para praticamente todos os nossos casos, mas também pode ser utilizado o dispositivo manta, daí, nesse caso, ao final do procedimento. Anticoagulação sempre, né? Então, depois de pegar o acesso, a gente sempre anticoagula o paciente, sempre com esse tia, a gente colhe esse tia a cada 20 minutos, sempre tem que estar, tá, a gente opta acima de 250, idealmente acima de 300 segundos, né? não muito alto, não acima de 400. Né? E tá aí o próximo passo seria a gente colocar o pigtail para ver onde está a válvula e fazer o cruzamento da válvula, né? Então, a gente geralmente usa um guia reto e nós, de acordo com o jato, nós é, acessamos o ventrículo com, esse, com, esse, com uma manobra é, mais elegante possível e menos traumática para o paciente, como vocês podem ver nesse cruzando. Então, Próximo passo é inspeção. Então, a gente vai fazer a inspeção, da, a gente vai fazer a hemodinâmica, né? colher a hemodinâmica, ver todos os parâmetros hemodinâmicos e depois a gente vai analisar a válvula, ver se a válvula está ok para ser implantada, se não tem nenhum red flag para a gente ter que refazer, é, trocar o, o sistema de entrega ou mesmo a válvula. Depois disso, nós vamos fazer a, 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 a válvuloplastia por balão, se necessário, então, a pré-dilatação, né? Então, é, a pré-dilatação, nós também, sempre nós decidimos pré-procedimento, se ela vai ser necessária ou não, né? Então, geralmente, a gente coloca uma fio guia, a gente usa, idealmente, o fio guia Safari, né? E a gente coloca o fio guia e, com isso, a gente coloca o balão 
sobre o fio guia. Idealmente, a gente usa um balão não complacente, mas pode ser usado o balão semi-complacente também para realizar essa pré-dilatação. A gente pré-dilata a maioria dos nossos casos aqui no nosso serviço, e com isso, nossa taxa de pós-dilatação é muito pequena. Sempre para pré-dilatar o balão, a gente coloca o marca-passo, né? a gente, no começo do, do procedimento, a gente coloca o marca-passo, e sempre a gente faz um rapid pacing para poder insuflar o balão de forma adequada. Depois disso, a gente vai, inserir, vai fazer o alinhamento né, é, do sistema de acordo com o nosso planejamento pré-procedimento. Né? Então, de acordo com a fluoroscopia, com o ângulo que a gente determina a partir da tomografia, a gente vai determinar é, o ângulo de ataque né, do procedimento. Então, nós in, vamos introduzir uh, o dispositivo através do introdutor ou inline, Vamos cruzar é, a região aórtica de forma bem devagar, bem lenta, para evitar qualquer tipo, de, qualquer tipo de trauma e qualquer tipo de embolização que pode gerar um AVC. Então, nós cruzamos aqui o dispositivo e depois disso nós vamos colocar o, o ângulo que nós conseguimos de acordo com a tomografia, né? No caso do cuspid overlap technique, né, que ele, ele, é, é, o objetivo dele é isolar o, 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 a cúspide não coronariana. A ideia é alinhar a cúspide dire, a direita e a esquerda e a gente isolar a cúspide não coronariana. E com isso a gente fica com praticamente uma vista de apenas duas dimensões, né, apenas uma linha entre elas. E fica muito mais fácil, o, o mais preciso e com mais controle o alinhamento das cúspides. Né. Então, é, idealmente, com isso, a gente consegue ter uma ideia do, 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 do depth, do, da profundidade ideal que a gente vai liberar a válvula, né? Então, a gente só tem que se preocupar depois em outra projeção para saber se nós conseguimos é, atingir a cúspide esquerda, né? Mas aqui, de acordo com, só com o, o seio não coronariano, a gente consegue determinar qual vai ser a posição ideal da válvula para ser implantada. Então, aqui, é, mostrando uh, qual a diferença né, da cúspide overlap com o, o a coplanar view em oblíquo esquerda, né? aqui a gente tem o verdadeiro é, profundidade no seio não coronariano, quando que no, 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 na coplanar view com LAO a gente tem um foreshortening um é, for dessa região, não é a o, 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 o profundidade dela. Então, aqui mostrando, então, é, na cuspa overlap, a gente coloca o pigtail, né? E a partir daí a gente consegue isolar o seio não coronariano dos outros dois. Então, idealmente, você inicia é, o cuspa overlap colocando o seu dispositivo no meio do pigtail. Então, sempre aqui no meio do pigtail você começa a, a, o deployment do dispositivo. Né? E o ideal é que a gente consiga uma profundidade de aproximadamente 3 milímetros. Então, bem superficial para o deployment, com isso a gente tem menores índices de marca-passo. Então, aqui os senhores estão vendo o deployment, começa no meio do pigtail e depois a válvula vai mergulhar e vai ficar numa posição ideal de em torno de 2 a 4 milímetros, né, para ser implantada e ser uma posição mais superficial possível. Né? Então, o objetivo é ficar em torno de 3 e a, pelo IFU deve, deve se recapturar, se for menor de 1 um, ou maior de 5 milímetros no seio não coronariano. Né? A gente sempre faz um, um pacing rápido, né, é, para poder baixar a pressão durante o deployment, então se a pressão estiver baixa, você não precisa é, pacing, mas se você tiver com uma pressão mais alta, o ideal é que você faça um pacing e deployment do dispositivo é, na posição ideal. Então, aqui os senhores estão vendo, a gente colocando o, o coplanar, uh, saindo da coplanar view, indo para o cuspe de overlap view. É, o deployment da prótese, então, idealmente a gente faz um deployment nesse primeiro terço, um deployment bem lento, e depois os dois terços seguintes a gente faz um deployment bastante rápido do dispositivo, até o ponto de não retorno, que é esse aqui, então a gente sempre para antes do ponto de não retorno, que se precisar recapturar a válvula, a gente pode recapturar e colocar na posição ideal. 
Né? Aqui vocês estão vendo o deployment, tá? a gente fez o deployment bem devagar, depois esse deployment a gente, no nosso caso, pode deixar o pigteio, não tem problema nenhum deixar o pigteio aqui para saber a profundidade, ele não vai embolizar a válvula quando você tirar o pigteio, e tem que ser uma coisa bem lenta, e nós fazemos uma, uma angiografia aqui para saber o, o posicionamento ideal da válvula. Vocês estão vendo aqui que é uma posição bastante superficial nesse caso, né? Então, é, nós realizamos esse deployment, os seus olhos estão vendo aqui bem lento, bem devagar, né? para você tirar toda a atenção, sempre, nunca esquecer, jamais que quando você for commit e quando você for liberar, sempre você tem que puxar a corda, o safari, para dentro do nose cone, para tirar toda a atenção e você poder fazer um deployment e evitar que ela pule após esse procedimento. Né? Preparar para liberação total, então os senhores estão vendo aqui bem devagar e aqui depois é, que estiver desancorado, vocês podem, então, é, liberar a válvula de uma forma adequada e sem o risco dela pular. Né? Então, libera esse primeiro um e depois o outro. Então, depois disso, a gente pode fazer o recapture do sistema, né? É, sempre com a corda à frente, né? Então, sempre você coloca a corda para frente e depois faz o recapture do sistema para ser o recapture mais seguro possível, né? Depois eu acesso o pós-implante, então, depois do implante, você vai fazer, pode fazer uma geografia, nós aqui no serviço não fazemos, nós geralmente fazemos um eco transtorácico no modo pouco invasivo, então, o paciente está acordado só com a anestesia local com pouca sedação, e a gente faz um eco transtorácico e faz medidas hemodinâmicas para saber se a posição está ideal, se tem que, se tem que pós-dilatar ou não a válvula, né? Mas pode fazer uma injeção, se necessário. Se necessário, é, fazer a pós-dilatação pode ser realizada após o procedimento, a gente pode dilatar muito pouco no nosso serviço. E o, o, depois o fechamento do, 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 do acesso vascular, geralmente a gente de, deploy os dois proglides antes do procedimento, e aqui a gente só vai e vai fazer o fechamento desses percloses com sucesso, geralmente. Né? Diferenças para a válvula balão expansivo, então a válvula balão expansivo tem algumas características, né? primeiro esse sistema de comando que é bastante diferente, então tem que saber como manejar, isso aqui tem várias aulas que mostram como fazer, então você tem que colocar na posição, você tem que fazer o posicionamento do sistema de entrega quando a válvula ainda está na horta descendente, pois você vai passar a crossa a horta e a hora que você cruzar a válvula, você vai tirar novamente o sistema de entrega para que você possa posicionar a válvula de forma adequada e ter um posicionamento ideal do, do, do device, né? E esse sistema é interessante porque você pode, bem, você pode, essa ponta aqui, ela é maleável, então você pode dobrar essa ponta quando ela estiver cruzando a horta e ela é menos traumática e muitas vezes nos tiros de situações muito adversas, né? Depois você vai é, alinhar, geralmente a gente sai numa posição mais superficial, então a gente vai geralmente com essa marca no meio do pigtail, mais uma vez, essa marca a gente vai no meio do pigtail, e com isso a gente vai ter um foreshortening do ventrículo para o átrio, ou seja, a válvula vai encolher dessa região para a região do átrio, do, desculpa, a região aórtica, a posição do ventricular para a região aórtica, e com isso, geralmente essa marca luminescente que vocês podem ver, é onde a válvula vai ficar, tá? aqui ela não mexe, e essa aqui é a região final, onde você vai ter o, a posição final da válvula, depois dela estiver implantada. Né? Acabando já, sempre fazer um checklist de tudo que deve ser feito, né? É, antes de você liberar a válvula, né? E sempre o que a gente faz é um rehearse, a gente faz um ensaio de tudo que a gente vai fazer, os passos do procedimento na hora de implantar, para que a equipe esteja, como uma equipe de Fórmula 1, todo mundo esteja no mesmo plano e todo mundo consiga liberar a válvula para evitar qualquer tipo de confusão que possa prejudicar o procedimento. Né? Então, como eu falei, inicialmente, essa válvula geralmente ela, dá, ela encolhe a posição ventricular para a posição aórtica, então, essa posição órtica se mantém, a parte de cima da válvula, e a parte de baixo é a que vai encolher e que vai ficar na posição final. É, você Geralmente, se faz uma geografia após o procedimento para ver como ficou a posição da válvula, né? se ficou a posição ideal ou não, e depois a gente faz as medidas hemodinâmicas para saber se a válvula está na posição ideal ou não. Essa geografia ela é, pode ser feita ou não, alguns serviços fazem, outros não. O ideal é que a válvula fique no mínimo 80 20, né? 20% a parte ventricular, 80 a parte aórtica ou mais superficial possível para diminuir o índice de marca passo. 
Bom, era isso que eu queria falar. Estamos à disposição de vocês, se tiverem qualquer dúvida, e agradeço mais uma vez a Solace pela oportunidade. Boa tarde a todos. It was a very good presentation. You are a very great teacher for the fellows. Daniel, would you like to start with a brief discussion of the aortic area? I don't know if Alex has any question from the audience. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, there are some questions from the audience that I may give you. One of them is, your consideration of what is the main advantage or use that the CASP overlap technique has had. I can take on that question. Guilherme? Do you want to answer the question? I can go after you. Okay. Thank you. First of all, I believe that the CASP overlap technique, what it is, was to make it homogeneous for the implant technique. What it did was say this, we're going to standardize this, and we will have A, B, C, and D. So it is a technique, a standardized technique of implant. This is the main important aspect because some years ago we had a lot of implant techniques. We had the technique A, B, C, etc. And each of us could apply in a, apply it in a different way, the option that was the safest, but it was very difficult to teach the knowledge on how to do that because even in Medtronic itself or some other companies, there were a lot of ways to do so. So the first thing that we did was to standardize the implant technique. And what is the benefit of having a standardized method? Is that everyone follows the same system. And the other benefit is that it is very easy to teach. And even if we do not have the experience of having done that, you can see a, drastically, a drastical reduction of uh, the complications. We published our CASP overlap cases, and we have a, a peacemaker rate of zero. And then in the following 35 cases, the rate was 6%. So, as a conclusion, I believe it is a technique where we have a standard, we make a system out of it, and we, it is a proof that there is a big reduction in the use of peacemakers. There are some other centers that could obtain that peacemaker rate using some other implant techniques, the three cuts view, but these are highly experienced centers and it is very difficult to teach those type of techniques because interpreting the images is very hard and but there are some centers that can do so and they do not have to go to the three cast view for example i believe that your answer was perfect i completely agree with what you say i'm going to speak in portuguese and there uh, will not and that is the truth, the fact of standardizing everything, the key aspect here. Regardless of the technique that you use, we need to have a standard design. A gente faz, aos nossos casos, a gente não faz rotineiramente cuspa overlap, right? A gente faz nossos casos em in, in LAO technique, que nós, nós desenvolvemos a técnica de LAO technique, a gente... Uh, nossa taxa de marca passo de 4,9%, nossa última taxa de marca passo. Então, o fato de que o, o mais importante é você ter consistência. Doesn't matter the technique you do, what, o que importa é você ser consistente. né Eu acho que o que o Mati falou é muito importante, o fato de que quando você faz, é importante você entender fundamentalmente as duas, a diferença nas duas técnicas. né Quando você faz cusp overlap, você não está foreshortening a via de saída, Portanto, você consegue entender a profundidade da válvula muito mais precisamente 
E quando você vai em Aleô, me, me, me recordo fazendo caso ao vivo em Aleô, em 2019, fazendo caso para o CVI, a gente, a gente liberou a válvula menos 4, menos... Claro, quanto mais você tira o parallax né, em Aleô Technique, mais você vai for short no LVT, e, e portanto... É, eu tenho segurança de liberar a válvula alta. O problema é que as pessoas não têm essa segurança, acabam tendendo a implantar mais profundo e aumenta a taxa de marca passa. Então, eu acho que a, a mensagem, só para não alongar muito essa discussão, porque ela, ela pode ser mais alongada que isso, mas acho que a principal mensagem, acho que o Mate foi muito feliz na colocação dele, é standardizar, né? E outra coisa, sim is believing. Não, as pessoas veem a, a, a profundidade de uma maneira a, mais concreta e mais fidedigna e, portanto, Uh, acho que essa a profundidade ela é mais estável e, consequentemente, você consegue ter resultados mais consistentes, inclusive em centros de menos experiência. Então, esse é um fato importantíssimo. Acho que a reprodutibilidade é muito maior. Né? Então, acho que é isso aí. Perfeito, excelente. Perfeito, great, thank you. Would you like to make a comment? No, I just would like to say that all of this session has been amazing and the comments of Guillermo and Matias, but since we are delayed with the program, we can move forward. And I would like to, I have the privilege of uh, introducing Juan Granada, who is a great friend of us, of Solasi, director of CAF who will be talking about how to perform an adequate and safe transeptal puncture. Juan, welcome and thank you for joining us. Great, it is an honor for me being here with you today. Thank you very much for the invitation. In the next 15 minutes, we're going to see something that is very relevant, that is how to do a transeptal puncture. We're going to talk about the anatomy and the anatomical relations as regards the procedure. For those of you who follow the structural area, you know that depending on the procedure, the recommendations as regards the place to do the puncture in the uh, foramen oval. For mitral clip or pro, uh, mitral procedures, we're always talking about the puncture being superior posterior. For uh, and for the PFO superior, but one of the things that you always have to take into account, and our fellows need to know, and people who are doing this technique, is that first of all, today, with the great advance we have in imaging. The most punctures are done based on the anatomy of the patient and the need to reach a specific point in the heart. But it also has to do with the anatomical target that we have at that time. The puncture for certain type of devices, for certain type of technologies is different than for another technology and we need to take this into consideration. I always emphasize the fact that when we talk about the site of the puncture, we're describing the location, the geographical location at the fossa ovale, not necessarily the anatomic relationship to other myocardial structures. When we talk about superior, we're not saying that it is above the mitral valve. When we say posterior, it is not posterior to the mitral valve, and we are going to see this uh, in depth because it is a very co important concept. To talk about the anatomy, here we see the atrium, the anatomy of the septum. In this first part, the inferior, anterior, and the atrial septum. This is the position, the anatomical position of the septum. It is almost vertical and with an angle. In this other image we see the false uh, foramen oval with the coronary sinus that is always lower and posterior to the uh, false oval. This is a reconstruction I always like because this is a 3D 
ultrasound where you can see the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the relationship. And when you go from the superior vena cava to the inferior vena cava, you have to go through the uh, foramen oval. And this is a projection over the tricuspid valve. And you can see here the three leaflets, the septal, the posterior, and the anterior one. A bit of anatomy. We talk about the location of the puncture again. When we are talking from the right side, this is a human that is on a biosimulator. When we see through the right side of the heart, this is the nomenclature that we should use superior, inferior, posterior, and interior. But when we talk about that in relation to the anatomical relations of the left side, this is the same catheter when it crosses seen from the left side. And we can see that it is very different when we talk about, for example, the mitral valve. When we are talking about superior, we're talking about going further, closer to the anterior valve than to the posterior one. Leaflet, I'm sorry. When we say posterior, we are saying posterior to the mitral valve. When we say anterior, we go closer to the mitral valve. When we say posterior, we go further away from it. This is a bit confusing in here, but I'm going to show you a CT imaging that will be very representative of what I'm saying. I want to say this for a reason, because when you communicate with the uh, echocardiogram operator, it is very important to co coordinate the nomenclature, because sometimes you talk about superior believing it is high in relation to the mitral valve, and that is not the case. Let's see this once again. This is a reconstruction of a CT. This is the spine. At the back, if we see it from the anterior part to the posterior part, we see that the axis of the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava is perpendicular to the axis of the mitral valve. So, when a catheter moves down from the superior vena cava to the inferior vena cava, when you try to look for the fossa ovalis, you can see here that the catheter is traveling from the anterior part to the posterior part of the mitral valve. Again, when you move from superior to inferior, when you go with the catheter from superior to inferior in the fluoroscopy, you're moving the catheter from the anterior to the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And one concept that is very important is moving the catheter superior and inferior does not have any impact in the height of the transeptal puncture. People tend to believe that if you're high in fluoroscopy, you are gaining height in the mitral, as regards the mitral valve, and that is not the case. How do you gain height in the mitral valve? Another concept is when the catheter is moved toward uh, clockwise, you move away from the mitral valve and you gain height. When you do it counterclockwise, rotation moves towards the mitral valve and you lose height. Superior to inferior, you're going from anterior to posterior to gain height, posterior to lose height, anterior to posterior to gain height, anterior to lose height. Once we're in the superior vena cava and we go down in the fluoroscopy, you can see that the fossa ovalis is basically in the middle of the of the journey. And if the catheter is positioned posteriorly, it will fall within the fossa ovale in most of the patient. When the catheter is towards the posterior wall, it falls within the fossa ovale. A mistake that is very common, especially in those who are starting with the procedure, is the catheter moving to the anterior part and falling within the uh, right 
uh, appendage because if we can do the fluoroscopy, we can puncture the right atrium. As regards the devices, why do we recommend to close the um, auricle in this position because the the anterior one is different. It is easier going in this direction to ha to go in this way. As you can see here, the inferior puncture to go to anterior lateral and in this of the four uh, chambers, if the puncture is posterior, it is easier to go to the ostium of the left auricle. In the posterior puncture, when you do it counterclockwise, the catheter falls within the ostium of the left auricle, and this is a catheter of a human heart with the puncture inferior posterior, and you can see how the catheter goes straight to the lateral commissure and the ostium of the left auricle. As regards the mitral valve, the puncture that is recommended in these procedures is superior and posterior. As you can see here in a superior, it is very close to the mitral valve and posterior because it goes away from the mitral valve gaining height and thus having the necessary height for procedures such as mitral clips from 3.5 to 4.5 um, distance. When you do it counterclockwise, the catheter gains height, and when you do it the other way around, we lose height again in a human heart. There is a superior and posterior. You can see the catheter uh, in the middle of the mitral valve as you would like to have it. This is very important because you put all of these concepts into consideration and what I recommend is start using the same nomenclature with the technicians. The first projection is called bicaval view. You can see the inferior and superior vena cava in the same projection. With this of 90 degrees, we're watching the two vena cavas from superior to inferior in this direction that you see here. And the catheter going down from the superior vena cava to inferior vena cava until it reaches the fossa ovalis. In here, you know whether we are superior or inferior in the upper part or the lower part, or as regards the mitral valve anteriorly in the anterior way or posterior way, uh, area. And then the sagittal uh, view, you can see the aorta in a cross-sectional view. You will know the aorta is anterior, so this is posterior. In here, we're seeing the septum from anterior to posterior. Here we see superior to inferior, and here we see posterior, anterior to posterior. The last projection is the four-chamber one view. You can measure with high precision the height of the puncture measuring when the septum is raised and the distance to the mitral valve to have the necessary height for the procedure you're going to perform. This is a slice I like because it is a CT reconstruction showing the release, the coronary, the non-coronary sinus with a inter the atrium septum. This is important because it is one of the main com uh, complications when going from right to left and puncturing through the aortic root. You can see here, this is the fossa ovalis that we are showing in a lighter color in a human heart. In this part we have the non-coronary aortic cusp and you can see the relationship with the two. If the puncture is very anterior, it can go a, with, it can go a, and make a puncture in the aorta. So the previous technique, people who did it without ultrasound placed a big tail on the non-coronary sinus and then in a projection basically a lateral 
you can see the puncture going from this direction with, without going to the anterior part to make sure the process has a good projection. If there are some professionals who do not have the experience to understand echocardiographic um, images, this is a, a potential help or reference you can have that is very simple. So to end with this, basically this the relationship of crossing the mitral valve. In general, when we go through the septum, the catheters tend to go to the posterior part and lateral part of the lateral commissure towards the left uh, auricle and the relationship between the orticle and the non-coronary sinus. We are crossing the septum that is here. There is a likelihood of rupturing or going towards the aortic valve, uh, the, aor the aorta, if the puncture is anterior. Another anatomical reference that is very important is the right ventricle because we go with the transeptal puncture through there, the three leaflets, septal, posterior and anterior of the tricuspid valve. And this is for you to know that the no, the AV node is between the uh, septal and the anterior leaflet and sometimes the needle uh, it falls there and when you go to that point that can create complications for the patient and to have a blockage so you need to take this reference into account. You can have also patients with PFO and you can see that the technician says there is a good entry of the atrium. My recommendation is never to cross through a PFO because the catheter will go in the same direction of the channel that is created. And basically, if there is a PFO, leave that alone and the puncture must be done following the recommendations we have been talking about through the primum and secundum septum, but not through perforation. And I would like, I hope you uh, were able to join us in the TBT uh, conference of July. And thank you very much for the invitation. I hope we see each other very soon. Okay, uh, Daniel, you're muted. Uh, sorry, thank you very much, Juan. Uh, pleasure having you with us. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, Alex, you have any questions from the audience. I had a question, but the last part of the presentation was very clear. The crossing through, it was about the crossing through the PFO. Yeah, the the clarity, Juan's clarity, uh, practice, practicality are uh, astounding. I'd like to ask you a quick question. Uh, thank you for being here uh, and being now, uh, being in the session, recording the session and being here. I wanted to ask you, Juan, what type of needle do you recommend to start uh, transept or puncture? We know that there's different types of needles. Some of them with uh, different characteristics. What do you recommend? Okay, uh, honestly, uh, Myra can tell you as well. We have been, uh, how would you say, spoiled. We have been spoiled. And since we started using uh, radio frequency with uh, these uh, systems, using a guy that goes through very easy and increases uh, procedure safety. I don't think that any of the operators here in the States are using uh, uh, any kind of the, any other kind. So the safety and the practicality of this procedure is important because uh, it allows the, the needle to slide and we use the radio frequency and I know that uh, companies don't like to hear this but Using the, the bobney, touching it just to go across could be one of the the, appli the applications of this technology, and this is what we use here, and that's the only thing that we use here. 
I don't know if Maida can say anything differently. Gracias. Thank you. Yes, as we say in Mexico, I'm uh, more uh, of the old guard. I'm still using the BRK. And uh, the extra sharp. Uh, we have the normal and the extra sharp, different flavors. Uh, the extra sharp has a sharper tip, of course, uh, especially for valve in valve or valve in brink. Uh, so this is uh, something that is used for uh, the, which the, in the previous uh, surgery the, we had opened and closed the, the septum. We probably have uh, an extra sharp and we have the BRK1 and the normal. So one has a larger angle that allows me to uh, the six up uh, wire the six up wire that allows us to cross and immediately ta takes the shape of a pigtail to prevent perforation. I haven't switched to uh, the other system. Uh, the, right now I don't remember the, the other brands, but I haven't had the need to do it, but uh, I had to maybe touch it with the bobby because sometimes uh, there's a huge notch crossing. But so touching the needle for with the bobby for a second it helps us go across to across the septum. Excellent tips. Excellent set of tips. And the chat, the the talk made given by Juan should be in everyone's portfolio, and we should review it every once in a while because it's a great talk. So I'm really grateful for you to join us. Now we're moving to another talk that needs to be here, like everyone that we also have in everyone's portfolio. We have Dr. Mayra Guerrero, and uh, it's a pleasure having her again. She's from Mexico, she lives in the United States. She's a professor of medicine in the Mayo Clinic Hospital. And she's going to talk to us about the mitral valve and valve and some basic, uh, some basic step by step, step by step uh, concepts. Okay, thank you all. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you all and uh, uh, with your invitation. The topic that I was assigned is this one, which is uh, very extensive. These are three types, three topics in one. I'm going to set a timer so that I can. Uh, stop, but some of the I'm going, I can stop at any point because some of the concepts apply to all three uh, of these topics, and the goals today are going to be to describe the the CT analysis of the heart to MBIB, MBIR, and MB and BIMAC, and to outline the procedural steps of the three techniques and to recognize the prevention strategies to prevent the out the outflow problems. I'm going to. Separate, separate uh, valve in valve and cardiac CT. I'm going to uh, go with the steps that apply to both of these uh, steps, and then I'm going to focus on the valve in valve because it's very, uh, very different. I'm going to we can talk about valve in valve and valve in brink. We can use both for both CT and also, uh, uh, and we can see the the surgical. First of all, what I do is search for the surgical report to see the size and uh, the brand what happened with the anterior leaflet, if they removed uh, the septum, if they closed, uh, what did they do with the septum? Because we need to know, uh, because the, the, the equipment could be different depending on what that happened with the septum. So then we move to the valve in valve and uh, we see the, the prothesis and it, this recommends us the type of, the size of sapien that we should use. There are also Edwards guides based on the inner diameter of the prosthesis. We have the different uh, catheter sizes and the different tools. And we use, I like using the uh, CAT scans. I like to measure the annulus, the mitral annulus, and selecting the size, sapien size using the, the area. And uh, this Sometimes the sizes are different from the ones mentioned for valve in valve. And we also consider the pathology. If the patient has a mitral incompetence, 
Then we're going to have a larger amount of embolism uh, of the sapien towards the, the leaflet. So if the, um, if the patient has a severe stenosis, then we uh, are in a, a limit area. We can uh, choose for the smaller one, in which uh, the, the app had suggested a um, size 26, and but as you can see, it's a 23 millimeter was enough, more than enough, and we had an, an appropriate result. So the cardiac CT is going to help us confirm dimensions, determine the angle of fluoroscopy for the deployment, for the implant, to determine the landing zone, uh, where we're going to place the valve. This is uh, particular in valves that are non-radiopaque. Uh, also to determine the location of the transeptal puncture and to estimate the risk of obstruction of the LBOT. Uh, so we, as we can see in the, the top part, we can see a radiopaque valve and we can determine the angle, the coplanar angle, but some uh, valves are not radiopaque, we cannot see them, and this is uh, the one that we use uh, precisely, is the calcium or any other uh, radiopaque marker who, which help us, helps us locate the lower part of the sapien, because that's what's not going to move during the deployment of the implant. So this is what I look at when we are uh, inserting the implant. So we know where we're going to put it. And uh, we're going to put it 80% uh, ventricular and 20% uh, auricular. So here we have the, the space of the, the outflow track, the LBOT. And then we have the virtual valve. We put the virtual valve. And we see the residual space, which is going to be our new LBOT. So Based on these sizes, we can uh, check the risk of obstruction. It's less than 190, more, less than 190 square millimeter is low, uh, high risk. Over 250 is uh, high risk. And the transeptal puncture can be planned. Uh, we can see this fossa ovale, ovales. And we can see uh, where we're going to put the needle to perform the puncture. And you can all check how we're going to see it in the fluoroscopy, which helps us uh, predict how is the transeptal uh, puncture, uh, the transeptal needle going to be located. And here we have the location, the inferior and posterior. Uh, the inferior posterior. We used to go first uh, to a superior and high location because we thought it was the same as the mitra clip, but it's very hard to go up and then down. But it's very, it's a lot easier if we do it in inferior posterior place the valve in a coaxially and, and it's simpler to navigate from in that in that way. Once we go uh, on the left side we uh, take the mitral valve, we use the jails and a, then a pigtail and then in, once in the ventricle we place the guide which in this case we use the, the extra small uh, safari, a very small one and then we do a cytostomy. We use normally a 14 millimeter balloon because uh, most cases need a 23 uh, sapien. So, uh, but if the size is uh, smaller, we could we could consider a smaller size. But uh, a 14 millimeters doesn't cost any more any kind of problem. In these cases, we do a valvuloplasty that we have a patient with critical stenosis because. Uh, then we start inputting the sapien and uh, this uh, obstructs the flow and we get uh, the patient to, to crash and so so we need to start with very very careful to do the dilation uh, so we need to mount the valve and uh, the opposite way that we would do for Tavi and then we navigate trying not to stop if you have the momentum and it's uh, moving forward do not stop I chose this picture because uh, the, it got stuck a little bit, so the trick here is to pull the guide a little bit. The operator needs to apply some tension, but this can normally be done uh, in a single step without uh, further complications. In several com uh, conditions, if the balloon gets stuck, in this case if the pusher doesn't cross the step, um, we have a little tr transition from the the, the stent and the uh, septum. What if it, this happens? We can unlock and we can decouple them and move forward only with the guide as if it was a telescope. 
through the mitzvah valve and that way you could play, place the stand. Once you get across, don't do this. Uh, sometimes you go across and the stent, if the if in, in the ventricular system, the left ventricle, you can uh, get stuck with the stent and the post part of the of the valve. So it's best to cross, but not excessively. Stay at the mitral valve level, not excessively ventricularly. So once we are in the desired place, we start inflating slowly with a slow deployment. I like to keep the inflation and use a, a peacemaker at 140 and 160 BPM. We like to do the flare, which is a, an over expansion of the ventricular edge of the valve. And we do this by adding additional contrast which is uh, fr additional in comparison to the recommended amount for the implant. This is one way, or what you also can do is a post dilation, but I believe that this is more complex. I like to do it only one step instead of two, adding extra contrast, and uh, this is allows us to uh, do the expansion on the ventricular side. This device is very important. This applies only for, for uh, MBIR. And this is uh, very important because we didn't know the problems that we could have. Many people think that uh, we should place the center, uh, the central marker of the balloon at the ring level, at the annulus level, but that's it's not like that because the the surgical uh, approach is supraannular. The surgical ring is supraannular, so it's best to leave a space of uh, some three millimeters between the marker and the surgical ring because in the example that we see here you can see that the, the surgical ring is on top the mark is in the middle and this procedure that was done on a different center ended up on a, on a, loc on a very auricular, uh, auricular location of the valve it shows you where the, the ring is right here uh, for a normal person so the end is sorry so don't uh, get carried away by don't don't follow just the, the surgical ring uh, because think that the mit, the mitra 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 uh, annulus is uh, below. If you do this, you can expect these kinds of results. Uh, this was in the mit, the mitra trial. This is uh, for people who had median STS score of 9.4 percent. We had a 30-day mortality of 3.3 percent, same as one year. Then uh, with 7.6 in STS score, we had 6.7, 30 day mortality, and one year 23.3%, which was very similar to the mortality uh, after one year that we saw with uh, MitraClip. So I got to do that something positive. And then we go to Vadimac, uh, finally, and this is very complex. I'm going to try to, to reduce it to three steps. First time is the CAT scan. Then I get the CTMAX score, which may help select the type of THV. This is a score that we developed to uh, help classify the severity of the MAC. The classification of the mitral annulus. If the score is over 7, we're talking about severe MAC. If, uh, we, if it's 4 to 6, it's moderate. If under 3, it's mild. In this mild and moderate, we do not recommend using Sapien 3 because these uh, patients have high embolism rate. Uh, risk. This is what we did in the CT, in the max score analysis that we did. This is the max score. Uh, we use uh, four characteristics: uh, the calcium thickness, the calcium distribution, the trigone involvement in the calcification, and the leaflet involvement. And we put point, we assign points uh, based on the values. Under five is one. Five to nine 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 point ninety nine is two and uh, over 10 is 3. Then uh, for number 2 is uh, over 180 angle, uh, to 180 to 272, over 273. And then uh, one, point, uh, one, pay, one point or two per each of the trigons or the leaflets involved. And green is the cases in which we had no complications and most of the patients had a score of 7 or more. And in red or blue we had uh, patients who had valve migration or embolization and these people had a score of 6 or under 60% of the patients so in this case this helps us choose which type of valve we're going to use 
which is the device. Some in some places of the world have the options of uh, metal devices or IoT, but uh, in the United States, there are only some are have have, have been approved. If the score is uh, under seven, uh, there's a trial. We can see the ten day trial. Uh, in the summit trial, or the Intrepid in the Apollo trial, or Cybian M3 in selected cases. And the last step is to prevent LBOT obstruction, for which we have many strategies. We have septal strategies that include uh, alcohol septal ablation, uh, some, some weeks before the implant, and if it's not possible, we add sept uh, ready frequency septal ablation. We do it through a tomography, and then we analyze the case, or you could uh, you could uh, analyze the surgical leaflet section or the percutaneous uh, solution. Some tips that I want to solve, that I want to mention to prevent the valve embolization. We have, uh, if you use the max score and the adequate and perform adequate sizing or an oversizing, uh, an adequate sizing with CTE or if you oversize the THV as in TAVR. Uh, you can establish the landing zone, 80 to 20, ventricular versus auricular, and it must flare in the left ventricle, uh, uh, like I showed you with the stent, and if you add the extra volume during the deployment, you can avoid this kind of complications. And sometimes you can post dilate if needed. I have a few seconds, this is an algorithm that we are using uh, nowadays, and uh, this helps us uh, assess patients with MAC, and uh, we have the max score and over six, uh, and max score over seven, and we see the risk of uh, obstruction of the LBOT. So if we have, a, if there's a re high risk, uh, then we can go to the septal ablation, then we can see if the risk is lower, and maybe we can go to uh, transeptal. If it's still high, we can uh, consider radio frequency or lampoon to proceed to the transeptal. So if you follow these steps, uh, you can expect that uh, these are will be the results that you will see. 30-day uh, mortality with transeptal access of 6.7%, which is less than the STS score. And after one year in this trial, the mortality was 33%, not very different from patients with uh, insufficient uh, functional uh, mitral uh, insufficiency or regurgitation. Uh, and this was very similar to Tavi in uh, the trial partner one. So this is a uh, this is something that we saw very positive. So in, in summary, the cardiac CT is key for procedural planning and to predict who is going to have obstruction of the LBOT. The obstruction of the LBOT is the most important complication, but it can be prevented, and the contemporary outcomes have improved. Thanks to the CT analysis and with the, the improvement of the implantation techniques. And this is all for today. Thank you very much. Your presentation was excellent, Myra. Very good one and of great quality. And there are no doubts. I thank you very much. Daniel, do you have any comment, any question before we finish? No, I would like to say that it is impressive what she has done in very short time. It is very clear. Only one question. We, in the uh, septal uh, implant and the septal area and the implant, which, what is the space that we have with the edema and the septum that tends to increase the gradient? In general, three to four uh, weeks. I know of a case of a different center in which they could only wait for one week. I think it depends on the case, but sometimes I think uh, we need to take some time for the reabsorption. The, as, if we have more time, we can have a greater um, decreasing in the, in the numbers. So if we wait three to four hours, we repeat the CT and we do all the measure, measurements again and we adjust depending on what we find. Excellent. And to end with this amazing session, we're going to invite our dear friend Marcio Montenegro. He works in Rio de Janeiro.
a great place to work and to live. And he will talk about the appendage closure, teaching the technique step by step. Um abraço, Daniel. Gracias. Olá a todos. É, gostaria de agradecer o convite da Comissão Organizadora. Eu sou Márcio Montenegro, do Rio de Janeiro. E nos próximos 12 minutos eu vou compartilhar com vocês o fechamento do apêndice atrial esquerdo, é, o ensinamento da técnica passo a passo. É, esse aqui é meu conflito de interesse, eu sou próctor da Abbott, nessa para essa aula. E falando especificamente do fechamento do apêndice atrial esquerdo, o procedimento efetivamente começa na punção transeptal. É lógico que antes é ideal que se faça a punção da veia femoral, é, da via femoral direita ou esquerda, preferencialmente a via femoral direita, e toda a técnica de punção transcepital tem que ser utilizada, mas isso aqui é assunto para uma outra aula completa, né, só sobre punção transcepital. Então, essa, essa, essa aula aqui a gente vai começar a partir da punção transcepital, e é importante dizer que a punção transcepital, é, dependendo do, é, do procedimento que você vai fazer, ela tem é, um local a, a, ideal a ser, a ser realizado. O local ideal é aquele diametralmente oposto à estrutura que você vai querer é, trabalhar dentro do ato esquerdo. Então, levando-se em conta que o apêndice atrial esquerdo ele é, um, ele é uma estrutura localizada na região superior e anterior do apêndice atrial esquerdo, o ideal é que se faça a punção é, é, inferior e posterior. Então, nessa, nessa figura que já é famosa, vocês conseguem ver aqui esse círculo verde, aqui é o local ideal da punção para quando você vai realizar a, 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 o fechamento do apêndice atrial esquerdo, porque a punção posterior e inferior fica dia, diametralmente oposta a, ao apêndice atrial esquerdo, que é anterior e superior. Aqui vocês veem a imagem da punção transeptal, da agulha transeptal, da agulha de broca em bro, atualmente a gente chama ela de BRK, né? e a, você pode utilizar um cateta transeptal, desde o Schwartz, que é mais reto, até o Mullins, que é, é, que é mais curvo, né? mas sempre com o dilatador na frente, para que a gente possa passar para a próxima etapa, da, após a punção, que é o posicionamento da guia stiff dentro da veia pulmonar superior esquerda. Essa guia stiff ela pode ser uma guia extra stiff, não necessariamente uma guia super stiff, é, é, para que leve para gente passar para outra etapa. Mas o ideal é que essa guia esteja posicionada, como essa aqui, dentro, do, dentro da veia pulmonar superior esquerda. Notem que ela ela está lá, está fora da imagem do coração, né? então está posicionada dentro da veia pulmonar superior esquerda, saindo desculpa, saindo é, na região inguinal direita onde foi feita a punção previamente. É, a funcionada guia lá é feita a retirada do, do, do catéter transeptal para que a gente possa entrar com o catéter de delivery, né, com o catéter de entrega. E aí a gente tira o catéter que tem sete, oito frentes, que é o catéter transeptal, e a gente entra com o catéter de delivery, que varia para o tamanho da prótese. Ele pode ter nove, dez, onze e até treze frentes. Né? Então, para isso é importante que a guia, é, o segundo operador, passa um bom trilho para a guia, notem que a guia está posicionada da veia femoral direita até dentro da veia pulmonar superior esquerda, e o catéter de entrega, e quando ele entra aqui na região inguinal, aqui embaixo, né, na, na virilha, na, na região inguinal, é, é importante fazer um bom trilho para não quincar, né, e aí realmente põe tudo a perder, porque vai ser muito difícil subir. Então, é importante essa entrada do catéter inguinal nessa região. A segunda, a, segunda, a segunda parte da transição do catéter de entrega é quando ele cruza o septo. Também tem que fazer um bom trilho, tem que ser firme, que ele cruza o septo, tem que retornar e com firmeza e com cuidado né, é, para que a gente posicione definitivamente o catéter de entrega dentro, do, dentro do, da cavidade atrial esquerda. O guia ainda está dentro do, do, da, da via pulmonar superior esquerda. Uma vez o catéter é, dentro da via pulmonar esquerda, o que a gente tem que fazer agora é fazer o posicionamento do catéter de entrega dentro do, do apêndice atrial esquerdo e a retirada do dilatador. Então, a gente passa da via pulmonar superior esquerda para dentro do apêndice atrial esquerdo, que está imediatamente abaixo. Então, é uma manobra muito simples de fazer, você recua um pouco e reposiciona o guia, e o guia dentro do apêndice atrial esquerdo, normalmente direcionado, pelo, confirmado pelo ecocardiograma, a gente retira o dilatador, que é muito, ele, é, ele é curtinho, né, no caso do apêndice atrial esquerdo, e posiciona o catéter de entrega dentro, dentro da, da, do apêndice atrial esquerdo. A partir de então é feita uma geografia do apêndice atrás esquerda para a gente escolher a projeção de trabalho. E essa projeção de trabalho, o ideal é aquela que você consiga enxergar bem não só o ósseo, mas o colo do apêndice, que é essa, fase, essa parte inicial do apêndice, e, o, e a parte distal do apêndice, com, como nessa 
como nessa é, filmagem aqui, como nessa geografia feita é, com esse periteio é, sentimental. É, é, é extremamente importante o acompanhamento ecocardiográfico, né, e o, os cortes ecocardiográficos recomendados são a 0, 45, 90 e mais de 100 graus, em torno de 135 graus, para que nós tenhamos imagens, é, imagens é, que con, con, nos, consigam nos ajudar no, na definição do tamanho da prótese. Então, a gente observa aqui nessa imagem, uma imagem com o apêndice atrás esquerdo, a linha vermelha é o ósseo a entrada do apêndice, essa seta ela aponta para além de zona, zona de aterrissagem, e notem que essa, essa, esse círculo escuro, essa bolinha escura aqui, ela é, na verdade, a artéria circunflexa. E nos no dispositivos que não ótimo, em que a gente vai posicionar ao nível do colo, em que a zona de aterrissagem é o nível do colo, a gente posiciona um centímetro para dentro, além da artéria circunflexa. É, a definição do tamanho da prótese é uma, é uma fase muito importante, ela é feita não só na geografia, mas na ecocardiografia também. E a gente é, faz o sizing, o sizing pode ser angiográfico ou ecocardiográfico, o sizing angiográfico a gente é, faz a medida do do do, do, do colo, notem que o colo tem aqui nesse caso é, é 22.4, então o size aqui de 10 a 20% acima do medido, fica em toda uma prótese de 24, 25 ou 26. Tem aqui pode ser feita a medida geográfica, como é feita, é importante ver não só o ósseo, mas o colo do apêndice atrial esquerdo, que a gente possa partir efetivamente para a oclusão do apêndice atrial esquerdo. Para a oclusão do apêndice atrial esquerdo, a gente tem alguns dispositivos possíveis, a Derda ótima, que é uma prótese que trabalha com mais, com mais com profundidade. Né? E temos outras duas próteses, que é a prótese Lambre e a prótese ACP, geração antiga, e Amnod, que é a prótese atual, geração atual, que trabalha, na verdade, com uma zona de aterrissagem no colo do apêndice, não com profundidade, como a ótima faz. É, posicionado o catéter delivery dentro do apêndice atrial esquerdo, note que aqui eu faço um exame de testagem para se, saber se a prótese efetivamente está fixa é do cabo liberador, né, para ela não soltar, né, é, quando eu expus ela para fora do, é, do cateter de entrega, isso já aconteceu comigo uma vez, a gente perde tudo, porque tem que voltar para o início do procedimento, funciona novamente o, o CEP, para que se fixe bem a prótese, a mulete já vem montada, então é uma grande vantagem dessa nova geração, é, desse dispositivo da Abbott. Uma vez implantado a prótese, é importante esse aspecto, né, esse aspecto aqui nesse quadro, principalmente à direita, a gente consegue ver muito bem esse aspecto de pneu amassado do lóbulo, né, a gente vê bem a arte separando o, o lóbulo do disco proximal e o dia com cavidade do disco. Então, esse é um aspecto que se busca quando se implanta a prótese, é, a prótese AMOLED né, da Abbott. Né? Então, é uma prótese que trabalha... É, 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 você não pode ter um, um, um pneu, um pneu é, cheio, nem né? pode ter o um aspecto é, de morango, porque a prótese ou está tá, tá, tá pequena no primeiro caso, ou estaria grande no segundo caso. Então, aqui é um caso de ACP, aquele caso que eu mostrei para vocês, né, o apêndice atrial fibrilando, a prótese já posicionada, note que a gente observa, nesse caso aqui, a prótese posicionada, né, a gente vê o aspecto de pneu amassado, vê bem a arte separando o lóbulo distal do, é, do disco proximal, né, com a concavidade, é importante a gente fazer as análises, é, as análises, é importante fazer uma checagem final, a análise cardiográfica, esse controle final, ecocardiográfico, o importante é a gente ver que, primeiro, que o apêndice atrás esquerdo está ocluído sem vazamento periprótese. Segundo, que está mantida a drenagem da veia pulmonar superior esquerda. Terceiro, que a valomitral está funcionando perfeitamente não há é, e não há compressão da artéria circunflexa. É, confirmado essas quatro, essas quatro checagens feitas pela ecocardiografia, a gente parte para a liberação final. Né? Então, é muito importante que se faça isso tudo para que a gente não tenha é, problemas pós-implante de prótese, de drenagem da via pulmonar, comprometimento, principalmente comprometimento da mitral. Né? Já vi alguns relatos de compressão de artérias complexas, eu particularmente nunca tive, mas é, sempre faço essa, essa checagem, esse passo a passo final, é, antes da, da decisão pela liberação. E principalmente, uma coisa que a gente não quer que fique, que é um vazamento, um líquido, né? periprótese, para que, tem, pra que, tem, pra que o paciente tenha que sofrer é uma nova intervenção. Então, eu, aqui é feito um plug test, né, um plug test bem, bem gentil, né, uma prótese robusta, né, e aí a gente roda o cabo liberador e libera o cabo liberador. Né. Então, aqui a, a liberação final, nota que a prótese ficou bem firme, bem fixa, né, é, não ligue para esse, esse pigtail, esse pigtail aqui estava na, na horta descendente, lógico que ele não está 
é, dentro do coração, ainda na parte anterior aqui, porque está aparecendo na filmagem. É, aqui o, o, o cheque final angiográfico. É, na verdade, algumas pessoas fazem um cheque é, ecocardiográfico, né, a confirmação ecocardiográfica, de que o dispositivo está bem implantado, né, mas eu, particularmente, sempre gosto de ver essa imagem final, que a gente vê toda a cavidade até a esquerda, ver a relação da prótese com a válvula mitral, note que é, aqui na, na angiografia ela não está nem tão perto quanto a gente, quanto a gente é, imagina pela ecocardiografia, e ver um dispositivo bem implantado, acomodado, e principalmente ocluindo totalmente o apêndice até o esquerdo, que é o objetivo do, 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 desse, desse procedimento. Então, assim, para os dispositivos é, que trabalham com o implante no colo, do, do, no colo do, do apêndice é, até o esquerdo, é, essa é a sequência, essa, essa, é uma sequência é, essa é uma sequência tranquila de fazer e acredito que os senhores vão conseguir reproduzir na fase inicial, sem o conselho de alguém mais experiente, mas que depois, é, depois vão conseguir realizar sozinho e que isso aqui talvez seja a porta de entrada para intervenções dentro do apêndice até o esquerdo que cada vez mais vão ficar comuns entre nós, é, cardiologistas intervencionistas. E agradecer, é, mais uma vez, a, a comissão organizadora e muitas graças por sua atenção. atenção. Marcia, thank you very much for your presentation. Alex, do we have any question or comment from the audience? Not at the time, no. But maybe we could ask something or make some comments. I'm sorry, Juan Granada had a patient in the clinic. You can see him very active at this time. I don't know, Leo, if you would like to ask a question. I would like to thank you for your participation. Marcio, your uh, speech was amazing. I can ask you a very short question because we are over time. The closure of the auricle is done more frequently, but this is not something that has gained a lot of um, of use. Why do you think this has not happened yet? Is it because patients do not come to us for a specific re uh, reason? What do you think about that? Thank you very much. I believe that the problem is that part of the population that has to un uh, undergo the closure of the auricle is very small, 8 to 10 percent of patients with anticoagulant. In my opinion, these are patients that had bleeding, so we do not have a specific prothesis to decrease the embolization, but it is used for the patient with bleeding. And another reason is because the patient does not improve in the first phase. We suspend anticoagulation and the patient believes, okay, but I'm, I'm not improving the cardiac failure or in the initial phase. We have a difficulty maybe because of that reason, but there are more indications of closing the auricle, but I think that is the, the reason. If we had a bleeding case, that would be the indication. I believe that is the reason why we have a low indication for this procedure. Okay, thank you very much, Leandro, and I would like to congratulate Proeducar. As always, you have been a, an excellent driver for this, and I think Mayra from Mayo Clinic, Marcio, Kion, and uh, we are very pleased to have you here. Thank you very much for everything. See you.
Good afternoon. We're going to start with the last session of the fellow course that we have had from the morning and it has been a very successful one with amazing presentations. And this last module is, in is about situations in which we are not used to, that are not a very frequent and interventions that are not performed in many places and we call this session All Territories New Interventions. We will have a, a very experienced panel. I give the floor to our dear friend Dr. Jamila Bala, former president of SOLASI, to introduce this, the first speaker. Jamil. Muito boa tarde a todos. Uma grande honra, Leandro, me juntar a você neste módulo de Proeducar. Você um um dos maiores batalhadores pela excelência do Proeducar, sempre se dedicando muito, sempre é, fazendo questão de que esse curso tenha sempre o seu melhor nível. E, então, para mim, uma grande honra estar junto a você aqui com um um time de primeira linha para podermos discutir assuntos mais importantes. O primeiro deles será a denervação renal em hipertensão arterial. The speaker will talk about renal denervation in high blood pressure. Return to the cap lab. We have Humberto Casal, who from Colombia, an interventional cardiologist. Humberto, the floor is yours for the presentation. Renal denervation in the hypertensive patient going to the cath lab. This is the question that we will have to deal with in the following minutes. This is my conflict of interest for the presentation. And when we talk about renal denervation, no, we always have to talk about hypertension. And in these numbers of the National Institute of Statistics, we have from the U.S. in this publication of HAMA, October 2020, how we have been we have uh, been decreasing in the improvement in hypertensive patients and in red from 2014 to 2018. There has been low control in the uh, BP. 55% of hypertensive patients cannot control, do not control the numbers of the BP and this is an epidemic in the control of the hypertension. The concept of sympathectomy, sympathectomy is not uh, anything new and this is from 1952 so we have over 70 years in this on what is the role of sympathectomy regardless of the access to control the BP, and it is how renal denervation with the ups and downs in the last three years has had a, has a spike. These are two of the most important publications that have to do with renal denervation, and we have data and the last evidence that I will be showing. And it is not very easy to design and to execute trials where we assess the interventional management of hypertension. It is always a challenge. You can see how the spiral uh, trial has assessed and provided evidence, and from this part in the of med group. This is very important to take into the account into account hypertensive patients of med because from there we establish the real role of renal denervation, the proof of concept that it reduces or uh, increases the BP. And then we have data that will be published of the on med group on the role of renal denervation together 
with mitigation. Without a doubt, this will be the role it will have in the future. And on the right, we have the Global Simplicity Registry assessing the strengths and durability and safety of the procedure. Durability, time of renal generation as a procedure. Today, this registry we agree on the fact that registries has have some weaknesses, but this one has over 3,000 patients of the study of renal denervation. A true change in renal denervation as a procedure was the simplicity spiral catheter, a multi-electrode catheter, that was a turning point because it allows to do a procedure first of all uh, less depending on the technician it is very easy to place a catheter that self-expands in a spiral manner to treat simultaneously four points in only one minute reducing the time but also allowing to have a, cir um, a circular ablation and we can also treat arteries from 3 to 8 millimeters and this is important for branches as you see here now going to the evidence we're going to see the result of the OFMED study or without medication this was uh, published in the American College of uh, Cardiology and also in Lancet simultaneously. The high level objective was to evaluate hypertensive patients without meds or to interrupt med medicines for a period of three to four weeks. And then the patient was randomized to renal generation or to a sham control. Anyway, the patient was taken to a cath lab. We did a follow-up every two weeks, and these are the results published at the first three months of follow-up. We need to highlight of these patients that they were hypertensive patients that on average they had numbers over 160 millimeters of mercury in systolic, BP and the one, uh, the ambulatory measure, there was over 150. Renal denervation is an interventional process and we need to take into account the safety of the procedure. After one month, there were no major complications and I can show you the three months of follow-up. There was one hypertensive crisis in the denervation group and one uh, stroke in the sham control. It is important to say that there were no elevation of creatinine, liver failure, or vascular complications, or dissection of the renal artery, which is very important. Now the $1 million question. What about the safety results? Which were the results? Now you can see on the right a reduction of uh, BP in the office, the renal generation group in light blue, and then the reductions on ambulatory measurements. We have here the reductions in the office BP of 9.2 millimeters of mercury, and in a 24 hour control, uh, minus 4.7. The sham control did not show a lot of changes. The question that we have here are those reductions in BP of 10 millimeters of mercury significant in the of taken in the office. The most important way to analyze this is going to the evidence. What do the studies show? And we have this classic study published in Lancet 2016, and we can see the meta-analysis shows that this is correlated to a reduction of the office BP of 10 millimeters of mercury and a reduction of the uh, maze of 20% and a relative risk reduction of 27% for stroke 
de alrededor de 28%. And 28% for higher heart rate. These are important points of data and these are being estimated for reductions of 5 millimeters of mercury. But may seem common, but the patient would be greatly benefited, as you know, with a 12% of stroke and 10% of reduction, relative reduction of major of mace. The following point that I want to mention is about the reduction on the left. You have the renal denervation group. The reductions that had to do with the 24-hour control and in light blue at three months of BP decreased uh, during the 24-hour control with the prognostic factor of measuring during uh, the doing measures in the morning and this is the always on method, uh, the, the always on effect we can conclude in the off med that it was proven in this trial of 330 patients that we reduced the, the blood pressure in hypertensive patients without the, the medication both in the office and in 24-hour control and compared to the sham control. These are clinically significant BP reductions and with the effect I mentioned always on for 24 hours in the outpatient control. There were no safety events at the first month or three months of follow-up. This is important to highlight. And it is also important to take into account that the on-med study of renal denervation together with uh, medication is recruiting patients. They are a bit delayed due to the COVID pandemic, but it will be published in a Congress this year, 2021. Some other important evidence we had eight months ago in the TCT Congress has to do with the Global Simplicity Registry, specifically the group of patients, hypertensive uh, patients with resistance. You can see in this group of patients, initially they had 80% of them had BP measures over 160. You can see how at three years of follow-up after undergoing renal denervation over half of them were below 150 and in fact 30 percent below 140. This is very important and that three years of follow-up and these BP reductions are not attributed to an increase in medication because in fact in the study there was a very small difference a not significant reduction but this was attributed to the renal uh, generation procedure. What about this? At three years of follow-up in the office BP, we have reductions of 16 millimeters of mercury and in 24 hours, a reduction of 9.2 millimeters. Of. This, has, this was at three years of follow-up and their patients with the first generation of catheters and a group of over 300 patients with a spiral catheter. This is the evidence, historical evidence from 2012 to current days. The first studies and trials, now we're here in the off-med trial that was completed and published. And I said before that the on-med trial is current underway, recruiting patients. In the future, we will have trials related to related to the preferences of the patients as an interventional procedure and some others that have to do with how we perform the procedure. All of those below, we have the Global Simplicity Registry that will continue to increase the number of patients, and now it's over 3,000 patients. And I can tell you 
answering the question, there is a role of renal denervation in the management in the cath lab for um, hypertension. I can say that based on the three to four years, there is a role, there is a benefit for hypertensive patients who are not controlled, and I believe that there is more to come, and those are the results we're going, we're expecting they are positive for the patients who are hypertensive and not controlling the BP. Thank you for the invitation, and I hope that next year we can have a personal, more personal setting in our halls. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Humberto. This was a very, very good explanation. Ignacio, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, Leandro, I would like to remind you that you can send, uh, the audience can send their questions to be answered through the chat. We're looking at some of the questions that arrived. This one of them is, uh, what's the importance of the distal dinner version for this uh, new technology? Okay, well, that question is important, Ignacio, and uh, like everything in medicine, up until 2015, we may have considered it not being relevant, but from 2015 there were a series of studies, uh, for example, uh, Dr. Malik, uh, uh, that we interventionists know very much, that, that the nerves in the sympathetic system is on the distal level, is when it's closer to the artery lumen. So if we want to guarantee certainty in a certain way to, to treat distally, this, this is what we have to do. And it's especially important because uh, we did, uh, until 2015, we did it up to the bifurcation. So we probably left many nerves untreated. And this is the, important, uh, the importance of doing distally. So there, uh, the criterion is very simple to do. The branch has to, needs to have at least three millimeters. Uma pergunta, Humberto. É, para você que provavelmente acompanhou as vamos chamar as duas fases da denervação renal a fase a fase anterior e esta fase mais atual com novos dispositivos é, você percebe uma facilidade e um resultado melhor é, nesta segunda onda e em termos de repetição de procedimento se você é, tem é, a necessidade de repetir o procedimento pela sua ineficácia. Yes, uh, this is an interesting question. The first part of your question, to answer the first part of your question, this is a much more much friendlier procedure for the operator, and it allows you to perform four ablation points in one minute because it's a multi electrode catheter. And this is uh, different from the flex catheter with a single electrode. So in one minute you can have four points. You don't need to manipulate the catheter because once you remove the, the guide wire, uh, zero cut 14, the, the catheter is, uh, remains in a spiral shape. So it's a shorter procedure, uh, 35 to 40 minutes. Now for the second part of your question. If it is uh, more effective, I think that it's a more effective procedure. And you asked if there was the need to repeat procedures. We have done some patients, at least five, maybe even some of them in Brazil, where if you suspect, because unlike many other interventional procedures here, we don't have anything that in the lab we can tell that uh, we did a de-innervation uh, an appropriate denervation, so this is uh, one of the weaknesses. But if uh, you suspect that of one of the patients may not have responded, and uh, at, at the beginning, 25%, around 25% of the patients weren't responding, if you suspect that, you have the indication of doing it again with this new catheter that allows you to treat branches. We, I can tell you that we have a, the experience of uh, very few patients with a re-intervention and they have evolved uh, very positively. So with, in that case you treat the branch and then you uh, move forward. Okay, we move forward Leandro. 
Yes, it's very clear, Dr. Umberto. Thank you very much. We're going to continue because we have, we're very short on time. Uh, we hope that the renal denervation is as promising as it looks. We're going to go to pulmonary thrombobolic, chronic thrombobolic pulmonary hypertension. We're going to talk to Juan Pablo Escalante. Current clinic, uh, he's going to speak about the current clinical aspects and treatments. He's, uh, he's from Rosario, Argentina, and he is, uh, works in the greater Rosario area in Argentina. Uh, you have the floor, Juan Pablo. Thank you very much for your invitation to participate in this meeting today. In this case, I'm going to be discussing the chronic thrombobolic pulmonary hypertension and the clinic aspects and the current treatments. What we're looking at in the most cases is how the thrombobolic pulmonary uh, from a TB we move to a chronic thrombobolic pulmonary hypertension. So we see this uh, necker-like white material that adheres and it increases the, uh, the pulmonary uh, pressure. So, as we see here in this graph, the incidence and the mortality of uh, acute uh, PTE uh, has increased and we can see that the mortality has uh, diminished. And the problem is the, the incidence of thrombi after the PTE. In several studies we have seen a change uh, from, 15, from uh, 15 to 69 percent of patients with residual thrombi. So there is an impact on the prognosis in there. The pulmonary obstruction, the residual pulmonary obstruction, in the increases uh, the risk of complications for the patient. And for patients with a pulmonary embol uh, embolia. Uh, so we see that we have several issues, the persistent thrombosis that shows uh, symptoms, uh, patients who have uh, bas pulmonary vascular dysfunction, uh, CTPH, we have uh, this very small group in which we are going to focus right now. When we talk about the chronic thrombobolic pulmonary hypertension, uh, sorry, pulmonary disease, we have uh, effort dyspnea, we have a, a an abnormal C VQ scan, then uh, we, when we see that these problems we measure the hypertension in uh, catheterization, some of them don't have pulmonary hypertension. These patients have inability to recruit the vascular bed uh, during the effort, they have surgical, surgical treatment can be suggested in symptomatic cases and we need to check if there are any previous manifestations uh, before the uh, CTBH. So the chronic thrombobolic pulmonary hypertension is a pulmonary hypertension associated to per pulmonary perfusion defects after three, mo three months with PTE, acute PTE with effective anticoagulation. So they have been uh, anti with uh, anticoagulation treatment for three months and we see that uh, 25 to 30 percent of the patients uh, show up without any acute PT episodes known. So this is uh, one of the issues of CTEBH. What is uh, the difference, uh, what's the incidence here? It's around 5 percent. It's in 0 0.5 to 5 percent, and as we can see here in this uh, graph, explained, it's uh, from 0 0.5 percent of all comers with uh, PE, and 3.21 percent of survivors of PE. And we also have the the multifactor uh, mechanism. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, we can see that uh, generates a persistence. Uh, they have a particular genetic predisposition. The, there are certain genes that uh, can favor this uh, development. And we group S, number zero, have a high risk. Infection, inflammation, uh, immunity to uh, antiphospholipides. 
We have a small va small vessel receipts and other risks. And we have established certain predictors of uh, CDBH after PT. And we have uh, on the diagnosis of the PT and afterwards. We have, uh, for example, during the diagnosis, a massive or recurring PT. Uh, a score, uh, there is a prediction score of CTBH, uh, which includes a PT without a cause, a treatment for a hypothyroid uh, disease, a start of the symptoms over two weeks before the diagnosis of PT, dysfunction of the, of the, right, vent of the right ventricle, uh, lack of diabetes without uh, thrombolytics or embolectomy and also a uh, high BP that was present uh, with a diameter of the, the ratio of the diameter of the right and the left ventricles of over one and uh, PAP, uh, PAPs uh, over uh, 60 millimeter, millimeters of mercury. Then after, the, during the follow-up of the PT is a uh, recent dyspnea or worsening of the dyspnea. The other factors are the splenectomy, shunt, uh, VA shunts, chronic, chronic inflammatory diseases, group zero, uh, blood, blood type zero, and hypertrophia. All of these factors can uh, affect the, the CTBH. Which are the symptoms that we're going to see? We're going to see dyspnea in most cases, followed by uh, edema and fatigue. Then we have chest pain in 15% of the patients, and see that 75% have had a PT diagnosis, and the time to diagnosis is around 14 months. We have been seeing the patients for a long time, and uh, we have a <laughs> diagnosis methodology with all of the different types of uh, pulmonary uh, screening tests, the, the Doppler ultrasound, the VQ scan, the fu pulmonary function tests, the thorax scat scan with a contrast uh, medium, and the, the pulmonary arteriography and right uh, catheterization. So this, uh, and also, of course, we need to check for the symptoms. About the approach, we can uh, separate three uh, points you suspect the are based on the the echocardiogram or the the VQ scan we can confirm uh, using a, a right uh, side coronary catheterization and then geography pulmonary and geography and we can assess the risk with the hemodynamics and comor comorbidities the the CDS diagnostic, diagnostic algorithm has been uh, has been suggested. First, we decide to uh, after we get the diagnosis, we anticoagulate. We follow up for three to six months. From then on, if we don't have dyspnea or functional limitation, then uh, we need to uh, assess if they have risk factors like and define the anticoagulation, the prophylaxis, and check on symptoms. But if they have dyspnea we should uh, do an echocardiogram. It's based on the, the fu pulmonary function. We can uh, check for, uh, again, for the VP VQ scan and check if we have a perfusion or ventilation defects. We can uh, check, ask for, a, we can check the pro-BMP. We can see the risk factors. Uh, if we have perfusion or ventilation, we may send them to a reference for center for CTPH. So uh, we need to check if we have a, a chronic uh, thrombo, uh, thrombobolic pulmonary disease or, or if it is uh, high, hypertension. So we need to check if we have the, we can go to a balloon angioplasty or medical treatment. The first we need to, that depends on the localization of the, the location of the, the lesions. We need to check in this graph that if the lesions are more proximal, we may go with the, we have a better reach and as we go into the microvasculature, the medical treatment is the most appropriate in this sense. The algorithm tells us that uh, patients with a uh, diagnosed CDPH diagnosis, they need to continue lifelong anticoagulation they need to be assessed by the 
the CTPH team to see if they are uh, operable or non-operable. If they are, the treatment of choice is the endartectomy, endartectomy sorry. And we need to check if there is a persistent or recurrent symptomatic pulmonary hypertension to see if we need to re-do uh, the surgery. In this register record, we can see the, the survival after the diagnosis. This is a prospective uh, multicenter registry for people who receive medical treatment and those that haven't on the right, and the surgery, the ones who underwent surgery and the ones that didn't on the left. Now we can see that the survival is better for people who receive treatment. And uh, thromboendotorectomy uh, is the only uh, potentially cure, curing treatment for, uh, for hypertension. The candidates are people who have uh, resistance over 300 dinas. Uh, we ha they have to have uh, surgical accessibility and no comorbidities. Here we have the Jameson classification. This is a... Uh, here we can uh, see the location of the thrombi and go into more distal portions as we see in type 2, type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 and uh, the surgery is more important maybe in type 1 and type 2. Mortality is uh, closely related to the, the resistance uh, so and to the RVP and this is a risk then we need to have a higher risk as we see in the chart. The San Diego is the center with the most, the, the largest number of cases, 306,600, 6, with a median age of 53, not differentiated on sex, and we had uh, the results that we saw on the slide. So there are some patients who are not candidates of the endo surgical endotorectomy. 20 to 40 percent of patients are deemed inoperable, and uh, the new diagnosis: 36 percent of the patients were considered inoperable. So, almost half, uh, because of uh, distal disease or inaccessible, could be due to comor comorbidities. Uh, 30 percent or imbalance between the PVR and the amount of visible obstructions, or PVR. Uh, over uh, 1500 and age or other reasons like refusing uh, surgery. Now we can see which is the medical treatment. About the medical treatment, we have four great, four large studies. Uh, there's uh, actually only one large one. The largest is chest one, 261 patients with uh, Riosiguat and placebo over 16 weeks. And it increased, it increased the treatment effect was uh, 46 plus 46 M uh, and patients, uh, some patients were inoperable. And the second uh, study, it's larger studies, the benefit, the merit, sorry, uh, the, they assessed 80 patients, uh, Masitentan, after uh, for 24 weeks. They saw that uh, the PVR were uh, at week 16 was. Uh, we had a better 34% plus. So to conclude, the incidence and the prevalence of the, uh, the CTPH is not known. It, we estimated 3 to 4%, and up to 30% of the cases have don't have the history of acute uh, PT. But uh, CTPH could appear as an acute PT. We, might, we may have a persistent dyspnea or a new, new onset after three to six months of acute PT and early diagnosis is associated to a, a smaller mortality. The, the VQ scan is uh, the gold standard for diagnosis and this is the only uh, cause of pulmonary hypertension where we could get curation, uh, healing through angioplasty or surgery. Thank you very much. Welcome, thank you very much for the organizers of the committee for this invitation. I would like to talk about hemodynamics and pulmonary angiography. I will try to go from diagnosis to treatment in hemodynamics in pulmonary angiography. And first of all, we have to understand that the venous thrombolic disease includes the DVT, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary embolism and 
the pulmonary uh, chronic thromboembolic disease. This corresponds to a, a, a good, uh, the same disease. This is also part of how we're going to treat this disease. The most important thing we need to have is a clinical suspicion and then have a echocardiogram, suspect whether the patient has hypertension signs and after that we do a VQ scan in case there is perfusion or mismatch with the uh, respiratory ventilation. There we have a diagnosis of the disease and these are two very important points. The most important part is that these are, we need to have centers with experience with this and also in the thromboembolic chronic disease. And to complete with the evaluation of these patients, we need to perform an angio CT and a catheter. It is mandatory for all of the patients and a pulmonary angiography. So, now that we did the diagnosis, what do we have here? We have four options in the arterectomy, surgical option, the drug treatment, angiography with balloon and combined treatment, plus angioplasty. How do we make the decision of how, of what to choose? The most important part, the most important concept I want to share with you is that the decision about the diagnosis and treatment is made by different teams. It is, it has to be done by a uh, team with experience in this pathology, specialists in surgery, hemodynamics, imaging, now, to be able to define what is better for our patient, we need to validate the diagnosis, stratify the risk of the patient, and to think whether the patient can undergo surgery or not. To be able to, to make this decision, to comply with these pillars, we need to do a catheterization on the right and the pulmonary angiography. Right candidatory is mandatory for treatment, so all the patients with suspicion of pulmonary problems need to have a right uh, catheterization. It also allows to uh, evaluate the feasibility. We need to calculate the RBP. It has low morbidity with experimental technicians and in some procedures we can add a cine coronariography in patients over 45 years of age. This procedure must follow a method. When we measure the pressure, we cannot miss anyone. We need to have the pulmonary artery and every the left, the right ventricle, the systemic one. We will have this as a prognosis for the patients. We need to calculate the cardiac index. We cannot end without looking at the cardiac index and we cannot end the procedure without doing the vascular and systemic resistance pulmonary and vascular resistance. It is a good practice and I would like, to, I like doing that, doing pulse oximetries. Sometimes we have seen a shunt and we could diagnose that in the catheterization. I would like to show these images because sometimes some centers do, the, do it on the right and sometimes the patient may have a complex anatomy so you need to, uh, to know what to do. What we have to do is a precapillary hypertension calculation. Following with diagnosis, we need to do a pulmonary angiography. It continues to be the gold standard in all the guidelines. A pigtail of six French or seven French, an injecting pump. No subtraction technique. It is important to see in the dynamic images. We do forced inspiration and we must perform three views of each of them. This is an example of the patient I showed before where we have multiple defects of perfusion both in the medium lobe of the right lung, in the infralateral segments of the right lung, in the whole uh, left lung, the upper lobe, the segments of the lingula and the micro posterior segments of the left lung. In these images, 
it's very easy to identify which, which type of lesions we're going to have. And this is very helpful because the types we can have in the angio will uh, be useful to see which patients can be benefited from the pulmonary angioplasty. Those patients that have a ring type are the ones benefited the most. This is why we need, when we are planning for the therapy, we see the diagnosis, the, we assess the risk and the operability, and to do a right catheterization and a pulmonary angiography. Surgery is the gold standard to treat this disease. This proved to reduce mortality and to improve clinically the symptoms of the patient. However, not all the patients can undergo surgery. This is very important to notice. The ones that cannot undergo surgery because we need to go to a different technique. More than 40% of patients that are assessed and considered for surgery or treatment of these diseases are, cannot undergo surgery, so we have, we as a team have to make a decision on what to choose as the best alternative for patients who are not candidate to surgery. We have the drug treatment, we use Rio CWAT that has proven clinic and hemodynamic improvements in these patients and we also have ABAP. We need to understand what we are treating with uh, pulmonary angioplasty. These types of lesions do not have to do with the lesions of the coronary disease or the vascular disease. This vessel, as you can see in the OCT, what we're going to treat is fibrous parts. If there is a thrombus that became a fibrous tract within the, uh, the vessel, what we're going to do is to break them. This procedure was described in 2001, where the first series of cases was published and there was efficacy with a drop in their pulmonary uh, pressure and improvement in the six minute walk. However, there was a high rate of adverse events. So we spent seven, uh, 10 years to evaluate the results. Japanese groups started studying more patients. We have some meta-analysis and systematic analysis and we can see an improvement of 26% in the six minute walk a reduction of 80% of PNP and a reaction of 53% in the in the vascular pulmonary procedure. Patients who cannot undergo surgery do worse in the long term and patients who undergo angioplasty with balloon had a significant uh, survival rate than those who do not undergo the, the procedure. A meta-analysis was published and we can see a reduction of the pulmonary BP, of the RBP, and an improvement, and a general improvement. These patients undergo surgery and then they develop pulmonary hypertension or continue with pulmonary hypertension. Angioplasty, pulmonary angioplasty has proven to be beneficial from the hemodynamic and systemic point of view. And the same happens with the combined treatment with Riosiwat plus ABP. How do we do a pulmonary angioplasty? We need to take this into account. First of all, selecting the patient with, uh, within the team. You need to prepare the patient. These may be long procedures with multiple interventions and you need to have the ECMO available. You need to prepare the procedure to teamwork, surgery, recovery, anesthesia, anticoagulation, plan the procedure fusion to fuse the images of VQ scan, angel CT, decide the, on the lesion, target lesions, the use of the materials, and then the recovery of the patient, take into account that these are not the common patient. We need to prepare the team, the recovery team, and be ahead of restriction of fluids. What, how do I do the procedure? Uh, femoral venous puncture with seven French. Heparinization complete. Selective pulmonary angiography with catheter guide to see which uh, lesions I'm going to treat to cross the lesion with the wire 0 0.014 BMW on, and what is important that we, is that we dilate with ascending 
uh, size balloons until we have reached 90% of the diameter of the vessel. To end with the selective angiography, some cases I can see, you can see here in this uh, lympholateral lobule, we have seen a subtotal procedure here and after that. I can show you how we uh, deobstructed de this vessel and in what improves is the perfusion of this pulmonary segment and the venous return as well. Here we saw that the inf medium and inferior part of this low had a lot of compromise, uh, a lot of effect. It was affected, that region was very affected in this branch as well, and we can see two big branches of the inferior uh, lobe of the lung. This is the anterior medial area of the medium lobe. We see the two branches in the angioplasty. This is a different case. In here you can see lesions, uh, web-type lesions of the left lung, and then the angioplasty, how it improves the filling effect in the branch and also the perfusion of the segments treated, treated and the venous return. You can see the inferomedial branch of the left lung. You can see web type lesions in the proximal segment. We did an angioplasty with the balloon of the same branch and you can see how it feels better. And I also highlight the venous return. A different example of a lateral lobe of the lingula, we perform an balloon angioplasty and we can see how the reperfusion improves. In our experience, we started with the program in 2015. Until last year, we had 12 patients with 21 angioplasties being performed. In most of 50% um, of the patients could not undergo surgery. We have 42% of residual hyper pulmonary hypertension. 50% received RIOSIGUAT and the results were similar to those of the European registries, a reduction of 25% of the pressure in the pulmonary artery, a 51% reduction of the, uh, the PBR, and we did not have great complications. We had some minor vascular complications that we could solve and a reperfusion that was not very significant. So to summarize, we need to take into account that this pathology can have fibrotic alterations of the lower, lower arteries, fibrotic alteration of the segmentary arteries, or affectation of microvascular or pulmonary vasculopathy. This will help us know what to do as, as, as regards to treatment, thrombarterectomy, pulmonary, or, uh, thrombarterectomy, pulmonary angioplasty, and pharmacological treatment. These are adjuvant therapies. The, one may be the one, option of choice, but the angioplasty, pulmonary angioplasty or drug treatment have proven to be effective in patients after the pulmonary thrombarterectomy or those who cannot undergo surgery. I hope this talk has been useful to you. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pablo. He's our colleague from Hemodynamics in Buenos Aires, uh, the Vascular Institute of Buenos Aires, and has done plenty of work. And now we're going to move from Buenos Aires, from the cold of Buenos Aires to the heat of the of Bahia. And we're going to be hearing Fabio Solano with his experience in inter the endovascular treatment of CTPH. Fabio works in, uh, in the Hospital Alianza and uh, cardiopulmonar San Rafael and he's going to he was able to offer this treatment in several institutions 
in Salvador. And afterwards, we will have the opportunity to do some comments and questions about uh, pulmonary circulation and its treatment. Now, let's see Fabio's presentation. Saudações a todos. Eu sou Fabio Solano e vamos falar de um pouco de angioplastia pulmonar para o tratamento endovascular de pacientes com hipertensão pulmonar por uma embólica crônica. Alguns conceitos básicos e alguns tips and tricks. Não tenho nenhum conflito de interesse acerca dessa apresentação. Bom, esse é o nosso paciente com hipertensão pulmonar por uma embólica crônica. O objetivo do nosso tratamento é, é aliviar a hipertensão pulmonar desse paciente, reduzir a resistência vascular pulmonar, diminuir a progressão para a insuficiência cardíaca direita, diminuindo os sintomas e melhorando a qualidade de vida. Sabemos que uh, esses pacientes evoluem com a insuficiência cardíaca direita em morte, se nenhum tratamento intervencionista for realizado, e sabemos que as evidências, as maiores evidências de registros apontam que a curva de sobrevida melhora e se sustenta a longo prazo quando esses pacientes são submetidos à cirurgia de endarterectomia. Contudo, um percentual significativo desses pacientes, e nos maiores registros isso gira em torno de 40% deles, podendo variar de centro para centro, é considerado inoperável e, na maioria das vezes, por um padrão de doença é, predominantemente mais distal, com acometimento segmentar e subsegmentar, que torna o acesso do cirurgião mais difícil. Para esses pacientes considerados inoperáveis, o tratamento medicamentoso ou a angioplastia pulmonar, ou ambos, pode ser ofertado. A angioplastia pulmonar, então, consiste em se realizar a desobstrução dessas é, é, obstruções por trombos organizados, traves de fibrose, desfazer essas, essas fibroses, liberando o fluxo sanguíneo local e permitindo aí a melhor perfusão dos segmentos pulmonares. Apesar de conceitualmente simples, a angioplastia pulmonar ela é de execução mais difícil e extremamente relacionada a uma curva de aprendizado longa Uh, da qual depende os bons resultados e estão associados, às vezes, complicações. Para termos, então, resultados satisfatórios, é fundamental que façamos um processo seletivo adequado dos pacientes. Uh, isso geralmente passa pela união dos exames de imagem basais, como a angiografia, a, o cateterismo cardíaco, a angiotomografia, a cintilografia pulmonar, e aliado a injeções uh, de contraste uh, por cateterização seletiva dos ramos pulmonares para se identificar as lesões alvos para a angioplastia pulmonar. Se ainda assim nesse processo uh, as lesões uh, não forem adequadamente identificadas, podemos lançar mão de outras ferramentas como a imagem intravascular e uh, o gradiente de pressão intravascular. Esse é um exemplo da cintilografia pulmonar que devemos ter mais familiaridade, onde vemos aí diversos defeitos de perfusão pulmonar e aí associamos a angiografia pulmonar uh, para identificar as maiores áreas de, de, de defeito perfusional e direcionar nossas intervenções para aqueles ramos. Uh, aqui vemos um exemplo disso, uma angiografia uh, mostrando diversas obstruções uh, bilaterais e predominantemente segmentares e subsegmentares, esse paciente foi para angioplastia pulmonar. A angiografia eh, e as injeções seletivas de contraste também ajudam a caracterizar melhor as lesões obstrutivas uh, que deverão ser tratadas e existem lesões típicas de uh, uh, hipertensão pulmonar tromembólica crônica, algumas de maior risco, outras de menor risco para serem submetidas à angioplastia. Essas aqui são lesões de menor risco, né, avaliadas aí pelo grupo de Okayama, no Japão. Uh, são lesões de tipo uh, estenose focal, lesões uh, uh, associadas a, a teias, né, chamadas em inglês webs ou fendas, são traves de fibrose, às vezes lesões suboclusivas, é, todas elas relacionadas a uma taxa de sucesso mais alta e menor risco de complicações durante as angioplastias. Por outro lado, existem outras lesões que têm um risco maior de complicações e uma taxa de sucesso menor, que são oclusões totais, principalmente com esse aspecto é, em fundo cego, ou chamadas pouch, 
e lesões uh, mais distais uh, que uh, comprometem uh, mais uh, regiões mais subsegmentares ou mais além e estão associadas a uma tortuosidade vascular significativa e um risco maior de complicações. Bom, esse é um exemplo aqui de uma imagem intravascular com a tomografia de coerência ótica que podemos utilizar também para identificar essas obstruções, caso a angiografia e a tomografia não nos auxiliem tanto. E vemos aqui o, o, a característica típica no corte transversal dessas traves de fibrose dos trombos organizados e o papel da angioplastia é romper essas traves de fibrose, liberando o fluxo sanguíneo local. Podemos também utilizar é, a a medida do gradiente de pressão intravascular através do pressure wire, né, o, o, os fios de transdutores de pressão que utilizamos é, nas coronárias também, e isso para tentar identificar através de um gradiente de pressão, como a gente pode ver aqui nesse caso, ah, onde está exatamente a lesão obstrutiva, que muitas vezes não é clara a geografia, principalmente para quem está começando, e auxiliar a gente e é, é, a guiar o nosso local de intervenção. Vejam aí a melhora do gradiente de pressão após a angioplastia, como a gente pode ver aqui. Uh, mas essas ferramentas são é, utilizadas apenas na minoria dos pacientes. Na, na sua grande maioria, nós usamos mesmo os exames basais, como a tomografia e as angiografias é, não seletivas e por injeção seletiva de contraste, como nós vimos nesse exemplo, Uh, mostrando aí uma boa correlação entre as imagens tomográficas e a geografia seletiva. Uh, a tomografia também nos auxilia uh, em questões anatômicas, para a escolha de catéter, e uh, uh, aliado à geografia, a gente pode ver, apreciar aí a, a redução de fluxo sanguíneo que é, se tem é, com lesões obstrutivas graves como essas que nós estamos vendo. E essa medida do fluxo é, pulmonar, é, ela foi graduada por um grupo japonês e foi publicada né, em uma, uma classificação que vai de 0 a 3, semelhante à classificação do time para as coronárias, onde o grau zero é a ausência ou quase total ou total de, de, de perfusão distal. O grau 1 um, a gente tem uma perfusão parcial, mas não vê ainda retorno venoso. O grau 2 a gente tem a perfusão total, mas com um retorno venoso lento. Uh, e o grau 3 é a perfusão arterial completa, ou aquele blush tecidual e um retorno venoso bem rápido. Aqui nós vemos um exemplo disso, né, um, um ramo para o lobo superior, com dois subramos, onde vemos lesões é, é, aqui mais claras, em teias, difíceis de serem visualizadas onde fizemos angioplastias com balões 2 por, por 20 de comprimento, e aqui uh, uh, o resultado imediato, que na fotografia não parece ter muita diferença, mas quando avaliamos isso uh, uh, em cine, vemos que existe uma, uma melhora significativa do fluxo pulmonar antes e depois da angioplastia, com o aparecimento do blush, um borramento tecidual, e uh, um retorno venoso imediato, como a gente pode comparar no, no baseline e depois da angioplastia. Aqui outro exemplo uh, de angioplastia pulmonar em um ramo do, do lobo inferior direito, onde vemos na ponta do catéter aí uma, uma, uma lesão em teia e um fluxo distal reduzido, provavelmente aí grau 2, a gente vê um retorno venoso muito lentificado, nesse caso utilizamos um balão 4 por 20, e depois da angioplastia tivemos aí a melhora desse fluxo, tanto anterógrado quanto do retorno venoso, que passa a ser imediato. Então, isso é um parâmetro que nós temos que estar sempre avaliando para decidir iniciar a angioplastia e, ver, e avaliar quando terminar também. E a angioplastia é um procedimento estadiado, não só do ponto de vista de várias sessões, onde é, é, vários ramos são tratados gradativamente, Uh, e são muitos ramos, por isso são necessários um, um número variado de sessões, em torno de três a cinco ou seis ou até mais sessões. E do ponto de vista também do estadiamento da abertura dessas obstruções, que deve ser, em boa parte dos casos, gradual, para se evitar complicações como a lesão de reperfusão eh, associada à abertura eh, eh, desses vasos e eh, lesão local pulmonar. 
Então, uh, nós vemos nesse exemplo uma, uma, um vaso para o, o segmento é, é, anterior do lobo inferior direito, vemos que ele está praticamente obstruído, por, com, quase que por completo, ultrapassamos ele com fio guia de, de trabalho habitual, né, e começamos a fazer as primeiras dilatações com do, é, balões 2 por 20 nos diversos subramos e temos esse resultado aí intermediário uh, depois da primeira intervenção nesse subramo decidimos parar por aí para reabordá-lo numa sessão subsequente depois que já já o paciente já tiver alguma melhora hemodinâmica uh, numa sessão subsequente Reabordamos esse ramo, vemos que o resultado é, se mantinha igual, podemos observar já alguma, algum alargamento espontâneo desse ramo, algum remodelamento positivo, e isso aí favorece a utilização de balões de tamanho maior, maiores, como foi uh, usado nesse caso, um balão de tamanho 4 por 20. Isso aí possibilita a, 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 o término da angioplastia nesse, nesse ramo, e o restabelecimento de um fluxo aí, grau 3, de padrão normal, com retorno venoso imediato. Esse resultado foi avaliado também depois de um segmento tardio, e vejam aí o, o alargamento espontâneo desse vaso uh, uh, e, o, e o fluxo mantido, sem qualquer necessidade de uso de stents, que é também outra característica desse procedimento, não é necessário usar stents. A, a angioplastia está associada a muitas complicações que podem ocorrer durante o procedimento, como as lesões vasculares uh, associadas ao uso de catéter, dos balões, posicionamento do fio guia, injeção por contraste, né, como as perfurações, dissecções, uh, que podem ter manifestações clínicas variadas na sala de hemodinâmica. E as, e as complicações que podem ocorrer depois do procedimento, geralmente com o aparecimento 12, 24 até 48 horas depois, como a lesão pulmonar de reperfusão, né? que é uma lesão associada a, aos segmentos tratados, localizada nos segmentos que foram abordados, e que pode estar associada à manipulação dos dispositivos nesse segmento, é, é, além de, de, um, de, da própria reperfusão em si. As repercussões clínicas também são, são variadas e, por essa razão, nós devemos manter os pacientes em observação na UTI por um período de, de pelo menos 24 a 48 horas uh, 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 sob vigilância por conta da possibilidade de ocorrência desse, desse, dessa complicação, cujo tratamento geralmente é só apenas de suporte. Aqui um exemplo de, de uma, uma perfuração uh, importante. Né, associada aí à tentativa de abertura de um vaso com oclusão total, então vejo uma lesão de alto risco, né, tipo D, eu utilizei um microcateta e um fio guia de, de CTO, de oclusão crônica, achei que estava no caminho correto e uh, utilizei aí um balão uh, bem pequeno né, para, para uh, avaliar se estava realmente no caminho correto, e aí o que tivemos foi essa imagem de perfuração e a paciente começando a ter hemoptise imediatamente. É, sempre que isso acontece, devemos é, ocluir rapidamente aquele pertuito, é, é, tiramos o, 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 o balãozinho pequeno de um e meio, passamos um balão maior de quatro para ocluir todo o ramo, todo o fluxo sanguíneo, mantivemos essa oclusão prolongada enquanto preparávamos o material para é, embolização, caso fosse necessário. Mas só a oclusão, por tempo prolongado, foi suficiente para selar a perfuração e melhorar a clínica da paciente. Aqui é outro exemplo de uma perfuração menor, né, numa tentativa de angioplastia, e numa angioplastia, aliás, de, uma, de um ramo para o superior. Vemos aqui na ponta do catéter essa lesão mais esbranquiçada, uma lesão inteira. Uh, e uh, que precisava ser tratada com redução do fluxo distal. E aí vemos uma coisa que acontece muito frequentemente na angioplastia, que é esse vai e vem do material. Uh, e isso ocorre pela, pela grande área cardíaca do, de, de, desses pacientes. Uh, e às vezes é difícil estabilizar o material e, e esse vai e vem dificulta o procedimento e pode aumentar o risco. Nós começamos fazendo a angioplastia dessa lesão com o balão 420, 
Depois eu, eu senti necessidade de usar um balão maior, de tamanho 5, só que eu, eu só dispunha a mão um balão 5 por 15 ou 12, se não me engano. E esse comprimento mais curto me dificultou o posicionamento adequado, que aí causou ainda mais um vai e vem dos dispositivos, uma oscilação grande e resultou num avanço do, do fio guia muito para a circulação distal que levou a uma perfuração. Então vejam aí aquela mancha de contraste uh, 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 no pulmão, mas uh, felizmente não foi uma perfuração tão grave, o paciente teve alguns episódios de hemoptise e uh, não teve uh, uh, maiores repercussões clínicas, a, a clínica dele foi autolimitada. Então, não avançar muito o fio guia para a circulação de estalo, isso é muito importante, e evitar balões muito curtos, sempre preferir balões com um comprimento de pelo menos 20 milímetros. Outra, outros dispositivos que podem ser usados também para ajudar a estabilizar, a estabilizar todo o seu sistema de angioplastia, é uma bainha longa, que sempre que possível utilizar, com um ponta reta, aramada, uma bainha, bainha que possa ser é, 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 colocada na, 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 no ramo pulmonar principal, por onde vamos aí introduzir nossos catéteres guias, que ajuda a estabilizar o sistema e permite também a troca de catéteres, caso seja necessário. Com relação aos catéteres, nós usamos, a maioria das vezes, multiple pose, também usamos com alguma frequência o JRs e alguns outros tipos de catéter em algumas situações mais específicas. Nossos balões, como eu comentei, uh, sempre uh, com comprimento de 20 milímetros, pelo menos, uh, e geralmente balões de 2 a 4 milímetros resolvem a situação, mas se o vaso, obviamente, for muito maior do que 4, a gente tem que aumentar o diâmetro dos balões, mas sempre mantendo uma relação balão pelo vaso menor que 1, um, né? porque a gente quer só uh, romper as traves de fibrose, a gente não quer dilatar o vaso em si, e mantendo uma relação menor do que um, diminui o risco de perfuração de secção vascular. Nossos fios guias, geralmente, utilizar fios guias workhorse, na maioria das vezes, evitar fios guias hidrofílicos, que tem mais propensão a, a complicações vasculares. Vez ou outra, gosto de utilizar fios intermediate, em situações muito específicas, fios de CTO. Uh, tem sempre que manter um material de backup, como microcatéter, uh, e material para embolização, caso seja necessário. Uh, e, vez ou outra, um catéter de extensão, como o Godzilla ou o Guideliner, para atingir pontos mais distais, que é, muitas vezes são difíceis de atingir somente com catéter guia. Então, minhas mensagens finais seriam de que a, a, a seleção dos pacientes para a angioplastia pulmonar deve ser baseada numa abordagem multimodal, utilizando todos os exames que ele dispõe. Uh, é uma abordagem é, estadiada, limitando os balões, o tamanho dos balões nas sessões iniciais e completando as dilatações nas sessões subsequentes, depois daquele remodelamento vascular espontâneo que geralmente ocorre. Uh, limitar o tamanho dos balões em relação ao diâmetro do vaso, se necessário guiar essa escolha dos balões por imagem intravascular, mas isso é pouco frequente uh, de ser necessário. Uh, ter um cuidado com o posicionamento adequado do fio guia, evitar avançar muito esse fio guia guia, evitar lesões de maior risco, como as oclusões totais, as lesões muito tortuosas e digitais, e ter respeito, obviamente, pela curva de aprendizado, para que uh, esses pacientes possam ter uma boa evolução. Obrigado a todos. Very good. Uh, all three presentations that we've had. They have covered all of our expectations. Uh, we have a few minutes to uh, talk about this uh, topic and I would like to start on the clinical part because we are a little bit farther away and I would like to ask uh, Dr. Escalante what does he think about the medical treatment for these kinds of patients. Hello, good afternoon everyone. Thank you. Leandro, for your question, the medical treatment in this case uh, is not as central as in the rest of cardiology. In some cases we have the surgery as a treatment of choice, as my colleagues have explained, followed by the angioplasty and uh, medical treatment. So they get uh, treatment in spite of the pulmonary intervention and uh, 
most studies uh, have the angioplasty uh, with medical treatment or for those who cannot uh, cannot be solved with angioplasty treatment. So that's the role for those patients. Those are the patients that are and that are subjected to medical treatment. There's a question if it, if it is convenient uh, to treat patients before surgery and uh, there are studies that uh, we only get the we only delay surgery is not not effective at all okay thank you perfect Juan Pablo thank you and moving to Ignacio to see the questions from the audience yes some of the questions that uh, started uh, Coming up, since we're talking about medical treatment, one of the questions is uh, for Dr. Solano: If the patients, if there's a, an important reduction in the pulmonary hypertension, and if uh, you use any pulmonary vasodilators. If I may uh, take just a, ha, to make a comment, I think that uh, pulmonary angioplasty uh, treatment is uh, the treatment of, cho of choice. And we have the Ray study ongoing, in which uh, we try the, the treatment with Rio Siguat for the angioplasty, and another one uh, after the angioplasty. And I think that. Uh, in this, uh, this trial, we've had some, uh, some provisional results, intermediate results, in which we found that it was useful to have the treatment after the angioplasty, and I'm convinced that this is a good drug to use as, uh, to help the angioplasty. As I showed you in our series, we have 50% of, uh, for patients under treatment with VOC1, and we maintained the, the treatment. Some of them, uh, for some of them, we reduced the dosage, but we did not uh, uh, suspend the, the drug for any of them. I don't know if Fabio has uh, any comments about his uh, his uh, regular practice with Rio Siguat. As you mentioned, Juan Pablo, the surgery, the, the treatment only increased the delay of the surgery, but uh, so, but angioplasty could be a good option. Uh, Pablo, eu acho que ainda é uma questão controversa. Uh, não temos uh, parâmetros uh, bem objetivos de quando deveríamos, quando podemos suspender uma medicação conforme o resultado da angioplastia. Mas uh, eu pessoalmente acredito que se, se a redução da pressão pulmonar for próxima a valores considerados como normal para a idade né, do paciente, eu acho que é possível se tentar a suspensão da droga. Mas, eh, na nossa casuística, isso tem sido pouco frequente, a não ser em casos em que não não, não dispomos de riociguate, que é a droga específica, mas de sim de sidenafil, nós já suspendemos por alguma vez. Mas é uma questão ainda não muito padronizada, não muito bem estabelecida. Do you have anything to add, Juan Pablo, on this topic? Yes, I agree with what they have said. Many times it's difficult to uh, suspend the medication uh, with CTBH. Uh, we had uh, some cases where we've had a high risk of the patient. So de-escalating the treatment or removing the treatment, sometimes it could affect the survival, right? So we need to be sure that we have solved the pulmonary hy the hypertension. So, in surgery, we have a percentage, a normal percentage of patients that, for which it's not uh, useful. We have discussed the medical treatment before surgery, and in the case of angioplasty, it uh, would the the recommendation is to be. Uh, monitoring the patient very closely if uh, um, be very convinced before suspending the medication. One of the questions that we could do is uh, one, when is the pulmonary angioplasty finished? 
This is a procedure that is done in steps and uh, just suggest several sessions and we have the concept that uh, the, the surgery cures and not the angioplasty and there's some, uh, some effects, some consequences that some, uh, there are some treatments that have started with a curative goal in which we, you would go and try to fix all of the lesions to uh, normalize the, the, the pulmonary uh, hypertension so I don't know if it's your uh, practice we would not do that uh, by opening everything but we would go to the most important vessels and to try to improve the functional class and uh, the pulmonary pressure Sim, isso é o que nós fazemos também, Pablo. É, tentamos tratar os, os principais ramos acometidos, mas se é possível, em algum cenário anatômico mais favorável, a nosso objetivo é tratar o maior número de ramos que for possível para a, uma redução cada vez maior da pressão arterial pulmonar, que isso tem impacto prognóstico. Né? Agora, quando parar, isso também ainda não está bem estabelecido, Isso varia de centro para centro, de, conforme a experiência do, do operador e conforme também a, a melhoria clínica do paciente. Então, alguns pacientes, para alguns pacientes, uma melhora clínica funcional importante, é, ter a possibilidade de sair do uso do oxigênio, aí pode já ser suficiente se você pesar o risco-benefício de con continuar fazendo sessões de angioplastia. Isso a gente tem que individualizar bastante. Leandro, permitir uma pequena uh, um comentário, uma pergunta para colegas que têm tanta vivência em hipertensão pulmonar e em circulação pulmonar, se é, alguém tem vivência, se agrega ao laboratório de hemodinâmica alguma prova de esforço para clarificar graus de hipertensão pulmonar e sintomas, muitas vezes, é, não esclarecidos e ocultos de patologias pulmonares. Se algum deles tem experiência, sem fugir muito do tema, mas creio que pode ser interessante para é, nós todos, cardiologistas intervencionistas. É, aí, Juan Pablo... Uh, yes, I was just about to answer. Uh, in the meetings that we do every four to five years in pulmonary interventions, the, the effort is... Uh, we haven't had any any studies to, to uh, go into standardization. Because in effort we can take a measurement and that would be... Uh, pulmonary hypertension in effort to see and to see symptoms we use the, the VARTS test and, and we also use the pulmonary test with the oxygen consumption which are very useful to uh, unmask the symptoms but if we have a patient with a pulmonary hypertension the hypertension values or the persistence is when the patient has uh, heavy symptoms, then uh, they would they would be very difficult for them to be asymptomatic and have uh, residual high pressure. But but uh, you could uh, see the residual uh, pressure, like uh, you would see signs like uh, oxygen slow, carbon dioxide, and maybe we go somewhere more advanced than uh, what the reference that we get from the pulmonary pressure. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Pablo. Uh, very good questions. Uh, the question was made by a hemodynamics expert and uh, the answer by a clinician. Now we have just uh, enough time to move to the next talk. So I would like to thank all the, the discussion we had before. Next one is going to be Ricardo Constantini, the dynamics expert from the University Hospital in Buenos Aires. And he's going to talk to us about uh, how to approach complex venous thrombosis, the types of treatments. 
Uh, take it away. Good morning, my name is Ricardo Costantini. I'm an interventionist, uh, interventional cardiologist from the Hospital Universitario Austral, and my talk is about how to address the how to approach complex venous thrombosis, types of treatments, and some education cases. The, one of the cases that we're going to talk is the, the thromboembolism is uh, common with a uh, high incidence. It's one of the most uh, feared of the, the pulmonary embolism and it will occur if untreated in as many as 40% of all uh, proximal DVT and 5 to 8% of patients uh, experience a second PE episode. So, and even if we're going to uh, work on thrombosis on uh, large veins in uh, the upper uh, the upper limbs, uh, these thrombosis are mostly caused in secondary thrombosis uh, due to devices or catheter, catheters or due to uh, cancer-related issues. Uh, some of the there are different uh, reasons, different uh, dogs say. Uh, the different uh, routes that uh, lead to uh, localized inflammation in uh, so a prejudicial uh, lumen for the, the venous wall, obstructing the flow and an inflammatory res response which is uh, multiplied by damage on, and extra damage on the venous valves. Um, that slow obstruction is going to be seen uh, as a collateral venous uh, pressure and if this uh, extends through time you know, it could lead to a chronic condition and it could cause uh, ulcerate and uh, a retraction of the quag of, uh, of clots with uh, fibrotic uh, fibrosis of the lumen and in, path, in pathophysiology, we can divide it among post-thrombotic, which affects some point of the venous outflow. We could be symptomatic or as asymptomatic, or non-thrombotic causes, which may be congenital, uh, but they appear in the second decade of life, generally, because the, that is due to uh, processes that uh, are initially congenital, but they, there need to be uh, histological changes uh, of this non-thrombotic process, processes. And we have seen the development of spurs, which could be lateral, medial, or uh, rheumatic. These uh, spurs, uh, they generate some sort of obstruction, a mechanical obstruction, uh, a mild, but if we have in this with the syndrome, if we have the sustained compression of the right iliac or the left primitive, we start uh, uh, the, 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 con the constriction in, uh, progresses and causes further problems. Even though this is the most common cause, uh, the external iliac and the common iliac, the femoral, common femoral, we can see different points of obstructions or compressions uh, we need to consider. The clinical uh, presentation of these patients and the natural history of the evolution of the thrombi depend on the anatomical uh, distribution, the extension of the thrombi, and the occlusion of the lumen of the vein. So, or the stenosis degree of the, of the involved vein. And this is what we can appreciate through the angiography and the CAT scan that we define as a thrombotic burden. This is uh, manifested very clearly through a score, a Vigalta score. We can see here, in, we can see with the signs and the symptoms, both for the uh, acute and the chronic phases, uh, especially when we have about a value of about 15, it's a very severe PTS. So we have a classification, dedicated classification for the venous sector, as we have for the arterial system. We have four types. 
depending on if the stenosis are focal or combined, if you are uh, local or combined, to uh, see if we can uh, homogenize a sort of an initial presentation and have uh, the same language to to uh, assess the probability of success afterwards and uh, to be able to sustain that result over time. The, in most of the presentations, the first line of treatment are anticoagulant drugs which have been able to prevent DVT and uh, the, its complications, particularly the pulmonary embolism and we have recurrence of uh, thrombotic events in uh, a large percentage. This is why we have uh, the continuous infusion of heparin in the uh, uh, treatment lines. And uh, this, for most patients, is not enough. And here in the picture, we see the same patient at the beginning of the treatment, she appeared with an inflammatory thrombosis in the lower left limb. After 48 hours of uh, intravenous heparin, the patient looks uh, very well with a redu reduction of the inflammatory system uh, and uh, small diffusion in the rest of the venous axis. But we cannot send this patient home only to, for an outpatient control, especially because they are uh, young patients with a lot of activity and we cannot discharge with this uh, degree of uh, inability, incapacity, it's not uh, possible, it's not a good outcome. So only if we maintain the anticoagulant in one in four or two in four uh, DVT patients, they're going to develop any kind of, uh, some kind of post-thrombotic uh, syndromes, especially in the first two years. Even if we explore the, the uh, with uh, pressures uh, in 30 to 40 uh, millimeters of mercury, so we intend to we need to uh, reduce the thrombotic uh, burden, and we have seen the systemic thrombolysis could have a beneficial effect, and this has been proven, but with a high uh, probability probability of bleeding. Uh, based on the, depending on the, the high volume of uh, anticoagulant, which uh, exposes a patient to a very prolific bleeding. And uh, this could be uh, thrombolysis is done uh, through catheters. And the catheter direct to thrombolysis has been very useful, especially in the first 10 days of the appearance of the patient's symptoms. And with a better reperfusion uh, for these patients. And this study, as you can see, has a, has a thrombolytic exposure in a high dose over a long time, over 48 hours, and the risk of bleeding is communicated through uh, the results in the thrombolytic studies in a coronary that we have seen that is less than 4%. These are values that we need to uh, search for better approaches in this case. So throughout the years we've had different publications. This, uh, there are very few studies uh, that uh, have uh, of good uh, numbers uh, and a good power uh, that have communicated the results. And we have shown that in one of the cases we have uh, in Cavent, we have 200, more than 200 patients with iliofemoral DVT with symptoms of up to 21 days. They went through uh, they went through an absolute uh, RR of uh, post traumatic syndrome of 28%, needing uh, four patients to avoid the post traumatic syndrome, which is a very approachable number. Because they used a positive uh, use uh, uh, rate of 15%.
eh, en conjunto y en desarrollo de together with the, the tratamiento la hipótesis the, 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 this type of treatment the hypothesis of the open vein una uh, rápida y efectiva reducción de los trombos the removal of the thrombuses uh, to reduce the, the, the risk of PTS So, uh, combining the thrombospiration, fragmentation, maceration with angioplasty, and the stent implant. And uh, these are some of the ones used, and it depends on the, the results, the interim results throughout the procedure. So this intends to this diminish the mass. This allows to reduce the mass and to have a low, uh, a different rate to solve this situation. And this is what we did all throughout the time until we got the results of a different study, which was a track, a track study to assess the best results on the therapies used currently with devices of thrombospiration and a combination of what we have seen of the open uh, vein. This study, in the end, prim primary endpoint of decreasing the post traumatic syndrome, has not shown a big difference, but yes, for the patients with iliofemoral complications, the manifestations of the syndromes that were severe were uh, decreased in a statistically significant approach. This study, this primary endpoint, had to be the most relevant one in combination of iliacofemoral and femoral popliteal thrombosis. The stenting was a suggestion. It was not um, established by protocol. It was also communicated that it was necessary only in cases of translational gradient of over two millimeters of mercury in this uh, venous segment of low pressure, where we do not have a clear pattern of hemodynamic of what is uh, of what should be the, the strict parameters. The venography was not adequate to assess the extension of the disease, but uh, we needed to have imaging of the vessels, and the use of the stent in these cases was very low. In that case, it wanted to use, they used 80% of non-dedicated uh, stents. These are the case material results. The high successful technical uh, success is sustained throughout time with low events, low early event rate. At the beginning, the thrombus aspiration was manual and then optimized using catheters. That was what we had available in our hospital, and then multiple devices were developed to do thrombi aspiration and to take the endovascular material very rapidly, different stents for different segments were also developed and we had different materials at hand that we hope that have the same result and that they are dedicated for the venous use. As regards the filter of uh, PEBI as a protection measure, we believe that it is very important, specifically for the study. One was a, a filter PEBI that decreased the onset of symptoms related to significant pulmonary embolism in four points, and particularly when the presentation of DVT has a PE and inflammation, as we saw in the patient, in two or more segments, or with the diameter of the superficial uh, femoral vein was over seven. With this condition, 
And in a different paper, we said that thrombolysis guided by catheter, even with mechanical thrombus aspiration, has produced fatal cases in patients who do not have a protection, a mechanical protection with the filter. The implant is very important, and it is also important to take into account that removing that must be successfully done and not over 54 days, as several authors mentioned. This is in all the interventions we will require these devices, the combination of the use of thrombosis of large veins depends on the type of territory we are treating. Our results after 470 interventions with Vinacuba filters, this is a procedure nowadays that we need to uh, have uh, very handy some examples to close a male patient with edema in the lower limb and pain in the groin area for seven days. The angiol CT, we confirmed the May Turner syndrome. And you notice the compression by the right primitive over the uh, left primitive artery. In this picture number two, you can see that this is only a part of that of the lower limb in the geografía basal the occlusion thrombotica completa the total occlusion in most of the patients we need to do it from the femoral vein ipsilateral that puncture and that approach is guided with an ultrasound then we can see it with an angiojet and balloon angioplasty to have possible diseases that are defined. This is the anatomy after the thrombolysis and after implanting the stent in those places with a lot of recoil and we have to make sure we have the outflow of the vessel that is the main uh, post-thrombotic syndrome uh, factor if that is not there the, uh, the early occlusion is the gold standard this is the patient after 10 days of the therapy a different patient male patient with multiple trauma surgeries was taken to the hospital with symptoms of thrombosis and numbness in the lower limb. We saw in another angio CT agnesis, agni, uh, agnesis of the vena cava. He was under anticoagulation and we see in a new angiography that that agenesis was not such, but there was a small uh, thrombotic output, outlet because, and we had to make some adjustments because the agenesis is a very rare condition on a male patient. This is what you saw here, a great circulation, a vertebral one. We performed the bilateral approach through the popliteal veins and the recanulation reaching the, lower, the inferior vena cava and the photo at the bottom on the right. You can see this is a profile image. We need to prove that we are uh, in front of the spine, in some cases, this variation may go to the, the 
medullar area. So this is a very good moment to tomarse el tiempo para realizar esa proyección como to do this projection as a safety measure. In the same patient, you we continue with the infusion of uh, thrombolytics and mechanical thrombus aspiration, a pre-dilation with a balloon. The diameters are initially chosen by the angel CT, trying not to trying to make this angioplasty to produce the rupture. This is after the dilation. We perform a reconstruction, a caboiliac one. After dilation and the final result of the angel CT. In the follow-up CT of these patients, at 30 days, 6 months and 1 year, we need to take into account that there is not um, that the structure of the stents is not affected. May Turner syndrome, a chronic one in a female patient with oral contraceptives initially after birth developed deep thrombosis post-thrombotic syndrome and she continued with pregnancy she continued with a Vigalta score that was very high and after 221 days of treatment, this is the state of the patient. The veins were uh, free, total occlusion of the iliac uh, vein. This is the test in the inferior vena cava. Different dilations throughout the segments that we saw that were deceased, and doing this maneuver of the pullback balloon to place with a partially deflated balloon, we detected the uh, most important places of stenosis. This is the result after dilation, and in this picture, what we can see is the, in the interim result, the main Turner syndrome of the venous compression, the persistence of the collateral circulation with the tip and the residual lesion of the inferior vena cava. This condition only with anticoagulants it's not feasible uh, to do it in a, as a single approach, but we need to place a stent. This is the angiographic control, the final one after implanting the dedicated stent. Follow up with ultrasound, you see the, the patent uh, iliac. This is one of the predictors of good results. Some of the causes present with thrombosis, some do not. They are defined as a primary or non-thrombotic, a 47 woman, for example, with syndrome of the pelvic congestion. This is the baseline and geography signs of venous compression in the primitive iliac, uh, right, uh, left iliac. This is a thrombosis with hypertension, as you can see in the coronal vein on the left. This can be combined this con with a transvaginal ultrasound to see if there is another uh, complication as well. This is a modeling of the stent and the result of the final angiography after implanting the device. The nutcracker syndrome, a young patient that was longilinear with the pain in the hypogastric area, dysuria. We saw that there was a, a 
a condition of compression due to the severe mesenteric artery, and this is the result after the intervention, controlled with ultrasound, that we need to check in this type of pathologies whenever we can. To finish with the presentation, we understand that the main area, the main role of the interventional cardiologist and image, images and hematologist specialists must be in uh, close uh, work as the conducers of a great orchestra. And we have to talk with the different biochemical specialists and physicians. They need to have a very close communication especially during the first times of evolution and clinical monitoring of these patients. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very complete talk. We could talk for a long time, I'm sure they can. We have very little time because we need to give the floor now. I'm um, moving to Ignacio if he has any uh, question for Ricardo. The question maybe is that the one that came up is uh, they used uh, Vina Cava for treatment and for applying local thrombolytics and if that could uh, work as a filter. Thank you for the patient in the, the talk. It's been long. I hope it was uh, very productive. And to answer to your question, Ignacio, the predictors that we consider for implanting a filter are when the patient appears already with a venous uh, thrombosis, with a, for patients with a B and a when the segments are long, when over three millimeters, and or when we have uh, something that is uh, that has been that is with an inflammation. Uh, perfect, uh, Jamil. Do you have any question for Ricardo? Any comments? The, a question I want to ask, uh, how, what your experience with uh, the, the situation with the, the, the other members of your service? This is very useful for cardiologists in training because we don't normally see the interventional cardiologists together with the, the treatment uh, teams in the surgical room, the operating room. Okay, in our hospital we've been able to perform, uh, to create a multidisciplinary team where uh, we do not compete amongst ourselves but we, each of us uh, provides uh, his or her experiences uh, to the hematologist, the imaging specialists, the angiologists and the vascular scientist, uh, surgeon, so the, because they they weren't used to procedures uh, through the veins, so uh, interventional cardiologists have uh, taken the the, the 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 task to go into the pulmonary arteries to to start working with all this uh, part. So it's been a development, uh, very interesting, and uh, we have been working as a team. Okay, perfect. Uh, our time is up. I thank everyone for your patience. It's been a very, uh, very fruitful section, session. Uh, we have learned definitely something, all of us, in each of the talks. Thank you, everyone. Jamil, Ignacio, Ricardo, Fabio, Juan Pablo, Pablo. And I would like to finish the course this year on this uh, topic that we had. And uh, even though we did it uh, virtually, the the excellent has the excellence has not been reduced. So well, we still uh, still enjoy the rest of the congress. And thank you very much to everyone who participated.
Are we live? Wonderful. So, uh, my name is Alex Abizaid. I, I am from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I'm going to be the host for tonight. This symposium is sponsored by Med Alliance. You're going to be able to discuss uh, very interesting new technology on drug eluting balloons. And uh, for that, we have three outstanding speakers representing the United States of America with uh, Ron Watsman, South America, Ricardo Costa, and Europe with Florin, that, who is, uh, of course, discuss the newest data on uh, uh, Cirolimus eluting balloon. And uh, I'm sure that you're going to be super excited because there are a lot of points for discussions including the debate between Cirolimus versus Paclitaxel, the current indications for DCB, bifurcation, small vessels, instant stenosis. So there is a lot for us to learn with these experts. And to help me with the discussion, we're going to have uh, a new Odamonte, who doesn't need in any introduction, Gaston Dussailand from Chile, and Marco Weinstein from Brazil. So very eclectic. Uh, representatives from multiple continents. Um, it's my pleasure to invite my old friend and good friend, Ron Watson, who's been a great supporter for South America, for Solace, for the Brazilian society for so many years. And he runs a very successful course in Washington called CRT. And I was uh, a witness from the very first CRT that he put together. And after more than two decades, you see a huge success. And Ron is the really the point of, uh, of uh, connection uh, between science and practice. So Ron, uh, the word is yours, so you're going to present the technology. We are all very excited to hear. Welcome. Thank you very Thank you. much. I'm going to try to share my screen and get the slide presentation. It may uh, take some, some reason I cannot share it, so I have to find why this is happening. You don't see the green box or share screen underneath? Uh, I do see the share the screen, but for some reason... Um, Maybe the technicians put you in a different mode. Yeah, let me just try to see. This is no, yes, but you see the whiteboard. I don't see my presentation, yes. um, which sometimes happens with Zoom. Mm. Try again. If not, we can um, we can have Ricardo, and then you can come back. Just one second, I think we're getting close. Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry for the opening glitch, but uh, mm -hmm. my friends and colleagues, um, I was actually asked to discuss when and why to use drug eluting balloon and also the importance of sustained limus release. Um, I'll share with you uh, in important information, but first, this is uh, my disclosures. I am a consultant also to Med Alliance, which is relevant to this talk. So um, maybe we should take things in perspective because we're performing intervention nearly 60 years. And uh, before even PCI, there was bypass surgery. After that, uh, Brunsi came, started with Proba, bare metal stand, drug looking stand, first generation, second generation. And then came a drug coated balloon. And initially we had the first generation. And following that, there was the introduction of BVS. And what was common to both of those technologies were that they made the premise of leaving nothing behind. But as of today, we are discussing about a second generation of drug coated balloons. So we're moving again uh, forward, and this is the Limus drug, which uh, I'll try to convince you it's a more effective sustained Limus release 
DS like SLR. So there are a lot of applications for dry coated balloon, and all of them are true also for the solution SLR. Peripheral SFA below the knee. In the coronary, the indication that are most popular, and this is how we started, was instant restenosis, small vessel, and then bifurcation, side branches, lesions. And then there are some indications for arteriovenous fistula with reduction of hemodialysis, shunt restenosis, which is a very devastating for those patients, and keeping the dialysis access open longer. And finally, a very interesting uh, application that has been tested or studied in the past with drug eluting stand, but I think it's more appealing uh, for drug water balloon, and this is erectile dysfunction. Uh, the over 300 million men worldwide having uh, ED. And uh, again, it's another interesting indication, uh, not just to go with proba, but with drug coated balloon or drug eluting balloon. So, what is the rationale uh, to use it in coronaries? I think we mentioned leave nothing behind concept. If we could, we would have left no metal in the arteries. And that would allow us to preserve physiological vasomotion, allow the vessel to grow, no caging of the vessel, things that we heard in the past with BBS. But I think drug ported balloon or drug looping balloon uh, offer the same thing, and it's overcome problems associated with the use of the permanent metallic stents, such as jailing of side branches, overhanging osteal lesions, inability to graft the stented segment. Uh, so many drawback uh, of the stents can be achieved if we do drug ported balloon and leave nothing behind. And then again, if you need to bypass that vessel, uh, you don't go with a full metal jacket and, and allows grafting by having uh, treatment just with drug coated balloon. The absence of any residual foreign material and restoration of functional endothelial coverage can also reduce the risk of stent thrombosis. If we're not going to have a stent, we're not going to have stent thrombosis. And also, we're not going to have any stent allergy. And finally, there is no need for long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. So for all those arguments, we are actually enthused more and more about the potential of drug eluting balloon or DCB. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce to you a relatively late comer in the whole drug eluting balloon technology. It is the solution SLR, which stands for sustained limus release, which is uh, manufactured by Medalliance. So first of all, the first question is why serologos? We've been using Paclitaxel until now and results were, I would say, satisfactory and acceptable. But if you look overall and uh, you see on the cell cycle, where is Paclitaxel? Paclitaxel is in the M phase and it does give you a relatively short window of therapy. Uh, serologos, however, is cytostatic and it gives you also a immunosuppressive impact and anti-migratory agent that stops the activated small muscle cells to create the restenosis. And it does maintain the cells in the G0 resting phase and limits apoptosis. So overall, it's effective drug, which have been shown uh, immensely on the drug looting. And not only that, it is a safe drug. It does give us a very wide range of safety uh, in respective to the dose. So we are going to have this discussion of serolimus versus paclitaxel. And you can see with respect to toxic effects, they are minimal with serolimus compared to paclitaxel. Uh, and the therapeutic range is also different when you compare between the two. But I pay attention more to the window of therapy and the toxic effects which are really different between the two. One thing that uh, we have seen uh, is solid clinical evidence based about serolimus and antiristenotic, the drug of choice. And when you compare studies, and you have a list of studies here uh, in each of one of them, when the serolimus was compared to paclitaxel, within the drug eluting stand, the late loss was lower, the TLR was lower, it was just simply more effective drug to put on the stem. If that's the case, it probably should be also true on the balloon. And indeed, the serolimus has proven superiority 
over paclitaxel in also large randomized DES trials. And as a result of that, we are not having any more paclitaxel eluting stats. We just have drug eluting stats. But if you compare and contrast between the two, again, the mode of action is different. Sirolimus is cytostatic. Paclitaxel, paclitaxel is cytotoxic. The margin of safety is 10,000 fold versus 100 fold. There is a wide therapeutic range versus narrow therapeutic range. It's both work for antiphoristenosis. Uh, Sirolimus also has some anti inflammatory features, and it was accepted completely by the market. Uh, it does have a slow tissue absorption compared to fast tissue absorption with paclitaxel and short retention compared to long retention with paclitaxel. So if you look at the last two features, it seems to be the drawback of serolimus. And that's maybe the reason why we have not seen until now the technology uh, converting like they did very fast in the stent era from paclitaxel to serolimus. Because in order to turn those two red in the serolimus to green, you have to have a unique technology. Again, paclitaxel is absorbed quickly and tends to localize in the subintimal space and partition significantly in the adventitia. Sirolimus, however, absorbs slowly and spread throughout the entire artery where it dilutes down to subtherapeutic level. So again, uh, looking on both of them, there are definitely uh, challenges with sirolimus. Uh, it is a cytostatic drug, it is safer, it offers unique anti-inflammatory, uh, but there are the challenges. And what are the challenges? The challenges that overcame by, or need to be overcome by serolimus is to enhance the tissue absorption to facilitate serolimus enter into the arterial wall, extend the serolimus tissue retention, which is uh, less lipophilic compared to paclitaxel, so you'll cover the entire restenosis cascade and also develop a new, more durable and washout resistant coating. So these are the main features that needs to be overcome if one wants to use a serolimus eluting balloon. So this is uh, being resolved by the proprietary technology of the solution SLR, which is a Medalliance product. Uh, and what this technology offers you? It offers you a proprietary micro reservoir technology, which creating micro reservoirs that combining serolimus and biodegradable polymer. Then you have the miniature drug delivery system, which is optimal size micro reservoirs to achieve pharmacokinetic release profile, uh, comparable to the best in class DES and consistent and uh, predictable drug release that sustain therapeutic effect up to 90 days, and that should be sufficient to abolish the stenosis. And the, th the third component, which is very unique, is what is called CAT, cell adherent technology, which is a proprietary amphipathic liquid technology, which binds the micro reservoirs to the balloon surface. And this is contains the, and, and protects the micro reservoirs during insertion and inflation. It enhances drug retention in the bioavailability, allowing for a lower drug dose concentration of the balloon surface and optimize the transfer of the micro reservoirs to the tissue and maximizes the cellular uptake of serolimus. So again, uh, just maybe more in details, this is the micro reservoirs, they are precision engineered drug delivery system made of biodegradable polymer intermixed with serolimus drug. Then you have the mechanical, uh, as the balloon expands in one way, the biological highly lipophilic cat coating binds to the fatty cells in the vessel wall. And then you have the third component, which is the electrostatic. Uh, these are basically the three mechanical ways in which uh, you overcome the drawback of serolimus and make it effective. Manic mechanical give you the balloon compliance to ensure optimal acquisition of the cat coating to the vessel wall. The electrostatic is uh, leading to the cat coating that is attracted to the vessel through the ionic interaction. And finally, the biological, which is a highly lipophilic cat, 
coating that binds to the fatty cells and optimizing the micro reservoirs to transfer into the vessel wall. These are some uh, information that was done by Renover Money that shows very nicely the pharmacokinetics and the drug dose per balloon size and also the arterial tissue drug concentration when you're looking here on the serolimus versus the competitors. So for example, if you look here on the orange, the, serol the serolimus, uh, you see here that in one hour, the tissue drug concentration in microgram uh, would be 262. And this is much higher than what you would see compared to the paclitaxel by two other competitors. And this is true all the way up to 60 days. And this is the uh, electron microscopy that shown very nicely uh, how this is a interface uh, within 24 hours into the adventitia and the vessel wall. These are showing us uh, again the concentration in the arterial uh, surface. And when you compare the solution here in the green to the Zions, which is a drug eluting stand, which we all know, it's very similar. If you take and compare it to the medic charge, which is another uh, drug eluting balloon with serolimus, uh, you see the superiority of the solution SLR over the magic touch. So what you're seeing here that overall, if we look at this, we see that the solution SLR tissue concentration is very similar to what we're seeing with drug eluting stent. And here, uh, again, the back transfer, comparing the Medaline solution to the Paclitaxel uh, and to the by Bard and Metronic, the Lutronics and the Impact. Uh, and this is a very important information. As you know, when you deliver the balloon to the target, you have a loss of material during the procedure, during the transfer to the target area. You can see here, the transfer here in the red is the smaller with the solution compared to the Paclitaxel. Uh, more retained on the balloon and more transfer to the vessel. So in essence, we can claim here that the efficacy of the solution would be superior to the one in the PTX balloon, at least by the delivery system, we have all this information. So the sustained release really does matter. We do need a longer elution uh, than a short elution in order to overcome the entire cascade of the restenosis because it takes time to uh, complete the restenosis process. So the longer elution, the better. And uh, there are some examples with what happens if you don't have it. And these are being taken from the drug eluting stand era. So for example, um, Endeavor was inferior to Cypher and Zions because again, the elution profile was different. If you look at the periphery, there was a difference between slower elution and fast elution with Cyrolimus. Uh, and you saw that this was impacting on the late loss. When you have a slower elution, it's 0.39. When you have a fast elution, it's 0.72 late loss. So obviously you'd like to see more slower elution and that's what the sustained release offered. So the higher percentage of drug crystals in coating is associated with the higher tissue concentration for 90 days in the porcelain arterial model. Again, the work that was done uh, in Renover Money Lab. And in the most efficacious tax of DCB for the SFA, there is long-term presence of drug tissue, drug and tissue through the 90 days. Uh, another important aspect of drug looting balloon, the drug coated balloon, is the integrity of the coating. Uh, we see flakes coming out from different balloons. You can see them very um, easily if you do those in vitro. This can happen even when you just inflate the balloon. But for the electronics, uh, but uh, for the uh, elution, the solution balloon, uh, you don't see it. So you can see the coating here on company A on the top and company B, but with solution uh, SLR, we don't see any flaking. And finally, uh, one word about the micro reservoir technology, uh, which called also microspheres. They have been extensively used also in under other pharma industries. So it's not something new. And it's um, 
uh, solve uh, manufacturing problems that create extended release profiles and reduce toxicities, otherwise uh, rapidly absorb drugs. It is a very accepted technology and unlike nanoparticles, microspheres can be precisely manufactured to an exact and repeatable particle size and elution profile, which give you more uniform and predictable outcome. Uh, and it is a very uh, known and effective technology to deliver drug therapies. From here, I'd like just to mention that there is a very robust uh, coronary trial program within the solution. Uh, started with the, the first in men, going to the ISR IDE for instant tristenosis. Uh, this is going to be a pivotal study for the U.S. to get approval of 418 patients. Study that already launched in Europe, and we're waiting in the U.S. to start it as well. Then you have the, the, the solution, the novo, which is the mega study in our field, 3,326 patients that's going to be in Asia and Europe. And then uh, the solution, uh, the novo IDE in the U.S., which is currently under review. So a very robust program uh, to support the data for the use of this um, solution product. Finally, I'd like to just uh, go over the study of the de novo uh, study design. Uh, this is, I think, a very attractive, I think, beyond instant tristenosis. We claim that every place that you put a stand, you potentially can treat that also with drug eluting balloon. So you have to screen the patients, you see if the patients are candidate, and then the randomization would be all DEB strategy versus all DES strategy. Uh, on the DEB treatment, it would be according to the hospital practice, including adequate vessel preparation. And again, for the DES treatment, it's going to be also according to hospital practice. So this one-to-one -one randomization of 3,326 number of sites would be really uh, the first and the large one in this field. Uh, the PI uh, of the solution, the novel study, are Simon Eckerstell and Christian Spalding uh, from the UK and France. The objective would be to demonstrate non-inferiority for TVF of a treatment strategy with the solution SLR B plus provisional DS versus systematic treatment with DS for the treatment of the novel lesions. Uh, the design is prospective randomized clinical trials, open label, comparing the solution DEB to DES. I told you about the number of patients, number of sites. The primary endpoint is TVF, cardiac death, target vessel related MI at one year, and the patients will be followed all the way up to five years, and TVF uh, at five years would be also a co primary endpoint. And then you have all the traditional secondary endpoint at two years, three years, and four years, and follow up goes all the way up to five years. So this is really a pivotal study that can change the field because if we do find, and this is the study question, the hypothesis, that indeed the solution would be non-inferior to stents, I think that can bring us back to the balloon and re revolutionize the way that we perform intervention. So to summary and the take a message, I think we do recognize now that DEB offers the leave nothing behind concept. Preservation of physiological motion and overcome problems associated with the use of permanent metallic stents. Sirolimus is the preferred drug for DEB technology. The main challenges are tissue absorbance and drug retention. But the solution SLR offers sustained release via proprietary microreservoirs and cell adherent technology. And the success of this technology in the theme and the confidence of the sponsor on the product led to the design of a mega pivotal trial for ISR and the lower lesions. And I'd like to thank you for uh, the opportunity and looking forward to see the results of those clinical trials in a few years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. This was outstanding. I think we all learned so much and, uh, and this promising technology can really expand the indication for DCB. So we'll save the discussion for later and I'm, 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 I would like to invite uh, um, Anibal to present the next speaker. I'm sure that Ricardo is already there, ready for his 10-minute talk. <laughs> uh, Anibal. Sure. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex, so much. Uh, and I will introduce uh, my good friend and uh, uh, the president of the Brazilian Society of Interventional Cardiology, 
a very active member of SOLASI, a very active clinical investigator, Dr. Ricardo Costa, who will present us the solution, sustained line of release clinical data overview. Thank you, Ricardo, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Anibal, for the kind words, and thank you, Alex. It's great to be here, and after this great talk from Ron giving what's, what's why we should consider this new technology as something really to improve the outcomes. I'm going to bring the results of the first in men trial, the Cerolimus, or the solution Cerolimus drug eluding balloon. So the objective of this study was to assess the safety and efficacy as a first in men uh, study of this device, and it did include the novel and instant stenosis lesions in vessels 2.0 to 3.0 millimeters in diameter and lesion length less than equal to 18 millimeters. This uh, trial considered at least 50 patients in six clinical uh, sites in Asia, and the prime endpoint was freedom from device and procedure related mortality at 30 days, and then all of the common angiographic and clinical parameters at six and 12 months. Just the trial oversight. We have here, uh, uh, Stefan Winneker was the chairman, uh, along with Don Cutlip and Robert Byrne, all known in, in this field. And we had the core lab, we got the core lab at the CRC in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Overall, there are 56 patients, one patient and one lesion included. There was one case, there was a bailout stenting in a side branch that was predilated, then it was stent implanted in the main vessel, ended up receiving a stent, so we did not include in the in the, in the, in the main uh, results. Overall, there are 55 considered for a geographic analysis, and the 30-day clinical outcome was completed in all the cases for the primary endpoint and the six-month follow-up in 44 cases. The enrollment was between 2018 and 2019. And here you can see a summary of the key clinical out, uh, profile of these patients. 50% diabetics. This is like a, uh, what we see in some countries in Asia. Smoking 27%, previous MI 14%, and previous PCI 29%. In terms of pre procedure QCA, the mean lesion length was 11 millimeters, the reference vessel diameter 2.21, and the percent of stenosis around 68%. At post-procedure, we can see an acute gain of 1.07 and a balloon after ratio around 1.1, which we consider to be an optimal outcome for these balloon uh, angioplasty cases. Out of hospital clinical events, we did not have any events up to one month. So the primary endpoint, which was freedom from the vast and procedure related mortality through 30 days, we could consider 100%. And at six months, there was one target lesion revascularization that was, we're gonna also show this case. In terms of the technique, balloon predilatation as recommended by the protocol was performed 82%. The, the, the study drug coated balloon was performed in all the cases. An additional balloon was used in two cases, 4%, and bailout stand implantation was uh, done in one case. Here we can see the community distribution CFD curves for MLD. And in the far left side, pre-procedure 0.71, at post 1.79, at follow-up 1.53. Here the community distribution curve for percent diameter stenosis, we can see here the pre-procedure, and then at post and follow-up, we don't see a major difference between this important parameter for this type of device. And here the community distribution curve for late lumen loss. Most of them, we can see a more narrow distribution to the left side, and a few outliers, as you can see, uh, plotted in this graph. The mean values at six month QCA the percent diameter stenosis was 30.5% and the late lumen loss was 0.26%. Of course, this parameter is, uh, was performed in those with pair angiographic analysis. 
I bring you a few examples. Perhaps this is the most uh, considered uh, uh, criteria for DCB to date, which is instant restenosis. So we can see here in the prox LED, a very severe subocclusive lesion at pre-procedure. Then after dilatation with two drug coated balloons, solution drug coated balloons, we can see the follow-up, just a steady, perfect result from post to six months. Another example, a very similar lesion, also subocclusive ISR in the proximal LED, and a post-procedure and follow-up, a great, well-sustained result. Here we can see another well-represented type of lesion in this study, which was in small vessels, and a more distal circumflex at pre-procedure, very severe stenosis at post-procedure, and then a follow-up, just a great result as well appreciated in this uh, illustrations. Another uh, important subset that's being more and more considered for drug coated balloons, a side branch, bifurcation side branch, you can actually simplify procedures with this type of device. And at pre-procedure, you see osteostenosis. At post-procedure, after heavy stent in the main vessel, and here at follow-up, a great well-sustained results. And here I bring you the only uh, uh, major adverse clinical event reported. This was a subocclusive ISR to begin with. And importantly, this patient, which was not, uh, uh, procedure was not done as recommended by the protocol, he first had a paclitaxel DCB to predilate this lesion. Then following, he did have the study device. And this was a post-procedure result. And this patient came back with a very severe stenosis, and it was the highest late lumen loss, 2.14. And this patient underwent TLR with a regular metallic stent. So with that, I would like to conclude for this 10-minute presentation that the solution, Cerulean Zaluri Balloon, with a sustained release, demonstrated favorable clinical and geographic follow-up results. And these results have supported the CMARC submission and approve of this device. Thank you for your attention. Ricardo, I'm uh, listen, this was great. And, and again, it's good to see that this new technology is not only a theory, there is uh, some clinical results and uh, we are very excited to see how it's gonna evolve with our largest trials. So um, uh, our last spe speaker is uh, Florian Kukuli. He's from Switzerland and we have to really recognize his efforts. It's already tomorrow in Switzerland. So it's 1, 1 a.m. in the morning. So thank you so much, Flori, for joining us and to contribute to Solasi. Uh, the word is yours. I'm sure that you're gonna put some pepper in this uh, presentation in terms of uh, how we can uh, push this technology in clinical practice. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for your uh, very kind introduction and the possibility to speak uh, to you. I'm here with my son who is 10 and didn't want to go to bed. We are actually on holiday, so that's why I could afford to stay up this long. Um, so what I would like to speak, I would like to go more into technical details because we have been using the solution balloon extensively in my lab. We have probably used more than 400 balloons so far and most of them in, in native lesions. Um, so. Um, I would like to speak more how to prepare lesions and I will show you some clinical examples and uh, I'm very excited to have then maybe some discussions. I mean, to start with, we, we all know the career of our patients. They start with stents, they go for bypass and they come back for stents and they receive balloons and then they receive more stents and then we put the coronary sinus reducer because we have nothing better to do with them. And we have, uh, as uh, Ron also showed, we have um, the problem of stent thrombosis. This is rare, but if it happens like this in this patient, then it's quite detrimental for the patient because this patient is now in heart failure. And we have also this problem that um, the vasoconstriction, which we see from time to time, this was a patient who was extensively stented in the past, and I was able to catch this severe vasoconstriction, as you can see very distally in the LED, which could be corrected with repetitive doses of nitroglycerin. 
Now, if you look why um, fans fail, then we know we have some factors, diabetes, CTO, ISR, long lesions and small diameter. And I think this is exactly the situation where we should be thinking about using drug doing balloons, because we know stents do perform badly in these kind of situations. And this is maybe, um, um, let's say, the ground for my talk, because I try to use drug routine balloons, especially solution, exactly in this kind of situation. And I do not make exceptions in calcified lesions, because I think in calcified lesions, we know even better than, than stents perform badly. So if we can replace stents with balloons in such situations, why not? Let's do it. And. Um, I, this is a case which was not treated with a balloon, but which made me discover a new way of preparing lesions. This was a calcified lesion, and I said, why, why don't we just cut and crack it? So why don't I use first a cutting balloon? I use usually Wolverine to cut the calcium, and then I use an opium and C balloon to crack uh, the calcium and create lumen. I used this many, many times for uh, uh, lesion preparation in calcified lesions, and then I discovered that actually this is a good way to even treat normal lesions if I want to treat the lesion with a drug eluting balloon. So all the cases I will present are cut and crack and then uh, solution cases. Um, now, you will have the situation of a patient who is 38 years old uh, with familiar dyslipidemia, and I think putting a stent in this patient is just the start of, of his end, because this is, we know they will look great in the beginning and they will start, he will start to have um, late lumen loss, maybe because because he this is a high risk patient, but in this case, it's actually a bifurcation. So I, um, I put this case on LinkedIn and then most of my colleagues suggested to use two stents, in fact, in, in this kind of patient. So use two stents for a bifurcation in a 30 years old man. Um, well, um, I think it's wise, and this is what we have done so far, but it, since um, in the introduction of solution and some really early encouraging results, I said, well, I'm going to try uh, to avoid it. So um, in this case, I use a Wolverine balloon for that lesion, uh, especially in the main branch. I use a smaller balloon for the side branch. Then um, BU, I use a 3.0 balloon to create some lumen, um, OPNNC. Uh, it's a high pressure balloon, but I use it at, at lower pressure because you, I, I don't want to completely dissect the vessel, but really just expand the lesion and gain some lumen. Then I did some casing uh, balloon inflation before I used uh, the solution balloon, and then I used the solution balloon. And I will uh, re-enjoy this patient in the, uh, in the future. Uh, but you can see this is what the result looked like. And I left it like this, and this is now about uh, four months over, and the patient has not come back, and he hasn't, have, he hasn't had a stem thrombosis. Of course, angiographically, it would look better if you do it uh, with two stents in, in the initial phase, but the patient is symptom-free, and he's 38, and it's, he, we still have enough time for this patient to put uh, some stents there. Now, I also showed uh, you that in CTO, stents perform badly. So um, I had a patient with a CTO, he's 60 years old, he has diabetes, and uh, his, his uh, CTO is in the circumflex. As you can see here, the circumflex is not a big vessel, it's long disease, and um, you could, of course, put uh, two, two long stents here and cover it up nicely, but you know, this is a diabetic patient and he will probably have some, some uh, most likely some problems in the future and because his diabetes will also not become better than rather worse. So in this case, again, I use a Wolverine balloon, I use an OPNC balloon, and then I use two uh, solution balloons, 40 and 30 millimeters long. Um, and this is what it looked like initially. Now you would say, well, you know, initially it looks good, but in six months you will have late lumen loss like crazy and you would have been much better with a stent. Well, I brought the patient back after six months just to also have some, some feedback for myself and for the patient. I told him that I'm using this now in a rather experimental way. We don't have big data to support this, but I, I said to him that I have a lot of data to support that long stents in diabetic patients do not perform well. And look what it looks like. After six months, it looks uh, very nice. The patient hasn't had any restenosis actually, and he's doing very well. And in fact, if you compare the, um, the angios immediately post-procedure after six months, in fact, it actually looks better. The um, uh, circumflex is wider. It has 
that have these positive modelings. So this encouragement, this case is now maybe about uh, seven, eight months old uh, since the re-angio, and this encouraged me to even push this uh, further. Now, we did um, a lot of uh, patients. This is just the, the summary of the abstract we just submitted for TCT, 61 patient, uh, vast majority. We, we usually do intimal recognition in Lucerne. We don't like the subintimal tracking. If possible, we can we try to avoid that. Most are treated with DS and DB, but 20 patients of these are actually only with DB, like in this patient. And uh, we have only a 208 days mean follow up, but um, the target lesion failure rate is extremely good 5.2% for this uh, population. So I hope we, this uh, abstract gets accepted PCT so we can share also there our experience. And the mechanism was actually in one patient, a non healed dissection. I, this is a patient I treated, I had a dissection which I left behind and then the patient came back after four months and had to put a stent because the dissection did not heal. And in only two patients we had true ISR or, or let's say not instant because it was in a native vessel, but it, uh, just in uh, in segments the nose if we go. Now let's speak about some bifurcations. And bifurcations in the, in the meaning that not treating the side branch, but bifurcation really considering the main branch or um, trying to avoid um, stents in in um, in bifurcating lesion. This is a patient who has had a lot with his heart. This is a pericardial. Um, he had um, constrictive pericarditis, and you can see this very nasty bifurcation lesion in the in the circumflex uh, with the intermediate branch. I think if you try to stand here, you will end up putting three stents, and it will be difficult to solve this. You might get it to look good anatomically in the beginning, but this is a um, bad because I mean the patient has severe coronary disease because of he had he was uh, he had radiation when he was a very young man with Hodgkin lymphoma. And he has had peri, uh, pericardectomy, and he has had tabby, and he has a pacemaker. So really, this is not the patient you want to to, to play with uh, three different stents. So I actually treated him um, just with balloons, um, with two um, solution balloons, and this is the result after four months. And I think it it looks good. It doesn't look perfect. Uh, but the patient doesn't have any symptoms. He will receive soon a CRT system because he has he's been continuously paced. But actually, his angina disappeared completely. And I think this ca cases like this somehow encourage me to to go further. Now, another difficult bifurcation. This is a case I treated last week. Um, you have uh, and and this was a patient who was a very close relative of a of a co-worker of ours. So it was really uh, I wanted to do my best to uh, for this patient. But I have this really uh, bad lesion there, uh, calcified. I have OCT which I'm not showing here, and these two um, big side branches. Now, how can I do this case just to put a stent in and then save also these side branches? It's not that easy. You um, you will surely appreciate that. Now, I predilated again, cutting balloon, then I used a 3 0 open balloon, and look what happened. Um, the, uh, the side branches shut down. Now, I gained the side branches. I put a small balloon in both side branches quickly because I had wired them, luckily, and, and I could establish flow in the side branches. But I said, I'm not putting a stent here. This is going to, to cause me a lot of trouble. So I said, why not use a, just a drug-eating balloon? And I used a drug-eating balloon, and this is what it looked at the end. I have nice luminal gain. The side branches are flowing. The patient is doing well. And um, I think in such a case, it's perfectly legitimate to, to try to, to do this. But unfortunately, we don't have data to support this. So I'm taking the risk, let's say, on my on my shoulders. But I had to do it because this was the best, best I could offer to the patient. Now, and the last case I would like to share with you is a hybrid hybrid case. So this is a 69-year-old lady. She has severe LED disease and severe RCA disease, as you will see. She did not want open cabbage. So we offered her minimal, uh, minimal invasive cabbage, Lima to LED. And said, let's do the RCA. Now, I would like to share uh, with the RCA the LED was uh, was crafted uh, six weeks ago. Now, here you can see there is a, a tight lesion in the mid part, and but also a very bad diffuse disease in the top part. And when you put a six French guide catheter there, it damped. So I had to treat that part as well. So what did we do here? Well, um, again, cutting it with a two five balloon. Then. OPM balloon uh, in the top part 3.0, in the distal part 2.5. And then I said, for the proximal part, the lesion was collapsing over and over. So I said, there in the osteal part, I will put a stent. 
uh, because I want to have the ostium open because it was collapsing, the cathode was damping continuously. And for this part, I'll just use a balloon. And this is what I did. So the, pr the proximal part has a, a drug looting stent and the distal part, I used the four, 40 millimeters, 2.5 solution balloon. The important thing, maybe the last thing I would like to mention is, and um, what I have learned so far with this, uh, uh, cases I have done is to rather undersize. So if I use a 3 O balloon uh, OPM for lumen gain, for luminal gain, I, I use a 2.5 solution balloon at very low pressure to just deliver the, the drug and, and try to seal those minor dissection you might have. Because I think if you use, it's a, it's a semi-compliant balloon, if you use a tubular balloon, then you dissect them, then you will need a stent because you dissected with the balloon. So this is maybe a tip I can give to the um, uh, people who are uh, listening. Now, um, my take home message is I think with careful lesion preparation, and we are not there at the end, I think this is the key before we we, try, we uh, establish these balloons even more in our clinical practice, we have to uh, learn how to prepare lesions well. I think we are not there yet. Um, my way, cut and crack, could be the way to go, but I don't also not, I don't have data for this, but it looks promising so far. And I think what I can say is solution performs extremely well because the patients who come back, they have good results. And this gives me the hope that we can continue this way and we don't get any disappointment, hopefully, in the future. Thank you very much for listening. I hope I kept the time and um, let's have a nice discussion to, ke to keep me awake. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Flori. This was uh, outstanding and, and real world cases, right? We are not talking about focal instant stenosis or only side branches. I think this was very educative for all of us. Uh, so Flori, Ron and, and Ricardo, we do have three excellent panelists that is gonna, I'm sure, bombard you with some questions. Uh, Anido Damonte, I already presented, introduced. We have um, Marco Weinstein and Gaston Dussaila. So three very experienced interventionalists. I will give the word to them for questions. But just a quick question to Flory. Um, this is this is a, already a, a good registry, right? With 400 patients, almost 500 balloons. Uh, how much late follow-up consistently do you have? And, and, and if you have some angiographic follow-up, this is already a paper because this is new technology. Yeah, well, we are we also submitted the second abstract um, where we have a follow-up of, of about nine months for all comers and um, about one third of our patients have had angiographic follow-up and we are now summarizing all this data and um, well i will gladly suggest you as a reviewer if you don't mind <laughs> um, but but i think we should really uh, we should really get out this data because um, um, it's not only me in the lab, but we, I have two outstanding interventional cardiologists working under me who just believe in this. And I, um, the, the only problem we have is that that financially, actually, if the patients are staying overnight, then then we are doing backwards. So in Switzerland, you are getting punished because you use drugs and balloons. So I have to to withhold them and say, well, don't don't overdo it before the hospital administration notices this. But otherwise, it's um, you know, patients are coming back, they're doing well, and this encourages you to use it more and more. But we will put this data out very quickly. Wonderful. This reminds me, Ron, reminds me of my fellowship with Gus Pichar that always said that better than any stent is no stent. <laughs> so that will be interesting to see uh, this new technology now with a different concept with lesion preparation that we didn't have so much before. So, uh, Anibo, do you want to start with the first question? Yes, for sure. Um, thanks, Alex. Uh, I, I just want to congratulate the, all the three speakers uh, and Men Alliance for, 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 for organizing this uh, symposium because actually uh, I think that there is an, uh, with the available technology, there is an underuse of drug coated balloon in regular practice. And I think that uh, we will all agree, whether in Europe, the United States, Latin America, and maybe Asia, there is an underuse because the available technology uh, does not, uh, the, I think, does not have the results. We uh, have not shown the results that we would like to see in our daily practice. This is completely uh, out of the box because uh, Ron clearly showed us uh, the innovative technology that is behind this uh, uh, slow-release uh, sirolimus 
and, and then uh, Ricardo clearly showed us the, this uh, amazing late loss, very low late loss for me uh, in, in this uh, first in man and the, the, the cases that were presented by, by Dr. Kukuli were uh, real world practice and um, um, very, very, very uh, complex cases, most most of them. So I, I would like to hear from you, how do you foresee the future of drug coaching balloons with this technology, with this new technology? Ron? Uh, maybe I will start and, and I will tell you that uh, it's a question of uh, believing and starting to do it because the stent is very gratifying. You get a very good result. Some people even don't do vessel preparation, but we do pay a tax for that. Um, I think that uh, we have to start where the stents are not doing that good. So when you go to the small vessel, to the distal vessel, there is not even a question. I mean, we don't want to put stents in those areas then uh, you have a side branch of bifurcation. So I think you don't start from the proximal LAD, uh, the 3-5 vessel, although I think that fluorine does all of them. And I think you're going to get there if you're going to get after 400 cases. But how do you start? You start with those areas that you know that stents are not doing well. And I think we do have data today on small vessel and we have, uh, it's very intuitive that you can sometimes massage the distal vessel with balloon but you want a drug coated balloon and the same for the bifurcation. Uh, so these areas, I think there is no question. Uh, you can go to other areas like diabetes. Uh, if you ask me the future in my perspective is to go after the non-culprit lesion. Uh, and uh, I will tell you one statement that I've been uh, getting more and more um, fun of uh, after the LRP study and the prospect two study Patients don't die from ischemia, but they die from rupture plaque. And those lesions that we would identify them, and now we have tools to identify as a vulnerable plaque, they're not obstructive lesions. So you don't really want to treat them with a stent, but if you want to passivate it, drug eluting balloon could be a great application. And this is a whole new era, and you ask me about future. So my vision is that if we'll ever treat a vulnerable plaque, that would be would be the way to treat that, not necessarily a metallic stent. So uh, it is a question of choice. If you want to get a very good result, no dissections, immediately larger a, uh, acute gain, yeah, you can put the stent there, but there is a tax to pay. And I see those taxes because they still send me patients for brachytherapy and those patients with three, four, five layers of stent. I see patients that they started with the proximal LED, but they went all the way to the distal, almost to the apex. I mean, you, why do you do it? So in the US, we don't have drug coated balloon for the coronary. And that's probably one of the reasons, but if you do have it, then you don't go beyond the mid vessel with a stent, you go with a drug coated balloon. And my final comment, if you really want to see what happened in the periphery world, we completely moved from stents or POBA to drug coated balloon. They are dominating right now the SFA, the Argonne dominant also below the knee, which are small vessel. So uh, there is not much competition there, I understand, but still they are better than drug eluting stent. They are better than bare metal stent and they're better than POBA. So the same analogy you can apply to coronary, again, maybe not a hundred percent, but you have to start from somewhere and I think one of the issues that bothered me all the years with drug coated balloon was the fact that I didn't want to put paclitaxel in patients' coronary arteries. And no matter what you're gonna tell me, it's a good and safe and it's effective, I didn't feel comfortable with paclitaxel in the coronary arteries because I've seen all the results with taxels and the aneurysm and the other toxicity. I think when you have a drug like Sirolimus, it's a game changer. And if you can apply it and you get a good result, then why not? So I would start with a drug DEB, like the solution SLR. If I have dissection, I will probably have to tackle that with a stent. My question to Florin, and I, I talked too much already, so I'm gonna pass the question. What is your experience with those that you did the solution and then you still were not satisfied with the result, whether it's a recoil or dissection and you added a stent because then you have like two drug 
combination devices, drug eluting balloon and drug eluting stent. Um, well, maybe uh, before I answer your question, Ron, first my comment, how I personally see the future, I'm of course younger than um, you and less experienced. In a way, I, I think, I believe in a complete metal free future. And um, I think in the maybe in about 15 years, we will be using proximally a scaffold and this for the balloon, a drug using balloon. I think this should be our end vision for treating coronaries. I think putting metal in coronaries, um, um, I think I think this is not good for the future because, however, I mean, I pay a lot of attention to lesion preparation, to luminal gain. I use in almost all my cases intravascular imaging. I really do it with love. And sometimes when you see the patient coming back to three, four, five years, you still see a lot of uh, luminal loss um, because this never stops. And uh, and this is uh, that's why I think we should go away from that. Now, regarding the technical bit, how 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 I solve that issue, it's it's always difficult. That's why I try to to really decide um, if I should ever start with a drug in balloon or just say, okay, well, this is this needs a stent. And for this, I think lesion preparation is the key, and and this is really the the focus for me for the next maybe twelve months to learn how to prepare a lesion and maybe the trial which is planned by um by um, med alliance maybe it's a bit too early for that trial because if the trial fails against stents then it might fail because we have not understood how to prepare the lesion well not because the balloon is not good at the end it will be a solution did not perform well if it didn't i hope it will we will participate but i think uh, understanding how to pre prepare the lesion well now there are cases where i've used if I dissect with a drug balloon, that I, I use then a, another balloon for prolonged inflation, and then I put a second uh, drug balloon on it. So I try to avoid this combination of, of one uh, drug um, from the balloon with then another drug from, from a Zion stem. But sometimes it's just not possible, and then I have to put another stand over it. It's not ideal, but I think we have to we have to speak much more about how to prepare these lesions well for drug and balloons and when is when is enough luminal gain achieved? Because very often that's the problem that you try if you if you uh, if you want to achieve stent like results, then you will dissect a lot. So you should be able to accept a little bit of of uh, less luminal gain acutely. But of course, enough luminal gain for the patient to have no more angina and to be to be happy. And this is a difficult compromise, and I haven't understood it yet. I mean, I I've used it hundred times, hundreds of times, but I still I'm still working on myself. Thank you, Corey. So, uh, Gaston, do you want to make some comments and, and, and questions, please? We, we I think we only have like five minutes to finish. So you and uh, <laughs> I, 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 I have a. Uh, uh, I, well, thank you very much for inviting me in, in this uh, exciting uh, topic. Uh, I think one of the problems and, uh, that we will have uh, is that uh, people, are, uh, especially young interventionists, are not doing any balloon angioplasty. They think that balloons are just for uh, preparing uh, the, the way for the stent. So, uh, we have to teach them how to do balloon uh, preparation, uh, lesion uh, preparation, dilatation, in order to have a, a good result and, and learn a lot about what is a good result with balloons and then to apply the technology. Uh, that is really, really exciting. Uh, I have a, a question if there is uh, enough time uh, about the mechanism that uh, this will. Uh, produce uh, uh, a better uh, uh, lumen loss, uh, less lumen loss. Is this inhibiting just the proliferation or is also affecting the negative remodeling that is uh, the main cause of restenosis after balloon dilatation? Is there any, any studies on that? Yeah, so, so Ricardo, do you wanna take this uh, question and, and respond quickly, please? Sure, I think both mechanisms are involved and it's interesting to see in this first immense study there are 56 lesions and only 12 were ISR. There are 44 lesions de novo. 
and the best results and geographic results were seen in the de novo, meaning that you can achieve a, a higher acute gain with, uh, within the stent, but you also going to have a higher loss. So the late human loss was higher there. With balloon angioplasty, as we know, you might have less acute gain, but less loss. So the percent of stenosis, the delta percent of stenosis was actually smaller uh, in the de novo uh, group. And just to make a comment about the discussion, I think my generation has been born, you know, with stents. And I have to say that I'm becoming a believer as I'm seeing these results and we start to do more and more cases with DCB. And I think it's really uh, something that uh, fellows from now on, uh, physicians need to learn, like they learn how to do stenting for diffuse, distal, small vessels and side branches. Uh, yes, uh, I, it was a privilege to be here. Sorry that I was a little late. I was uh, in another session and also uh, stuck in the card lab. So, Mike, uh, uh, actually, I think you have like two minutes. Uh, so, I have two or three comments, uh, uh, for, uh, and I'll try to be very straight. Uh, first, uh, we've been using uh, drug delivery balloons for a long time. Uh, uh, we, we've been uh, involved with some studies, and uh, particularly every year involved in a session, but with packet tax delivery balloons with, with Paratronicus. Uh, you know uh, one, because you're also involved with Paratronic as well. Uh, with the uh, magmaries and the dreams and all the, the, the sort of the, the, the bioabsorbable products. So we've been working together in this. Uh, I, I really believe in, in drug eluting balloons, regardless of paclitaxel. And I also uh, believe that uh, sirolimus is a much more appealing uh, drug, uh, despite the fact that we don't know exactly the, the kinetics of uh, sirolimus for DCB. Uh, I think uh, solution has a very particular one, and 90 days can act very promising in in, uh, in, uh, in lab. But we have to see uh, in, in patients how it how it does. But my other comment is uh, regarding uh, lesion preparation. It has been stressed here, and we have a study. Uh, um, Robert Byrne and, uh, and others have uh, demonstrated in his uh, uh, desire that uh, lesion preparation with cutting balloon is very, very important for using, uh, uh, especially for instant stenosis. We've been using, and I use it today in a case that the patient arrived in a, a non STEMI today at the lab and he had a tight lesion proximal ID and a diffused lesion uh, distal ID. And at the end, uh, at the eye, was, it was a uh, 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 um, dissection, it was uh, uh, at the, what he had. So uh, it's spontaneous dissection, scat. So we were able to, to use a drug coding balloon. After we used the cutting balloon for the scat, we used the drug coding balloon for the whole distal LAD today. This was today. I, unfortunately, I cannot show you the images. And then the patient came in for a QMI after. We opened the lesion and then at the, uh, put the stent as usually, and after post I later the stent, no flow. So this is another uh, indication for uh, for drug abuse. A QMI, uh, uh, in, in South Korea has a very, very large experience uh, in a registry with a QMI. If we use drug coding balloons for a QMI standing, I don't it seems very, very uh, tricky, uh, uh, we can prevent no flow. So this is another indication of, uh, besides it's small vessel, diffuse lesions, instant restenosis. Bifurcation we use a lot for when we have instant uh, restenosis in bifurcation in order to prevent using a third or second layer of stent. Uh, this is a, a very, very solid indication for DCB. I think there's a lot of indications for DCB and I hopefully uh, the Sirolimus platform with solution will be even better. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Marco. The final comments is uh, from your side, uh, Ron, please. Well, this has been an exciting uh, symposium, uh, and we still learn. There is so much to learn on drug coated balloon, and especially on serolibus. But I'm impressed by the data that Ricardo showed. I think this is not like anecdotal. We used to know that, give me results of 20 cases, and I'll tell you how the 200 going to look, right, Alex? So you gave us 45, 50. 
I do uh, concur with you that the, the novo is more important than the instant risk stenosis because it will use less stents, we're going to have less instant risk stenosis. And also, mm -hmm. instant risk stenosis of drug eluting stent is not that trivial to treat. It's not that simple. The novo lesion is much more easier. And finally, I have to throw here imaging because I think imaging is always going to help us to verify that we don't, uh, that, that we prep the vessel properly. Just throwing a balloon and inflating two millimeter, two and a half on a four vessel, that's not vessel preparation. We really have to demonstrate that the vessel preparation was done. So we are in an era of an exciting technology. We have to gradually move it on uh, forward. One thing that I commend um, Med Alliance is that they are not shy of clinical trials. That for, for a startup company to throw 3,300 patient study, 500 patients in instant risk stenosis, that's huge, huge undertake. So I wish them that the study will be positive. I'm optimistic that they would from everything that I saw so far, but all remain to be seen. So continue the research and the follow up on those patients and thanks for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Solasi. Thank you, Med Alliance. Thank you, the speakers and the panelists. Have a great night and a good morning for you, Flori. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye.